Окупантам байдуже, куди кидати свої бомби. Вони летять на медзаклади, заповнені хворими, будинки, де живуть сотні людей, дітей. А російська армія продовжує знищувати навчальні заклади. Що для нас кінець війни? Раніше ми говорили мир. Зараз кажемо перемога. Good morning. I'm Sofia Zhuevchuk. I'll moderate today's conference. Welcome to the first international conference, Open Science and Innovations in Ukraine. It is a part of the World Week of Science Day. Let's have it from the Minister of Education and Science, Professor Alexei Shkratov. He will do the opening address. Hello and welcome everybody at this conference. It addresses the International Open Week of Access and it's done in this country for the first time. They're building a new concept of transparent science, which is data-driven, allowing you to enjoy scientific research. There is an open science paradigm, which is a leading factor for the world community. It is done through the European platform of open science. 
it allows to store and manage and use data of research in the existing infrastructure in the EU. In 2018, the European Commission passed a roadmap to implement European open science. It shows the key activity lines. It describes the overall European infrastructure system, allows access to results of scientific products funded by EU countries. The services are offered at the regional, national, and institutional levels and on a commercial basis. It is internet storage, exchange, access, data analysis, and processing support, and so on. Among the key objectives of this country, it is to expand European research. research. The Ministry of Education and Science understands that cooperation in this field exchange of knowledge and opinions through open data exchange and integration of Ukraine's scientific infrastructure into the scientific area is about setting up the national crisis system, which will be a part of the European open scientific cloud. It will allow for access to all Ukrainian scientific data gained at the government expense, and they will be used in other research. The system will feature information about services and instruments for users. There will be access to Ukrainian e infrastructure, which is important to address needs of science, economy, and other sectors. They will collect various research infrastructures, existing projects, and programs which are in place in order to enable further cooperation. Ukraine science should be a part of the global community, so they decided to make a national system. And it will become a virtual system with open virtual data on the Ukrainian research infrastructure. And it will contribute to Ukrainian science. So I wish you all a good exchange of data and hopefully this conference will give a push to Ukrainian scientists in their research to benefit this country. Thank you. With this, I'd like to turn over to the general director from the same ministry, Igor Taranov. Hello and welcome at the first international conference, Open Science and Innovation 2022. It addresses the International Open Access Week. Data openness is a fundamental principle in science. Over centuries, scientific results would be spread through publications, conferences, and meetings for the purpose of verification. Many scientific results depend on the analysis and interpretation of data. And this is a growing trend because we can use modern technologies to analyze massive data sets. Open science and the use of these results will be discussed today. Access to open scientific data as a concept began in the previous century in the EU. The open science principles were made about 20 years ago. You can see them in the Budapest Open Access Initiative. Berlin Declaration on Open Access was a follow-up on that. It appeared in 2023. Further on, these principles become fair, fundability, accessibility, interability, risability. The word fair was uh, accepted at Lauradale Seminar in 2014. The principles were published in 2016. In this country, 80% of data sets are not accessible for repeated usage. They are not structured and they cannot be identified. There is no metadata in the machine readable format. In order to make the data fair, the data sets should be having an ongoing identifier in order to allow for the search of this data. The metadata should be integrated into various systems. Metadata elements are added by an author, but in some cases, the system automatically generates them too. 
like decon data for biomedical images, format files, time markers, and other elements. Right now, there is no final list of metadata elements which are necessary. FAIR principles will allow to address the problems faced by our scientists, and it will allow them to become a part of the European research space and open science cloud. And the data will become interoperable and reusable. FAIR principles makes the information search simpler. The countries can gain success in the economy and in social development. Thanks to the European Commission, goals and objectives are determined in European policies and they are reflected in the acts of national law and certain legal mechanisms are employed. In Ukraine, there is an action plan on open science. As we seek European integration, we have to consider the open science paradigm, which is shaped up in the EU. The consistency in implementing this concept leads to a better digital economy in the country, and certain steps have to be taken at the legislative level and not just there. Certain data will make for better research infrastructure, the integration of data will happen, and it will allow the Ukrainian scientists to become a part of the European Open Science Cloud. National research infrastructure will be a benefit to joint efforts of scientists and also to special services in certain areas of science and education. Ukrainian educators speak about the outlook of the European process. Operating on the cloud in the European instruments of integration and interoperability of interoperability between the various national electronic and naval information systems to protect and manage data about naval research allows to collect and manage quality data about national naval activities and provide quality monitoring of naval activities. Система для зберігання та управління даними про наукові дослідження Стартує. I'm sure that exchange of practices will allow to further evolve top priority lines of activities in the country to employ modern technologies and ideas. I'd like to wish all participants fruitful discussions, new knowledge. So open science leads to the country's integration with the European research space. Thank you, Igor. The next opening address comes from the Director of State Science and Technology Library, Doctor of Economic Science, Ala Jarev. Ladies and gentlemen, hello and welcome. On behalf of the organizers of the conference devoted to the World Open Access Day week, I'd like to welcome you to the first international conference, Open Science and Innovations in Ukraine. The laboratory that I represent is the only one subordinated to the Ministry of Education and Science. We are responsible for implementing the ministerial policy in terms of open science principles. The Ministry of Education in 2018, while pursuing fair principles, have designated this library to set up the database of scientific quotes that come from everybody that uses websites and Crossref. And they support the open quote initiative. They tested the system and they opened the Ukrainian index of scientific quotes. Open Ukraine Citation Index. Open CI simplifies the search for scientific publications and uh, 
editorial offices can uh, assess the quality of Ukrainian metadata. Ukrainian scientific editions can be seen as specialized search systems, allowing them to extend their readership. You can look at links between authors and publications in the field of society and humanitarian scientists. The concept of open science in the digital economy requires certain steps to be taken, like establishing national electronic information system, UDIS, to store and manage data on research, scientific research. Ukrainian institutions and scientists use a better version of URI. It has been tested back in September of this year. We believe the system will allow for access to Ukrainian scientists' research. And um, the concept of open science that is data-driven will become possible. It will allow to pursue your integration of this country in the scientific space. Today's conference is the first of a kind organized by the Ministry of Education and the library. More than 1,000 participants from across the world have signed up for this. Four of the four presentations will be done, 13 poster presentations, 206 presentations. We appreciate the active participation in this conference. Dear participants, through your activity, we believe that this conference may become annual and this country will be able to keep in touch with you in terms of implementing the principles of open science. We didn't have much time for this conference, so we decided to reduce the time for presentations and some of the presenters can send recorded presentations. We hope you understand why we're doing this. So all presentations matter to us, <clears throat> all participants matter, and we appreciate everybody's willingness to help this country make important steps towards implementing the principles of open science. I'd like to wish everybody fruitful proceedings here and efficient exchange of practices. This discussion will make for further progress in top priority activities in this country in terms of implementing modern ideas and technologies. I'd like to wish everybody constructive proceedings and new achievements. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Before we get started, let me brief you on some housekeeping things. The co-moderator is my colleague from the library, Sabina Gunas. She will take it from there. And next to me in Kiev, there is Franz Letterstrom, the global manager from Vandom Science, who has decided to take part in this conference in person. So you will hear his presentation today. Speaking of the ground rules, <clears throat> each presenter will have a certain time to speak. We have an intense agenda and quite a lot of presenters. So please mind the time limits in order to have enough time for discussions, which may happen from time to time. In order to put a question, you're welcome to use the Q&A section instead of chat. We're going to be monitoring the Q&A section. Their working languages here are English and Ukrainian. There is simultaneous interpretation done here. You're welcome to choose the language that you need. If you're using the computer, you have to find the globe looking button and choose Ukrainian there. If it's a smartphone, then you go settings, interpretation, and there you choose the language. If you only would like to listen to the interpretation, then you turn off original audio. You will be able to put your questions to the presenters in the Q&A. 
some conferences are found in Ukraine. Should there be any air alerts, then you know what to do. You can check out the web portal of the state emergency service to receive further advisories. If well, this, I'd like to turn over to Sabina Agunas. Hello and welcome everybody. It is the first time this conference is done in this country. We're honored to be doing this in these trying times. So I'd like to actually turn over to the first presenter today, Michael Arnford, who runs the Open Science Unit of the General Directorate on Research in the European Commission. He will speak about policies and initiatives of open science in the EU. Mr. Arnford, you're welcome. Thank you very much. Good morning to everyone. Uh, Dear Deputy Minister, dear Director General, uh, dear Director, dear all participants, um, so delighted to see uh, many, many people joining uh, this conference. First of all, thank you for inviting me to this conference. I'm very grateful to see that this is uh, being organized by the Ministry. Uh, indeed, open science, open innovation is um, at the core of our research and innovation policies in, in Europe, and so is Ukraine. Uh, and let me start by ensuring the, you that um, we, are we fully stand with Ukraine, we fully stand with Ukraine's uh, research and innovation community uh, in the face of the, the current aggression. Um, in June, we were very delighted to see uh, Ukraine officially associating to the Horizon Europe program. This means that Ukrainian entities can participate in, in this uh, flagship program of ours on equal terms with entities from, from uh, our uh, EU member states. Uh, and in addition, wherever possible, our calls for proposals under the program encourage uh, applicants to include opportunities for, for Ukrainian uh, entities. Um, Ukrainian's association to Horizon Europe uh, to me not only represents a key instrument of support to the Ukrainian uh, research and innovation community, it's also very much a platform um, and network for further integration of Ukraine into uh, the new European research area. Um, now underlying this new European research area is the so-called pact, what we call a pact for research and innovation in Europe. How should research and innovation be done uh, in the different activities in, in uh, research institutes across Europe. First of all, the, the pact contains a common set of values, a common set of principles that we would like to see applied in, in national uh, research and innovation systems and across, uh, of course, also in the European research and innovation system. And here at the center, we have open science as a main value, open science as a main principle, as a main priority area for us to act uh, in the context of this pact for research and innovation in Europe. Now, at the same time as adopting the pact, which we did in, um, in November last year, uh, we also adopted a new European research area policy agenda for the next three years. So what are we going to prioritize in the years 22 to 24? And again, here, open science is at the top of this agenda. It is at the top of the, the priority actions in the agenda. Um, so let me focus on two of these uh, open science policy actions. And uh, one has already been addressed by previous speakers. Uh, so the first one is about the further development of the European Open Science Cloud, or EOSC, as we call it. Uh, first and foremost, as a, as a web of, of research data and services that are fair. So this was already 
uh, also detailed by previous speakers, so findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Uh, so we see this as very, very essential for our researchers to be able to, to build on the research outputs of other researchers, of other research teams. So we very much see uh, the uh, European Open Science Cloud as, um, as a system of systems, as, as a system that federates data infrastructures uh, in Europe and connect these data infrastructures to, to high-speed networks, to high-performance computing facilities. Um, so we want uh, this system to allow to produce researchers to produce outputs that are uh, what we call fair by design. So fair from the outside set, which means, of course, findable and accessible uh, allocating uh, PIDs or uh, persistent identifiers by interlinking infrastructures, by harmonizing access policies. Uh, but also very importantly, we uh, want um, uh, the interoperability and reusability aspects through sharing of voc vocabularies, uh, ontologies, uh, metadata standards, where, where all is mentioned. What in concrete terms do we want out of this action in terms of benefits for the researchers? Well, we want, as I already said, to allow researchers to produce data that are fair by design. We allow uh, we would like to see uh, a reduced complexity, a reduced cost also in data storage, in data sharing, in search, in data management. And we want to see an offer to the researchers and to the research organizations for uh, easier data integration, for easier service composability, and for easier workflows for, for our researchers in their daily work uh, in the labs and elsewhere. Now, in particular, for the uh, ESG initiative as a whole, we are very delighted to have the uh, Ukrainian Ministry of Education and Science represented in the steering board uh, for the initiative. This means a lot to us. It means that Ukraine is really fully part of the uh, ES community, uh, the U Ukrainian um, research and innovation community is a, is a fully part of the ESC systems of systems, which was also previously explained the importance of, of, of that, that uh, Ukraine can collaborate, Ukraine can network uh, into this community. Uh, also, Ukraine can benefit from sharing and uh, accessing information about other European countries' uh, implementation of open science and implementation of, of ESC. <clears throat> and can also use uh, this networking, this platform to facilitate uh, mutual learning among the Ukrainian research community and, and design national policies. And this was already mentioned by previous speakers, uh, it, which is exactly what you have done with your national uh, action plan for, for open science. The, the other uh, uh, open science action within the um, ERA policy agenda and the pact that I want to focus on is the uh, initiative on reforming research assessment. This we see as a very fundamental action because the way we, we assess, the way we so incentivize, the way we reward research projects, the way we reward researchers, research units, research institution, of course, is very essential for the motivation. It's very essential for the behavior of our researchers and research uh, organizations. So uh, overall, it's very essential as an action to see how we assess research to have at the end a, a well-functioning research and innovation system. But what we see today, the, the current assessment system very often use, uh, uses uh, inappropriate very narrow criteria and methods that, that often are based on the quantity of publications in journals with high impact factors. And, and these are used as, as the dominant factors for, for the quality of the research. Also, we see a, 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 an assessment system that doesn't reward open science practices. So it doesn't reward open collaboration. It doesn't reward early open sharing of knowledge, uh, of data. So these open science practices that we know lead to increased quality, lead to increased efficiency, and at the end, uh, more trust in the outcomes of, of the research. So um, we have seen, of course, that some research funders, some research performers are already 
uh, taking steps to change the research assessment system and, and improve the way they assess their research, they assess their researchers. But we have also seen that progress has been uh, slow, uh, limited in some areas and, and quite fragmented uh, across Europe. And this is why we have taken this um, uh, initiative. We, we really believe there's a need for a systems change. There's a need for a change in culture that uh, that really assesses what we value so the true quality the true performance and the true impact of, of the research and this includes also making uh, open science the norm making open science the default making sharing of knowledge and data and open collaboration the default way of undertaking research uh, in europe so what have we done in done in concrete terms we have uh, taken action to facilitate and, and speed up changes to, to assessment practices. And we have uh, pushed in a direction where assessment should be based on qualitative uh, judgment. And, and here, of course, peer review uh, is, is very central and uh, supported by quantitative indicators only when they're used in a responsible way. Now, this means that they should not be the only proxies for quality, but they should be put in this context of qualitative uh, judgment of research and researchers. Also, very important direction to take is that researchers do not only produce publications, but there is really a diversity of outputs. There's a diversity of practices, of, of activities of researchers, and we should reward those. This, this diversity, uh, broad spectrum of activities that maximize the quality of the research and, and the resulting impacts. Um, and also motivating collaboration with non-academic actors in society and industry uh, so that we incentivize also knowledge and data sharing as early as possible in this process. So what we did last year was that we went through a, a, a very broad consultation of, of all stakeholders and we launched a call for expression of interest to, to those organizations that would be willing to come, become part of a coalition to, to reform research assessment based on, on the principles that I, I just explained and to be involved in a process of drafting agreement between those willing to, to take this forward. So we saw a very, very strong momentum this year. Uh, in the first half of the year, we saw more than 350 research organizations from nearly 40 countries that expressed an interest in, in this reform process. Uh, and among these, there were uh, a handful from Ukraine. So we also saw quite an interest from, from Ukraine. Um, we opened it for, for signature in, at the end of September and um, more than 130 have already signed. And again, we have a handful from, from Ukraine. So we're very happy to see the interest also from Ukrainian research and innovation uh, organizations in, in this initiative. So we are now uh, setting up the, the, the coalition uh, for those who have signed the agreement. And this coalition will offer a space for collaboration, for sharing of experiences on piloting changes to research assessment. So it's like, um, you can call it a mutual learning forum where uh, this experimentation of changes to, to assessment practices will be based also on evidence of uh, the changes that lead to benefits, the changes leading to certain costs as well. And they will also give guidance to, to those who uh, assess and to those that are being uh, assessed in, in this process. So we, have, we, we, we expect that uh, this experimentation is, is, will happen over the next uh, three, four, five years with continuous improvements in research assessment criteria and, and, and practices. So, Two initiatives that are really um, major from a European open science policy point of view. We're happy to see Ukraine participating in, uh, in both of them. So let me end by repeating, uh, first, very delighted to see that Ukraine has officially associated to the Horizon Europe program. Uh, very delighted to see the uh, Ukrainian Ministry of Education and Science represented in the steering of the uh, European Open Science Cloud Initiative. Uh, delighted to see also Ukraine, Ukrainian initiatives, uh, so Ukrainian entities uh, signing up to reform of, of research assessment. So to be part of the European community and indeed global community of changing research assessment practices. To me, this means that really 
Ukraine's research and innovation community is fully part of the European research and innovation community. Thank you. Thank you for this brief yet informative presentation of the open science outlooks and doing this kind of thing in the Ukraine. The Ukrainian Ministry of Education and Science is in the process of integration. So it wants to become a full-fledged part of all of these endeavors and hopefully this cooperation will continue between this country and the European Commission in this particular field. And we will see a growing number of research projects and further participations in the Horizon projects. Thank you for joining this conference and let's carry on. Moving on to the next presenter, Susanna Dumashel. She runs the European Cooperation of the French Research Organization. She's a coordinator of Opera 3, the director of EOSC Association. So, Susanna, you're welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for welcoming me. It's uh, it's really an honor uh, to be uh, to be there for this uh, first Open and Science and Innovation Conference uh, in Kiev. Um, that's um, yeah. So I'm I'm really happy to to be there and to have the occasion to quickly present two different examples of how we um, of example of um, of two types of organization uh, dealing with open science in Europe. And maybe I can start by sharing my screen. Yeah, I hope it's fine for you all. So actually, I was uh, at the beginning, I was uh, supposed to present only the um, association, the EOSC association, but then I've been invited to add a few words on OPRAS, uh, research infrastructure that I'm coordinating. So I will try to do in a very short time uh, to give these two kind of examples of these two, uh, two organizations. So let's start with the uh, the EOSC Association, which is the bigger one. Uh, as the EOSC Association, as uh, Michael just mentioned, is there to support uh, the the building of the EOSC uh, with the the steering board in the in a tripartite uh, partnership. And the EOSC Association is really gathering uh, the voice of the community, so all the members, the, the scientific community involved in the building of the European Open Science Cloud. And uh, as uh, one of the directors of the ESC Association, I really hope that uh, we will have uh, more and more uh, Ukrainian organizations uh, becoming members of, uh, of the association. So here you can see a picture of the voice of the community. So uh, it was a picture taken at the last General Assembly, where you can imagine that each of these person represent the whole organization. So actually on this picture, uh, there are more uh, thousands of people rather than uh, hundreds. So uh, we are quite a strong uh, community. And uh, the purpose of the association is to, uh, to provide a single voice uh, for the advocacy and representation of, uh, of the youth, to promote the alignment of uh, the European Union uh, policy, research policy and the priorities with the activity of the association and to enable seamless access to data uh, through interoperable services that address the entire research data life cycle. And this is where, uh, of course, uh, the, the EOSC Association can also serve and be useful to uh, the Ukrainian uh, university. So this is the governance model of the, uh, of the EOSC at large. So you can see on the, on the right, the EOSC Association uh, with, uh, led by the president and supported by the secretary general. And the EOSC Association, as representing the community, is working in a tripartite collaboration with uh, the member state and the associated country and uh, the European Commission. Currently, we have uh, more than 200 uh, members at large, so members and observers uh, everywhere in, uh, in Europe. And uh, so it's a quite strong member base that we, uh, that we engage in different uh, activities. The association is led by nine independent uh, individuals. So we are eight directors and I and one president. 
and all of them we represent the diversity or we try to at, at least to represent the scientific community in terms of location, scientific domain, type of organization, type of stakeholders. And all this, uh, this community is, uh, is, is gathered into different task force uh, that you can see uh, here. So there are 13 task force, uh, 400 volunteers that contribute to uh, work on the different uh, challenge and uh, activities related to the building of this uh, European Open uh, Science Cloud. And what we try to do uh, is to, uh, not we try, but what we do uh, within the association is to update uh, every year a strategic research and innovation agenda of the European Open Science Cloud, where we highlight the most uh, important points that have to be done and on which we should work for the next, uh, uh, next couple of years. So this is a way to really uh, coordinate the whole community and to identify uh, the, the main priorities for the building of uh, the EASC. And all the organizations that are members of the EASC Association can contribute and are invited to contribute to the SRIA. And uh, this is, for instance, what we try to do, uh, what we do uh, within OPRA. So let me um, move now to the uh, uh, second example, which is OPRA. Uh, much smaller than the ESC Association because we don't have the same goal. We are a European research infrastructure dealing with uh, open uh, scholarly communication services. That means that our mission is to coordinate and federate resources in Europe to address the scholarly communication needs of European researchers in the field of social science and humanities. So we provide uh, developed types, uh, different types of services that are useful for the whole, uh, the whole community, both the researcher, but also the publishers in order to uh, reduce the cost of uh, the publication. So uh, within our press, we are working with different community and we, we, try, we try to go together uh, different types of community. As I already said, they have the, there is the publisher, there we can have also the researcher, but also research infrastructure providers, librarians and uh, some other, but I would like to be quite uh, quick here. We are supported by an open governance. That means that all our members are uh, part and invited to, to, uh, to contribute to the governance and to the strategic decision of the research infrastructure. So it's a way to uh, make sure that all the different stakeholders that uh, we work with uh, are, uh, can contribute to, um, to the, the, the development of uh, OPRAS. And I would like to highlight two last uh, things uh, before, uh, before finishing this uh, very quick uh, presentation. The first thing uh, is the um, diamond plan for open access uh, that OPRAS uh, coordinate with uh, three other organizations, the Coalition S, uh, Science Europe, and the INR, uh, which is about uh, the, how to support the Diamond Open Access journals in, the, uh, in their uh, daily activity by providing different types of tools, uh, working with them on, the, on, the, um, uh, on their business model. So this is directly related to the, uh, the section that will be later on the program of this conference uh, of, uh, on open access uh, publishing. So this is why I, I wanted to mention it. And you, have, you can find all the results of this Open Access Diamond Journal study uh, on Zenodo, so I just put here the link and uh, some uh, and the, the main aspect of the, the report. So uh, you, uh, I would like to invite uh, you all to uh, to have a look and to see how we can also onboard Ukrainian journals, especially because we worked on a, a very specific initiative, which is uh, the support to Ukrainian editors uh, that will be presented later by my colleague, uh, my Polish colleague, uh, Maciek Maril which is a member of uh, the Executive Assembly of OPRAS. And the last point about uh, one of the main uh, services provided by OPRAS, which is a discovery, uh, discovery platform, uh, GoTriple. And what is interesting in this platform is that we uh, harvest different data from all the social science and humanities uh, resource. Uh, and at the beginning, we had in mind to uh, deal with nine European language and I have uh, the great pleasure uh, to tell you that uh, we also added the Ukrainian data, some of the Ukrainian data that we found uh, dealing with social science and humanities. 
We align the vocabularies uh, in social science and humanities in Ukrainian as well to make sure that uh, people can already uh, find Ukrainian data in GoTriple. And that means that these data are already part of the European Open uh, Science Cloud. Yeah, so I think that's it. Thank you very much for welcoming me. And um, yeah, we're happy to answer to any question. Thank you so much for this talk and the interesting information on open access and materials. I think it's going to be very useful for our publishers in further work. And I think they're going to be able to use that. Right now, I don't see any questions, but if we have any in the chat, then we'll let you know. Okay, let's carry on. I'd like now to invite the next presenter. Susanna Marinati, the executive director for science, also one of the sponsors of this conference. So she will address the conference now. Susanna, you're welcome. Hello, thank you very much. I will uh, share my screen now. And uh, um, well, I first of all, uh, my name is Susanna Monati, and I come from Italy. And I'd like to to thank the organizers for inviting me for as a keynote speaker and for inviting for science as a sponsor for this conference. I'm really honored to be here and uh, uh, to be among such distinguished people and especially hosted by this country under these uh, circumstances, uh, which make my message even uh, even more urgent. Knowledge means peace, and uh, knowledge uh, is removing uh, barriers to, um, to access. And uh, this means education, this means uh, uh, intellectual independence and freedom from propaganda and from tyranny. So this brings peace. Peace means safety, means food, but also means resources for education and for research, and research produces knowledge. So this is really very, very much related. And um, well, I've been working for many years uh, with uh, for science and before to make open access happen, open access to knowledge, to research data, to research results, Everything means a better world, the world of peace, where all the people together can find, fight against our enemies, such as pandemics, uh, the climate change, and can explore the space to find a new world where to go when we will all be migrants uh, uh, someday from this planet. Well, today I will uh, talk about a lot of things. My time is limited, so I will not touch every point, but I will leave you with the slides and uh, um, especially what is for science and what are our principles and why it is important to have open access and uh, uh, open uh, science and especially for uh, research data and research results and what are the open access trends and possibly a positive message and uh, um, and the uh, and why we chose this space uh, as uh, as uh, the solution for um, serving the community of uh, uh, open access. So, uh, for science is basically supporting uh, uh, some open source solutions that enable uh, open science, open research, and open access. Mainly, this space for open access to publications and uh, research data. Dataverse uh, for open access to data, open journal systems for open access to um, publications, and uh, uh, everything is uh, open source, free to use, uh, and supported by large communities, and uh, uh, working with the standards, uh, open standards and protocols, such as uh, the guidelines of open air, and participating in the EOSC that has been mentioned before uh, by uh, my distinguished uh, predecessors and uh, the 
standards like uh, uh, ORCID, like the IIIF APIs, uh, like the Serif model for research information, collaborating with communities for open access repositories such as CORE. What we believe in is basically uh, working with the open source software to make or uh, open access initiatives of uh, institutions uh, really sustainable with open standards and protocol to enhance interoperability and make all the knowledge uh, produced in the world uh, really available to everybody. And uh, this can be done in a secure way, for instance, uh, uh, as a trusted cloud provider or the Cloud Security Alliance, we want our uh, partners uh, uh, we work with uh, to be really uh, uh, secure in, uh, in this uh, um, information science world. We are based on uh, open science principles uh, against proprietary products, uh, uh, which can result in a vendor lock-in and become obsolete, while open solutions that are sustained by, by worldwide communities and use open standards and protocols really um, uh, enhance uh, uh, the opportunity to provide uh, open knowledge from institutions who produce it, open knowledge that helps us solve in the, the world's very, very most pressing problems. Our principles as enablers of open science is uh, uh, to use open tools powered by communities and to make uh, uh, the solutions uh, able to uh, provide uh, fair data, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable, and interoperability is enhanced by the use of open standards and protocol like, uh, like ORCID, like the Serif data model, like IIIF open standards, compliance and quality, compliance especially with the open air guidelines and all the um, practices, best practices of the open communities for research and also uh, with a with a focus on uh, security for all these uh, solutions. The road to follow is open access because it increases the impact of research by encouraging researchers to share. It generates tangible reputation and credibility both for researchers and for their institutions, and it disseminates knowledge for the benefit of humanity and the progress of humanity. The future open access trends make me very optimistic because based on the data provided uh, by Ampeywall, uh, it seems that by 2040, we will be be able to have 100% uh, important. It's very important that all institutions and even all individuals can contribute to, to that. And uh, you see the, the, here in the figure, the trend, which is taken by, by, from uh, the Royal Registry, the trend uh, for institutions to adopt an open access repository and also uh, mandates uh, can be mentioned, should be mentioned because mandates from research funders, from governments, from uh, institutions themselves with their own policy uh, really help uh, open access to, to happen. And, uh, Open access mandates uh, have been, uh, have been uh, issued by uh, such prestigious universities such as uh, Harvard, such as the MIT, the Duke, uh, or the University College London, ETH Zurich, uh, just to mention a few examples overseas and uh, in Europe. Uh, Horizon Europe is funding uh, research and mandating open access for uh, the dissemination of knowledge that is produced with this money. So as European citizens, we should all be really proud to participate in these projects that are funded by our community and uh, uh, to provide uh, open access to what we produce as uh, research results funded by public money, funded by the European citizens. Open access trends in Europe include uh, initiatives uh, as important as the Open Science Cloud, EOSC, uh, and uh, it has been uh, well explained before, so I will not, uh, I will not um, uh, focus on this, but uh, as for science, we are really very proud to participate uh, in projects and programs that are, um, that are um, sponsored and, uh, and funded by EOSC and OpenAir. 
Uh, we also agree with the statement of UNESCO, the UNESCO vision for open science to assist the entire repository community in implementing the foundational standards, technologies, and functionalities to support uh, uh, open science. And um, why we chose this space? Because it is the most widely adopted open source uh, technology for institutional repositories. We believe uh, in the community work. We participate in the community. We are leaders in the DSpace community to provide more and more functional uh, services uh, to, the, to the research community in a way that is sustainable, uh, free from licenses, free from proprietary uh, lock-in uh, policies, and uh, um, en en enabling all institutions to contribute to open access to open science and to open data in a, in a sustainable, in a robust and secure way to uh, be able to collect, to preserve and to disseminate digital objects, which can be research results or uh, research data sets. And uh, as you see from the open door, um, uh, this space is the most uh, widely diffused platform. And I think, I believe that we should concentrate our efforts on providing something that is uh, fit for all institutions and uh, can be enhanced by community efforts. So in the end, I see, I would like to say that every individual can do something, even even uh, every small effort for open access can be significant. Every institution producing knowledge carries a responsibility towards disseminating this knowledge, making it available for all citizens of the world. And at For Science, we are really committed. We help institutions to make open access happen in a sustainable way. We try to do our part for an open and a peaceful world. Thank you very much. Thank you for this beautiful information for Ukrainian scientists. In this country, they widely use this space, and recently it has been updated. So it integrates ORCID, and that's good. So many of us appreciated this update, and we're happy to see this happening. So, any questions? There is one question. Is this pad good for a data repository? Uh, yes, this space uh, is good uh, as, a, um, as a deposit for all digital objects. So you can uh, really configure your data model to uh, represent uh, uh, the objects that you want to, uh, to preserve, uh, to collect, to preserve, and to disseminate. This is valid for uh, research publications, but also for research data and also for the cultural heritage, because we should not forget that knowledge is also uh, made by our history, the history of all the people in the world, and uh, uh, the cultural heritage is also very important to uh, preserve uh, our knowledge and to extend our knowledge. So you can use this space for any digital object and set it up for any initiative when you want to, uh, to, um, to make your uh, assets, uh, your research or cultural assets uh, available for everybody. Uh, this afternoon, my, my colleague Irene Buzo will also talk about uh, uh, some of uh, uh, the services we provide and we'll talk more about uh, uh, this space as well as a, as a really a tool enabling uh, open access uh, and uh, uh, to, to every digital object you, you want to share with the rest of the world. Okay, sounds good. Thank you for the answers. So we will be looking forward to Iran's presentation this afternoon. Thank you for joining us today. Hopefully we're going to keep collaborating. Thanks, everybody. With this, I would like to move on to the next presentation.
Let's have it from Pavlo Kartashov, who runs the Ukrainian Startup Foundation, the Foundation for Development and Innovations. Hello, I'm happy to welcome everybody. My name is Pavlo Kartashov. I run the Ukrainian Foundation for Startups. I'd like to briefly talk about the foundation and what it does. And then I'm gonna tell you what we're doing today in terms of science and education. So the Ukrainian Startup Fund is a public institution. It is an entry point to the startup ecosystem in Ukraine. These are the key things we're doing. It's not all about money. Through the partnership network, we offer access to other markets with the soft lending. We promote the Ukrainian ecosystem. We work with big stakeholders like Startup Blink or Kill Room and other big players in the ecosystem in the world. We're also trying to evolve the national system of startups and innovations. We were involved in drafting legislation. The latest version of the law on innovations is our product for the most part. We work in incubation, acceleration, and those kinds of things. So we fully cover the startup ecosystem and we help startups evolve. Many things appeared in this country, but there are no laws on that. So it's not regulated. And we try to fill this gap, making sure that all of these practices could find legislative grounds. In today's world, the foundation offers grants. So we offer grants to startups. So we do this in the pre-seed and seed stages, but we also need an idea stage in between. So we're working on this right now would like to grant access to first funding at the idea stage. This will go to innovators, young scientists and inventors that need to get the first funding to implement their ideas. So we wanted to become a vehicle, allowing someone to float an idea, to gain funding for it at various stages. So from an idea, you will make an entire business out of that and you would gain government support for this. So in each of these stages, money will be no problem. You will be able to keep pursuing your project. We also have the acceleration program. There is an ecosystem development block with the hackathons, boot camps, and mentoring sessions. In three years, we did more than 200 events. And apart from grants, it is also a big contribution to the ecosystem. We involve a lot of partners, not only research institutions, but also businessmen, entrepreneurs. We also work with the European institutions, and you may know that a big tender has been announced by the European Innovations Council. It's 20 million euros in total. The idea is to support startup ecosystem. 12 million will be spent on startups in various stages. So the total for startups will be up to 60,000 euro. 
which is quite significant. Other funds will be channeled into the ecosystem development. The main focus is placed on acceleration. So next year, we're going to be working on that for the most part. We'll try and commercialize scientific research and development. We work with a number of universities. We organized groups and telegrams and chat. So it's about scientific parks, business incubators, and everything else you find in the university. So we make a telegram group and uh, we keep everybody up to date. So it's about the grants for, from the Ukrainian Startup Foundation. One of the things we also do is an event from the European Institute of Technologies and Innovations. We keep in touch with the universities trying to locate projects needing funding. And then, then they will be included in the circle of projects that will be presented to investors and other stakeholders. There are many projects like that. You've got about 10 tracks. We are now within the track on food and agro, which will be implemented by the Kiev Shevchenko University. We want it to become a consistent practice and any university would be involved in relevant activities because there are various things done by universities here and there. There are various projects and there are lots of activities and events we can become a part of. And the foundation itself works with a number of investors and stakeholders work with the UCAD, GIZ, GIST, it's the US government program, Western NIS fund, venture funds. One more partner is CRDF Foundation, the American one. So we have been able to find quite a number of stakeholders which can offer funding or support programs, training programs, and so on. And all of those are the tools that our funds can use for the sake of better efficiency. We also have innovation vouchers. A year ago, we started presenting the Ukrainian startup ecosystem at international events. You can see here Collision, CS, and other exhibitions. There was an exhibition in Denmark, in San Francisco. So there are some big venues where we can see world technology capacities and we go there, we form delegations, we pick startups. In each delegation, there are key stakeholders like Ministry of Economy, Ministry of Digitalization and Education. So we make a delegation, we represent startups and uh, also technology ecosystems. I guess next year we're gonna try and involve more people from the academia and R&D centers in order to keep everybody in balance. So we would like to work with the institutions doing particular projects in order to let them meet with potential investors and partners, corporations, and it will help them explore more opportunities. It's not so much about science and education, it's about commercializing things that are working already. So these are our plans. And just one more slide. It's a dual purpose program that we implement. 
it is the only grant program that supports funding small projects. These are the projects which can be done in the peaceful and wartime. If you think of any education platform that can help IDP children continue their education, then that's what we're on. So this platform can possibly gain funding from us. So any project which helps resolve particular problems that you get in the wartime is duly considered. So that project is welcome to apply for funding with us and uh, we can identify the projects which can produce benefits. We have taken stock of these projects across the world and uh, in the website you can see examples of many projects which may be financed by us. People just need to see how it works, like infrastructure rebuilding. It can be whatever, any technology solutions which can make people's lives easier, especially in wartime. It's about access to psychologic aid or humanitarian relief and things like that. So all of those is relevant to our goals and objectives and these kinds of things can be financed by us. Education is a separate story and we can fund some of those projects as well. We started doing that back in COVID times. Sorry, Pavlo. I think you're doing great initiatives and I think people can actually check it all out in your website and they can get all of that detail and if they're interested, they can get in touch with you. It's good that there are such initiatives happening in this country and research projects can be implemented in the business sector, they can be commercialized. So I think your competition is always open. Yeah, but nobody goes to the website, you know. I'd like to tell you what we're gonna be doing next year. I can see more than 200 participants here. There are people representing universities, business schools, scientific parks. So now that they have listened to my talk, they will check out the website, I guess. There's one more initiative and we're gonna speak about that tomorrow. It's about deep tech acceleration. It's gonna be working next year. So that's the project that we're gonna do with jointly with universities and innovation centers. So effectively, we're trying to pull together the Ukrainian ecosystems and find projects to create a database of those projects and R&D products. And then through our mechanisms and networks, we can find potential investors and partners in order to implement these programs. There are many projects that you can see out there. So they are in the pipeline, nothing is doing there. So next year, guys, check it out, join us. We've got a web page. We've got people that are actually doing these kinds of things and all of the descriptive information. We did a great deal of drone hackathons. Uh, excuse me, Pablo, we're running out of time. Okay, so all in all, in this country, there is science and uh, there's also education here and uh, agencies and institutions that are working on this. They commercialize projects, so you all are welcome to join our initiatives and help us for the sake of a shared benefit. Thank you so much for this beautiful initiative. Hopefully more people will be willing to join in commercializing their research products. So let's carry on. Let's move on to the next presenter, the involvement director in ORCID, Eva Weinbergen. 
scientific communication across borders. You're welcome. Yes, thank you very much. Good to be here, everyone. Um, so before I start, uh, I would like to say a, a word of gratitude. Um, thank you to all the participants uh, and presenters for being here. Thanks to the, the sponsors. Uh, and a special thank you to the State Scientific and Technical Library of Ukraine for organizing this conference in such a dire and challenging times. Uh, your drive and commitment is inspirational, and I'm, I'm honored to be invited to speak at the first Ukrainian Open Science and Innovation Conference. Sorry, we cannot see your slides right now. Oh, okay. No share. Okay, one second. Yeah. Stop share and reshare. Technical difficulties. Okay. All right, let me know when you um, see it. We still cannot see them. It looks like they're trying to come up, but they never do. <laughs> That's fine. Okay. And now we see. All right, brilliant. All right, we'll do it this way in browser. Um, so again, thank you to everyone here. Um, let me start by uh, saying a bit about um, who we are, what we do, and why we do it. Um, so what is ORCID? We are uh, a global not-for-profit research infrastructure organization. Uh, we launched our registry in 2012, and we are 100% sustained by fees from our member organizations. We're guided by a set of values and founding principles, which you can explore on the website. And we owe a lot of our success to being open to participation by all. So we're community built and governed by a board of directors as representative of our members with wide stakeholder representation. ORCID is supported by a dedicated, knowledgeable professional staff of 38 people who are based uh, all around the world, and we don't have an office. So talking about ORCID's vision basically means where do we want to go? What do we want to achieve? So ORCID's vision is a world where all who participate in research, scholarship, and innovation are uniquely identified and connected to their contributions across disciplines, borders, and time which takes us to our mission, or basically, how do we want to get to that mission? Uh, or how do we want to get to the vision, basically? Um, so ORCA's mission is to enable transparent and trustworthy connections between researchers, their contributions, and their affiliations by providing a unique persistent identifier for individuals to use as they engage in research, uh, scholarship, and innovation activities. So we do this by providing three uh, interrelated services. So firstly, the ORCID ID, or just the ORCID. People seem to use both namings. Um, this is a unique and free uh, persist persistent 16-digit uh, identifier that researchers own and control forever, uh, and that distinguishes and disambiguates them from every other researcher throughout their career. Second is the ORCID record which is connected to the ORCID ID, uh, and that stores the researcher's personal, professional information, uh, like affiliations and grants, publications, peer reviews, uh, service, membership, awards, um, and, uh, and you know, a growing set of data, basically. And finally, we provide uh, integration functionality that provides access to the ORCID records and allows member organizations to update those records. And we provide the services and support of communities of practice that enable the interoperability so that they can, they can exchange the data with, uh, with each other using common persistent identifiers between the ORCID record and member organizations. In simple terms, we provide the technical means to allow interoperability and connection between an ORCID member uh, and an ORCID record, as well as we provide public access to our registry. 
Um, so as indicated on the facts about ORCID slide previously, um, we launched the initial version of our registry back in October of 2012. So we're actually having our 10 year anniversary this month. Um, and we've come a long way since then and ORCID adoption has grown significantly. <clears throat> since we launched the registry in 2012, we've been uh, very happy and fortunate with how much ORCID has been growing, both in terms of individual researchers who registered for an ORCID ID and member organizations who are building integrations to interact with those records. So late last year, we hit an important milestone of 10 million registrants. And right now we're over 12 million registered ORCID users. And those numbers are really impressive and we're proud of, achie of the achievement, but they don't really tell us how much uh, the ORCID records are being used, only that they exist, right? So, so this year we've begun focusing more on metrics like uh, yearly active records, how these are these, uh, how many of these have been created, um, how many are being authenticated and used and updated in the last year. And we're also looking at users that have granted update permissions to trusted organizations. So in other words, how many users have connected their, their records to other systems like universities and publishers and funders. So as you can see here, uh, there's an overview of ORCID adoption and usage worldwide. Um, this is data from September. We have over 9 million uh, yearly active users of which six and a half million have given permission uh, for organizations to write to their records, which is an important aspect, of course, as having data written to records by member organizations increases trust. We have 1,264 members across 55 countries around the world. Research is, of course, global, and researchers collaborate across borders. So having a single identifier that ties those relationships is of great value to the open science movement. And lastly, we have 25 national ORCID consortia. An ORCID consortium is a group of organizations that together form a community of practice with the aim of applying ORCID services and resources uh, in a national context using global implementation standards. Now, I say 25, however, this, <clears throat> I said this information is from September. We now actually have 26 consortia because we're you know, really excited to see that per October 1st, Ukraine has joined our international community of members through the formation of a consortium uh, led by the State Scientific and Technical uh, Library of Ukraine and supported by the Ministry of Education and Science of Ukraine and has a total of 17 member organizations. So with this, Ukraine follows in the footsteps of 25 consortia who have gone before it in countries throughout the European uh, Union, like Germany, France, and Denmark, and Netherlands, and as well across the globe, the United States, and um, um, uh, in Brazil, and Colombia, um, and other places throughout the globe. Um, and they facilitate nationwide ORCID integration through national research information systems. Um, they execute on national science policies, and overall create more openness, inclusivity, and trust in the national resource communities, whilst at the same time advancing openness, inclusivity, and trust on a global scale. <clears throat> With the support of um, Ukraine's National Open Science Action Plan, the consortium will focus on improving metadata quality on the national level and the visibility of Ukrainian research and researchers while making national research more transparent. ORCID will become one of the main data sources for the Ukrainian National Current Research Information System. So the creation of a consortium is one of the important stages in the movement of open science, we believe, and open access to information for research and organizations in Ukraine it is a key part of sustainable infrastructure for the Ukrainian research community. And it allows Ukraine to develop policies and implementations according to your community's needs, while at the same time being aligned to the international research community. Having a consortium also fosters a community of practice, which means sharing of resources and sharing of learning, both national and international. Member organizations can stay up to date with the research that comes from their scholars wherever they are while making researchers' lives easier, as all their research information is accessible via their own unique profile to be used wherever they need, be that abroad or be that in Ukraine. And it will save them time when they need to provide the research information to any organization. At the same time, being connected to all your scholars uh, abroad and uh, at home helps increase, increase international awareness of Ukrainian institutes. 
So these are the 17 organizations that are part of the consortium. I just wanted to recognize all 17 of them to make sure uh, everyone sees these. Um, in addition to the Ukrainian National Current Research Information System connection, uh, we expect these members to connect to ORCID via uh, open source systems such as DSpace, OGS, and ePrints. So shared values in the service of open science. Um, everything we do at ORCID is guided by our values of openness, trust, and inclusivity. Our work is open, transparent, and non-proprietary. We strive to be a trusted component of research infrastructure. We take an inclusive view and engage with a wide range of organizations and people. Research, as said, is global, and so are we, and these values support the open science movement. With the recent government approved order on the National Plan for Open Science, uh, Ukraine has joined the EU countries that have an approved plan for implementing the principles of open science, which takes Ukraine another step closer to integrating with the European research area. For open science to function, connections need to be established. Connections that connect across disciplines, borders, and time. These connections must be trustworthy and transparent and speak a common language so that they are interoperable between systems. Connecting researchers with the research across disciplines, borders, and time is an essential component of open science. Open science requires both open infrastructure and open metadata. By using persistent identifiers for people, places, and things, such as publications and data sets, um, discoverability and credit attribution will improve dramatically, opening new channels for collaboration and for tracking and assessing the impact of research across the globe. The ORCID persistent identifier, or PID as we always call it, of course, um, is the component for people, uh, in the same way as ROAR is a PID for organizations. And data set and cross-ref DOIs are examples of PIDs for publications. However, there are many more PIDs with their own particular function and more continue to be created. In order for open science to function in an open, inclusive, and trusted way, wider adoption of PIDs and infrastructure is required, not only by the higher education institutes, but by all stakeholders involved. It is important to drive the message that open science is a collective movement where everyone has to play their part. And if we all play our part, open science will make research more efficient and transparent, more reliable and trusted, and responsive to societal challenges, or even prolonged war, as the current dire situation in Ukraine is. And in closing, um, I want to um, address to the Ukrainian research community at home and abroad. I want to say um, thank you for your endurance, and your commitment to your country and to science. I wish you continued strength, and I believe that you are truly leaders of change. Thank you. Thank you for this information, and we appreciate the ORCID support. Thank you. We have been able to organize a national consortium So moving on to the next presenter, Irina Kuchma, the, management, the manager of Open Science Program AFOL. She'll speak about climate justice and open science. Hello, thank you for the invitation and the interesting presentations and uh, fantastic achievements. Let's look at the percent of Ukrainian open science products. We can see it in the Quartine Open Knowledge Initiative. So they tried to look at the number of scientific publications, research articles by Ukrainian researchers in the open access. It is safe to say that it's not a complete amount of data. It doesn't cover all of the Ukrainian publications, but this number can still give you some idea of where it's at. So right now you get 43% of new research products coming from Ukraine. You can find it in the open access. 25% of it is in the magazines, 13% of it 
is an open source magazines. The green color here indicates other platforms, repositories. Most of the Ukrainian repositories are unknown. There are some systems that have been used to create this data set. But we have had some achievements in the open access field. There is still a lot yet to be done. There's a need to increase the number of scientific articles that you get in the open access repository. There is a growing number of research publications. In 2021, it has gone down a lot, but I think it's been a global trend because of COVID. There is a growing rate of open access and with the National Open Science Action Plan in place, we can hope to see more of this happening. You mentioned the Open Access Week. So it's about openness to climate justice. There's a need to see in which field can you start practicing open science and climate change seems to be a good way to do it an appropriate field. Open Air has set up a dashboard allowing you to see scientific literature and dates and software based on SDGs. Climate action is one of the SDGs. In the search platform, you can see one and a half million of research products related to climate change. Most of that is found in the open access, but not all. So there is room for improvement. The International Open Access Week is a good time for a cooperation among various communities. We spoke of innovations and uh, cooperation between companies and universities. I'd like to highlight the importance of this justice. We spoke of fair principles. So any projects in open science should feature this element of justice as a fundamental element, I would say. And this is why we're opening the project jointly with eSpark. It's an open climate campaign. It is meant to be a four year campaign, helping scientists operating in the climate change field and biodiversity and other relevant subjects to practice open science. We would like to help scientific foundations and governments in implementing clear cut policies on open science and clear cut guidance for researchers and organizations gaining funds for their projects in climate change. Also would like to see open science mentioned in the international conventions related to climate change and biodiversity. So I guess this campaign opens up a good opportunity to cooperate with the Ukrainian research organizations in order to see a growing rate of openness in climate research and other research because climate change, it is such a broad subject and I think it is seen in everything you do, any research you can think of. What should the researchers possibly do? Well, they can place their preprints and final versions of scientific articles that have been submitted to scientific magazines but haven't been published yet. So by doing this, they can get the feedback and they could possibly improve the quality of their products, articles.
and then they can get them published in scientific magazines, especially the ones that do not charge for publication. They can put this in the open repositories, they can share the scientific data and software, and that's how they can promote this openness principle. Susanna de Michelle this morning spoke about the Diamond Open Access Plan. A new project has begun where Suzanne's organization and other organizations will be working towards improving the capacities of universities and the research facilities to let them release monographs and scientific editions journals, magazines. Would like to help universities and their publishers and the publishers of research facilities in demonstrating the quality of their research products. There will be a series of training sessions. And I'm looking forward to cooperating with the Ukrainian community. They also spoke of Suez project, which is a way of supporting Ukrainian scientific editors. And that's a fantastic initiative undertaken by French and Polish colleagues. Everything we do under this initiative is open to all Ukrainian scientific editorial offices. There is a link to the website, so you're welcome to check it out. And speaking of achievements, UNESCO has approved open science recommendations. Ukrainian repositories and magazines need to understand that it is important to clearly indicate licenses and copyright. The use of licenses in scientific repositories and magazines is an important subject. It helps users understand how they can use particular publications. It also helps machines and computers understand the openness And this year we want to do more work on that. So research data have been mentioned by all previous presenters. We gotta be we gotta be doing a better job with this. We would like to see more scientific data from Ukrainian repositories and also training in open science. It is something that is also necessary. I think it should be one of the top priorities in the open science action plan. It is something each university and organization could do. And we would be more than happy working with you, helping you with these training sessions. One of the projects that is going to help us with that is Optima. We'll work with them to help PhD students and masters with this. They will see how they could possibly practice open science. There is an international movement, the Carpentries. They offer training sessions on data management and how libraries could aid researchers in open science. They can help them with software. They started translating these sessions into Ukrainian. One of our colleagues has initiated this initiative. There is a need to change the way in which we assess research products. So it was mentioned earlier today. It is indeed important that researchers and their organizations would not be 
assessed by the impact of the magazine that publishes their data because it doesn't actually speak about the quality of the research product. So apart from that, you have to consider the researchers of the initiative initiatives of researchers in terms of open data, open hardware and other things. I mentioned preprints earlier on. I think in the COVID times, we all have been able to see that it is important to quickly share the research products. We wouldn't need to wait for a few years until the article gets published. Marina Vizovska has been awarded by fields in mathematics. It's like, a, it's like a Nobel Prize in math. So if you place the research results in a preprint, in an archive, which is what she did, then that seems to be the fastest way of sharing your results with the scientific community. Her discovery was cited the very next day. It was published a year later. So preprints are an important thing to promote in this country. Well, thank you for your attention. Any questions or ideas are welcome in the chat or in the Q&A. Thank you, Rina, for this talk. It is related to the Open Access Week. So let's move on further. Alexander Baresko is up next, representing the Council Eurodoc, Open Science Opportunities for Ukraine. So I appreciate this event and um, dear colleagues, thank you for inviting me over. I'm Alexander Baresko, I chair Eurodoc. I'm with the Kiev Polytechnica and, and, an, and I'm an ambassador of science support. We are an NGO established in 2002. We have headquarters in Brussels we represent young scientists that are beginning their career in Europe. We've got 26 national associations in 24 EU countries. Ukraine is a member of Eurodoc since 2013. We identify three main subjects for young scientists. One of them is open science. Young scientists need to understand what it's all about and how to practice it. Eurodoc is actively advocating open science. We take part in various discussions. We raise awareness of the politicians. We take part in projects. Ambassadors of open science, that was one of the projects. So we know what it's all about and we try to let young scientists about the trends of open science in Europe. In 2016, the open science discussion began. And we have been able to see the progress done in this regard in Ukraine. There is a draft law which carries a definition of open science. So basically, the open science is not something brand new. 
it is not a science which goes in breach of an old science. It is just a more open approach to organizing the research processes and knowledge. The idea is to get a result, an impact, which is collaboration between scientists and society in order to make sure that society gets benefits from what the scientists are doing. Open science involves a great deal of practices. I think everybody has seen the slide before, but there is so much in this open science. To me, open science is like web to zero, a switch from the static web, in which case people would only read the sites, but could not do anything else. Then you get an open web, in which case the user is allowed to communicate through the web facility. So a switch to the open scientific process is something similar to me, similar to this example. And I guess the change of paradigm is a chance that this country should use. Unfortunately, our scientific system is not competitive enough in the global arena. So the change of paradigm is the point where we can reload the system. We got to get it to work differently in order to integrate with the world and Europe in particular. Why does Ukraine need open science? Well, if we want to be a part of Horizon Europe or in other grant programs, then we need to understand what is open science and we need to be able to use it appropriately. If you dig deeper, you can think of more benefits. Following a reproducibility crisis, you see that many published research results cannot be confirmed, no matter where they have been published. So apart from the article and the findings of a study, there is a need to publish the materials that allow you to draw the same conclusions. That increases the veracity of scientific results and the, the scientists and their results become more trustworthy. So it's about trust at the end of the day. It increases the visibility of research products. If you publish, something that is not in the open access, it will not be seen by government people, managers, politicians. So these results will not have any impact on decision-making. But science should lead to better decisions. That's what it's all about. So increased efficiency of scientific process is a part of the deal. You don't have to reinvent the wheel every time. You know what's going on and it allows you to work more productively. The COVID pandemic, it has been mentioned by Irina just a minute ago. So the role of open science has become clear to everyone. You can quote UNESCO or other institutions, but the key message is this, open science has become key in overcoming the COVID pandemic. And once the scientists have realized how it can work, how it can expedite communication, they think there's no way back. They spoke of preprints. Back in the coronavirus pandemic, preprints were on the rise. Preprints are a kind of different story, but it's a way of quickly sharing the knowledge. So we got to learn to use this tool and support this. Let's see where it's at with this in Ukraine. Science is like a chance for Ukraine. The National Action Plan on Open Science has been a big step forward and uh, we will hear more about that later on. Implementation of this plan will not start from scratch. We've got some repositories out there. Some of them are unknown, but they are there. We also have a lot of open access magazines. They can, they can be found in the open access journal tracker. 
So there is a particular database. It's kind of fragmented because of lack of consistency. This particular conference is one of the ways in which we can make it all more consistent. And now speaking of awareness of the open science, I have some data for 2018 and onwards. The awareness has been going up, but we need to keep on learning. We need to keep raising this awareness. And last year, we did some opinion sampling with the help of UN, and we covered quite a lot of respondents, about 8,000. They indicate that about 30% of respondents can clearly explain to you what is open science. Certainly these data have to be processed further, but we actually see what else we should be doing. The Eurodoc carried out some opinion sampling in 2020 in Eastern Europe. But in this case, most respondents in Eastern Europe were from Ukraine. You can see the components of the open science and you can see which ones are most important to scientists in Eastern Europe. So reproducible research is poorly understood as far as I can see. And there is lack of open data too. So that's the existing gap and we got to do something about it. So we have to turn more attention to this. Let's look at the key factors influencing publications or choosing where the publication is to be done. So this varies across Europe and uh, light blue color indicates priorities for Eastern Europe. So based on this data, we can see that our scientists nowadays would like to make it to the databases of particular kind and uh, the cost of publication should possibly be low. There are some things related to open science, but scientists in this country are not thinking about this in the first place. So prestige, impact factor, those are the top priority things for them right now. Uh, this particular slide is about motivation, motivation factors behind publishing articles in the open access. So the Eastern European circle is very small here. So there is uh, there are some issues with awareness as far as I can see. There is a three-tier model which covers three stages of needs and focus in terms of publications. Anyway, science, open science in particular, has a lot to do with communication. So in this model, you can see basic level, competition level, and cooperation. So at the basic level, it's about access to publication infrastructure. If it's a competition level, then the focus is placed on individual properties. So you have to have a big H index and so on. We want to move on to the cooperation level where you get flexible publishing infrastructure with preprints and everything else. The main question to Ukraine is this. So we are at the basic level right now. So let's see if we're gonna move on to the cooperation level. So we will skip the competition level and we'll jump over to the third level. So we'll see if it's gonna happen. So for that to happen, Ukraine needs to seek integration with the European and global scientific community. How it can be done? Probably some people spoke of DORA, the San Francisco Declaration of assessment of research products. So the idea is to use the proxy matrices like impact factors 
to assess scientists. And there is Leiden Manifestation Act. You're a doc, signed all of that. We established the coalition on the reforms of research assessment. And that's another good chance for Ukraine because this time it's not gonna be something given us from Europe or someplace else, but we can actually choose to co-create new rules and that's how we can integrate with this process even further. Wouldn't have to be sitting in our hand. There is a METI effect. Sir Robert Merritt was looking into this many years ago and published an article in this. The advantages pile up over time. Right now, Europe, in particular Western Europe, has advanced a lot in open science. We're lagging behind. So in order to do better, we have to work quickly along these lines, catching up on the rest of Europe in terms of open science and reforms of research assessment. Optima is one of the projects mentioned earlier today, and uh, we'll work with them and we're thinking of education, training young scientists, making them aware. That's a part of the deal. So young scientists are a key to true changes in earlier stages of their careers. So in early stages of your career, you gain the skills. And if we offer training courses and sessions to master's students and postgraduate students, then it will contribute to open science progress in the country. I'd like to share a few QR codes from Optima project. You're welcome to join our community. We're gonna be more than happy to see you taking part in this and all of your comments and feedback will be very much welcome. So open science is a big chance for Ukraine. They reform the national scientific system and to make a big step towards Europe and better science because open science is just science which is done in the right way. Thank you all for your attention and your questions are welcome. You can find my contact information down there. Thank you, Alexander, for this talk. I think it is so important for the young scientists to move along these lines. They will be driving our science forward in future. So as far as I can see, you can get in touch with the Eurodoc through you or through your organization. I think it's better through me. Typically, I can see all of the messages coming in. And uh, Sebastian Dalla is speaking Euro, uh, later on, the vice president of Eurodoc. And uh, you will see that we're helping Ukraine along these lines a lot. Okay, let's move on. Next one up is Yevgeny Represensky, the executive director of the Association of Users of the Ukrainian Telecommunication Network, URAN. He will speak about the role of the National Telecommunication Network, URAN, in terms of enabling access to the world educational infrastructure. Hello. We can see our slides, everything's good. My name is Evgeny Probozhensky. I'm an executive director of URAN Association, which is the Association of Users of the National Telecom Network for Education and Science. This time I will speak about the global research infrastructures which are accessible to Ukrainians through URAN Network. I appreciate the opportunity to speak here. Just a few words about the organization. 
the Iran Association is the National Research and Education Network. We offer access to high speed channels and offer unique services for education and science. Iran Association is a non for profit organization established by Ukrainian universities, also National Academy of Science and Pedagogic Science of Ukraine. It's a membership organization. Right now we have 83 members. We're open for more. Any institute or university, any research institution can apply for membership and gain it. Iran has had a long track record of involvement in projects. In 2008, we were an associated member of Giant, and next year, we worked with Giant in terms of fiber optic connection through the Polish PSNC. In 2011, there was a tenfold increase in this connection. In 2015, Iran became a full-blown member of Giant, where we represent the interests of research community of the country. Same year, the EU project EAP Connect has begun. So Iran was the implementing agency from Ukraine. After five years, EAP Connect started new five-year plan in 2020. Thanks to involvement in that, the Iran network be, has been evolving gaining more capacities in 2018. We allowed for a 20 gigabit per second connection around Giant to Vienna. Later on, it has become a part of Giant European infrastructure because of two new channels featuring 100 gigabit per second, gigabit per second. Since 2019, the network has become a part of the national EBRG infrastructure. So it's on the list of national resources of the Intergovernmental Group on Infrastructure Development of Europe, EIRG. We took part in developing the concept of developing Ukrainian research infrastructure, which was approved by the government last April. As we took part in international projects like UpConnect, Ukraine has gained an opportunity to integrate its education and science with the European communities for the sake of digital development. Let me tell you how it's done and what are the outlooks from this for educators and scientists. And gently with the library, we started digitalizing the cultural heritage Within EAP Connect, we purchased a high performance scanner to digitalize wide format books. Colleagues from the Polish institution came up with the software. They localized it for Ukrainians and they offered free licenses to Ukrainian scientific libraries. In the slide, you can see the results. A screenshot of the website of a digital library. The collection keeps on growing as new samples are scanned. Further on the center, we'll be able to work with other science and education institutions. We offer access to high-speed Xi'an channels, so much needed by other research projects. We'll work with the unit of nuclear physics in the National Science Center of Kharkov Physical and Technical Institute. The Ukrainian team processes data from a big collider as a part of the experiment based on CMS solenoid. And then you gain access to this thing through Xi'an network. Before the war, they had access to Giant through a channel featuring 
10 gigabit per second. They wanted to make it up to 40 gigabit per second because the data stream was going up all the time. And it's gonna keep going up after modifying the kill letter, which should be done before 2027. This was one of the best computation centers in Ukraine, keeping its reputation up internationally. So RAN network can offer high speed connections up to 100 gigabit per second. Another example of using this channel is about the future project from Kiev Polytechnical Institute. It's a science and technology project on developing methodologies and software to monitor climatic changes based on satellite imagery. This will contribute to sustainable development of economy, territories, and to protect critical infrastructure under an elevated environmental load and climate change. This project will need a multiple address service, UMETCAST, from the European Organization of Operating Meteorologic Satellites. So these data arrive in the real time mode to the receiving stations. And for that, you need powerful Xi'an channels. The Kiev University and Hyder Meteorology Center will be able to gain access to that through URAN network. Apart from access to high-speed channels, we would like to offer unique digital services as a standard for science and education. Ed Rome allows to get connected to the internet no matter if you work in your institution or somebody else's. Tens of thousands access points of in their home are found in hundreds of countries of the world. And one of them is Ukraine. And again, is a way of authorizing the use of single access technology, allowing the users to gain access to world scientific resources through one record released by home institution to the user. And again, is seen as the single system in Europe for authorizing professors and students of universities, allowing them to be a part of Erasmus Plus. So the system allows Europe to implement a digital student's ticket and Erasmus Plus on a paperless basis. At the VPN, it's a protected data transfer designed specifically for education and science you use free Wi-Fi for that. The authorization happens with the help of Edu gain. File center, this is for sending big files. Use anonymous file server like Magazine, Google Disk, but they're not protected. They do not stop the leak of confidential data. All file center persona carries uh, identifiable data through EduGain and they're always protected. Service Academy allows students and staff of involved institutions to gain access to online services or they can be purchased on special terms. In this case, they protect personal data of the user. It's not a part of the purchase chain. It's an ancillary service which allows the purchaser to see if a potential client has the right for economic discounts. For that, they use the record of a user in the edu game. All of the services are on the list of IOSC services and Giant Network is the provider of EOSC. I earlier said that last year, Iran has become a part of the European Jihad infrastructure. They launched two new channels, Chisinau Kiev and Kiev Poznan. 
extend in pan-European network and increase in the strategic significance of this country to Xi'an. The new connection will be part of Kiev, Chisinau, Poznan, and that's the connection line between the two countries of Eastern partnership. The new sites like Chisinau, Kiev, and Kiev, Poznan have a throughput capacity of 100 gigabit per second. In the EAP Connect, there is a contract for the right to use this for 15 years. The prices and technologies will not become more expensive once the project is over. The new infrastructure is based on the spectral technology to transfer more data with the help of light waves of different length. It is possible to transfer the data at the speed of 400 gigabit per second by modifying the transmission modules. These channels will allow us to quickly connect other institutions to GIANT, astronomic observatories and others needing access to European digital infrastructures, VLCI, Copernicus, etc. Some information about the Ukrainian research and scientific services. There are 28% of universities connected to us. They have 450,000 students and staff in total. There are 12 specialized services for science and education. And the round is offered in 140 locations and you get 50,000 successful connections per year. Ukrainian students and professors and scientists that are now abroad will be able to use the service in order to gain access to the internet. Five services are provided through identification system at again. Before February, we would do one big webinar in three months, and I think we'll be able to resume it through URN before February, we would monthly transfer up to 1.5 gigabyte of scientific traffic, which is the highest rate among countries of Eastern partnership. Thank you and any questions are welcome. Thank you. I can say a question in the chat, but I can also say an answer there. All right, let's carry on. And with this, I would like to move on to the next presenter. Gabriela Mejes, data site manager. She'll speak about persistent identifiers as an open infrastructure. Zaros. Hi, uh, everyone, and Sabina, if you can uh, please um, share the slides on your screen, please, because my connection is a little mm -hmm. bit unstable. Okay. Yes. Okay, um, can you share the slides from the Google slides? Because I think those are more up to date. Uh, up to date. Mm -hmm. Yes, sorry for not mentioning that before. Uh, where is this slide? Uh, yeah, let me share it mm -hmm. to you for chat. I'm sorry to yeah. all participants. Here you go.
one moment. Yes, that's that's the correct version. Mm -hmm. If you can put the presenter okay. view to see them um, bigger. Yes, all right. Perfect, great. Uh, so um, yes, uh, hello everyone. Uh, I'm Gabriela Mejias, uh, community manager at DataSite. Um, before I start, I would like to uh, thank uh, Natalia Galiushna and uh, Sabina Ogunas for uh, the invitation to participate in this event. And uh, today I'm going to speak to you about persistent identifiers and uh, more specifically uh, about uh, DOIs and how this help um, to provide uh, infrastructure uh, for open science. Uh, next, please. And uh, for those of you who don't know uh, DataSite, um, we are an organization created by and for the community in 2009. Um, our vision is to connect research and identify knowledge and uh, we are registered as a nonprofit organization in Germany, and we are a member organization where uh, financial is sustained by membership fees. Um, we are governed by the community, by an executive board that is formed by member uh, representatives, and we have membership in more than 15 countries. And um, we uh, provide identifiers and metadata. I will speak more about that later. Uh, so that's a digital infrastructure we provide for research. And um, we um, are committed to the principles of open scholarly infrastructure. This is very important because um, we've signed uh, this commit commitment and means we're engaged in follow these principles of open governance, uh, sustainability and technical uh, insurance to provide an infrastructure that is and will remain uh, open. Next, please. And um, we want to Sorry, I don't see it changing. Next, please. Um, we want to help um, build uh, an open and global uh, research infrastructure, uh, but we cannot do this on our own. Uh, we rely on our uh, members uh, to use our services to identify and connect research. And you can see some numbers of our community. So we currently have more than 280 members in more than uh, 15 countries uh, that have connected more than 2,700 uh, repositories to assign DOIs and register metadata for um, data and other outputs uh, with data site. And um, you can see two very uh, popular uh, examples, Zenodo, which is a generalist repository, and Archive, which is a preprint repository. So uh, these are uh, two initiatives that have uh, joined data site and that allow DOI and metadata registration using our services. And um, Organizations uh, can use uh, these services to identify the research data, but also other outputs like we'll see later on, and to make um, this uh, scientific production more uh, discoverable, uh, reusable on a global scale. And this is one of the key benefits of using data site. So currently we have 51 consortia, which are groups of institutions that come together to adopt um, DOIs on a broader or even national level from those 51, uh, 26 are in Europe. So we have a strong adoption uh, in Europe, but we also have consortia in North America, in Oceania, in Latin America and in Africa. And altogether, more than 1,200 organizations um, are sharing uh, the research uh, metadata through data site for the global community. Next, please. Um, next, please, Sabina. Uh, and the services uh, we provide to the community, um, the most foundational one is uh, registration of DOI and metadata. Um, and um, yeah, this helps identify, correctly identify uh, research outputs and um, make them visible on a global scale. 
community support. So this means technical support, documentation, but also very important to say that uh, the data site metadata schema uh, is governed by um, the community. So we have a metadata working group that discusses changes in our schema so that it can evolve as the needs of the community evolve and then share new version proposals publicly for community consultation. And uh, we also offer APIs to ingest data, to register um, information, and um, also analytics and dashboards to help track the influence of research. Next, please. And uh, here you can see uh, some um, statistics about our registry. So we have uh, more than six, uh, 36 and a half millions of DOIs registered. Uh, from those, uh, you see that the, uh, that the uh, highest uh, number of DOIs uh, is registered for data sets, but we also have other kind of outputs uh, like uh, images, physical objects, preprints, uh, collections, software, and more. And um, you can see also um, that the repository that's uh, registering the highest number um, of outputs is Senodo, but we also have um, Figshare, Archive, uh, GBIF. And um, data site is connected to re 3 data, which is the registry of research data repositories. So this allows us to pull uh, more information. Um, so um, we can see if a repository has a kind of certification like the core trust seal certification, which is an international uh, certification for repositories or the DINI certification, which is a German initiative uh, for repositories uh, best practice. Um, next, please. And uh, this is an example uh, of a data set um, from agroforestry research. And you can see um, it was uh, deposited uh, in, a, in a Dryad uh, data repository. And you can see it uh, correctly and uniquely identified. Um, so uh, it has a DOI, uh, the contributors, and the year of publication is 2009. Because it's identified with a DOI and contains metadata that allows to understand who, when, and how this um, data was produced, um, it is findable, it is accessible, and can be reused. So on the right, you see uh, nine years later, this data set is cited as part of a research paper in a plant uh, ecology journal. And you can see on the right uh, the data citation, uh, and it cites the DOI. Next, please. And uh, here you can see uh, the data site uh, metadata schema. So um, we have three different levels of metadata attributes. Mandatory, so this needs to be registered or otherwise uh, the DOI registration will fail. So you need to include the creators of uh, the output, the title, the organization that publishes it, the publication year, and what kind of resource type is. And you can see on the right, the resource types we have, and this go uh, from data set, data paper, um, software, preprint, data management plan, and beyond. And um, very important to include other identifiers uh, as part of the metadata. For example, after this presentation, I will deposit these slides into a uh, Senodo to assign them a DOI. And then uh, when I complete the metadata for this um, material, for this resource, on the related identifier field, I will add the conference DOI because the State Scientific Technical Library of Ukraine has used the Confident platform to identify this event uh, with a DOI. So this is another example of how um, DOIs identifiers uh, help connect all the elements involved in research. Next, please. And in the persistent identifier or PIT world, we like to say that persistent identifiers are the 
um, building blocks of research and uh, metadata uh, is um, the glue that helps uh, sticks all uh, those blocks together. Uh, metadata is crucial to connect research and to make it more discoverable and reusable. And um, data site uh, DOIs um, are connected throughout the research ecosystem through other persistent identifiers. Um, so when um, you uh, register a DOI for a data set, you can uh, also identify the creators um, of this uh, data set with the working identifiers, assert an affiliation through a ROAR identifier, and even connect information of who's funding that research with a cross-ref uh, grant uh, identifier. And uh, also important to mention that our uh, metadata schema, so the data site metadata schema is uh, a standard globally used in the community and allows many more connections. I'm just um, mentioning these uh, particular uh, identifiers and organizations as uh, these also offer open metadata. Next, please. And thanks to our members registering research outputs and resources with data sites and uh, the power of persistent identifiers, research becomes more um, discoverable. And persistent identifiers and metadata interconnected form a graph. Um, we call it the PID graph. And this technology was built as part of the Horizon 2020 project Freya. And this is a network of uh, persistent identifiers. And as you can see on this snapshot, which is from August 2022, so now we have uh, more uh, information, uh, but you can see all the multiple entities connected, data sets connected, journal articles, the creators, affiliations, funding organizations, and more. And we offer open infrastructure and this information, uh, all these connections are available to all in the community via our GraphQL API. And uh, to allow this information um, uh, to be accessible for uh, the public um, uh, audience. Um, we have a user interface that's called uh, data site uh, commons and that allows everyone to um, search uh, by researcher, institution, uh, repository uh, works and uh, see all these connections. Um, next, please. And now we're going to see an example of how this looks uh, in action. So here you see a raw data set. It doesn't uh, tell us much uh, about uh, the research process um, of this output. But if we click again, if you can click, uh, now you see uh, the paid graph uh, in action. So um, this is uh, now the data set uh, correctly um, identified uh, with the DOI containing uh, additional information, creators, and abstract. And if you click again, uh, you can see the creators. Um, so um, and you can see their affiliation. So in this case, they're affiliated with uh, research institutions and facilities in the USA, uh, in UK, in Australia, and France. And um, if you click again, um, we can see the impact of this research. Uh, so you can see uh, it's uh, the data set has been um, uh, cited uh, 48 times. Uh, it has more than 15,000 downloads and um, close to 13,000 views. And if you go to the platform, you can see even more information. So this is an example of how persistent identifiers and metadata uh, can uh, help share data on a global scale and can help uh, track the, the impact of uh, your research. Next, please. And um, to finish, I would like to mention uh, that um, there's a community around persistent identifiers um, that's working to adopt uh, persistent identifiers, data set, uh, DOIs, and other identifiers. 
on a national, national and regional level. Um, so um, this is uh, on the left, you see a snapshot of a report from the um, Australian Research Data Commons. Um, they've um, commissioned an independent report to analyze um, the cost and benefit of using persistent identifiers uh, interconnected. And the result is that they can uh, they could save around uh, 24 million uh, uh, dollars uh, per year and 38,000 uh, person days uh, per year if uh, instead of retyping uh, information about research, they use identifiers and allow for um, automatic um, data exchange. And uh, GISC in the UK has also uh, released a similar report um, last year. You have the link on the slides. And uh, there's also an RDA working group uh, that's um, exchanging experiences around national PID strategies and uh, on a more broader uh, level, so on a regional level, um, the European Open Science Cloud is also looking to adopt persistent identifiers in an uh, even wider scale. Um, so the FAIR Impact Project, which is a Horizon project, is also looking at persistent identifiers and um, the work we are leading on that project with DataSight is to coordinate um, how uh, persistent identifiers um, will be included and integrated in uh, the European Open Science Cloud. Uh, next, please. And uh, I would like to finish with a call to action to uh, register DOIs and identifiers for your data, for your outputs, um, to include identifiers as part of the metadata, as, as we saw, this is very important, and to share these connections with the community. So this means to choose uh, infrastructure providers that offer open uh, metadata. Um, Persistent identifiers and metadata uh, can help uh, make um, data fair to put these uh, principles of findability, accessibility, interoperability, and reusability in action, as we saw throughout the presentation with the examples. And um, to go beyond by making these connections, uh, these relations more open and transparent, um, it's possible to enable recognition for all kinds of contributions uh, to research. So you can use uh, your infrastructure to help promote open research. Thank you. And I think there's a next slide, but we can, we can have uh, time for discussion now. Thank you so much, Gabriela, for this information. DOI and PIs are so important. They really help researchers share their data for the conference and scientific articles. So I think research projects will use this function as well. So let's move on and um, we're gonna have the next presenter, Matsu Maril, Director of Digital Humanitarian Sciences Center, Polish Academy of Science. He will speak about supporting Ukrainian open science from short-term goals to long-term gains. So Matsu, you're welcome. I think so. Uh, do you see the uh, the slide, uh, the presentation, or the uh, presenter? The presenter is, is okay. Yeah. Yes, but they're small. It's a small format. But so you see the presenters view, okay? Because it's always we just let me switch it. Uh, it's always uh, how about now. Yes, now you see the, uh, the, the the correct presentation. Okay, perfect. Uh, so, uh, yeah, the, uh, I'll speak in English. <laughs> my language is not that well, but I just uh, wanted to share some insights into what we've been doing um, 
uh, supporting the uh, uh, the uh, uh, Ukrainian open science and what could be done. So some lessons learned from other uh, projects or, 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 or perspectives. So uh, starting with short term goals, um, there were uh, from, from the, the brink of the invasion, there were many already initiatives uh, forming from um, the scholars to support uh, um, the, like scholars in uh, in Ukraine, uh, the uh, you, you know Aksuho Science for Ukraine, some others um, listed here. But I would like to talk about more uh, in more depth about Suez today. It was already mentioned by uh, Irina Kuchma and Suzanne de Michel earlier on. Mm. It was an initiative we uh, we started uh, together with a group of uh, colleagues uh, from from France and from international infrastructures, basically looking at uh, the situation in which uh, um, the researchers, Ukrainian researchers, received some support from different institutions, universities. However, they were they were still lacking the directed support for uh, for uh, editorial stuff. So we basically formed this kind of coalition uh, for supporting Ukrainian editorial stuff. And um, you see the institutions involved there, like OPRAS, IFO, um, uh, my institutions, Institute of Literary Research of the Polish Academy of Sciences, UAB, DOAJ, or OAPEN. So these were the, uh, the main, um, uh, the main uh, players. So uh, what we did uh, from the onset was to, uh, to start with scoping the needs of the uh, uh, of the editorial staff. So we started with a small survey. Um, we received over, around 150 responses from uh, mostly from journals, but some also from editors. And basing on this, we we drafted uh, basically what uh, what the needs are um, currently. How, how how can we help? So uh, first of all, of course, there was the uh, the, the financial support. Uh, um, issues of how we can uh, help in this again in the short term peri period so how we can support sustain uh, the journals so they um, they kind of uh, keep on going uh, despite um, everything uh, uh, another thing was training so the, uh, so basically the questions about how we can uh, um, provide some competencies and um, an instructor uh, instruction to uh, uh, to journal editors who who may wish to uh, uh, to, 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 for instance, internationalize their journals or go open access, et cetera. And the questions for mentoring, so one-on-one -on -one, uh, uh, support. Uh, so eventually we started to, uh, to move with those uh, issues. So first of all, we started a uh, crowdfunding uh, a campaign to support uh, journals with small uh, scholarships. And uh, the good news was that it was like uh, it, it exceeded uh, our expectations a lot because we we managed to award uh, 40 small scholarships. The downside is that uh, as a volunteer organization, we still struggle with um, processing all the claims. But I hope that uh, soon in in, in the um, in, in the upcoming week we should finalize uh, finally and all the uh, the journals we receive the support from us. And basically, it's based on the small grants. So we. Uh, we just uh, ask uh, the journal to provide the description of the work they want to do, and we support them to uh, to, to achieve this goal. Uh, secondly, the uh, the teaching uh, um, or, or like mentoring and then uh, tutorial um, um, activities. Um, we we launched the summer schools so with summer school with uh, with some tutorials on what basically. Uh, um, I was asked for from us by by the journal editors. So uh, indexing journals in the directory of open access journals, um, copyright and li licensing issues, best practices in journal publishing, um, and finally we we did a learning session with publishers about which I will just say in a second. Um, however, um, uh, two first, uh, um, uh, uh, I mean the, all, all the uh, all the um, um, uh, the recordings are available. On the Suez uh, website, and especially two first uh, uh, workshops were uh, held uh, in uh, Ukrainian by uh, Irina Kuchma. So, uh, so you can still uh, check them out, and they provide like a really, really nice uh, overview of those uh, issues. So, uh, um, but moving to the also the the, the final um, uh, workshop we had publishing scholarly uh, journals. Uh, uh, through the session, we also kind of. Uh, try to, 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 to deepen the understanding of the needs and uh, of our future actions. And also currently, uh, Suez is trying to 
to launch uh, uh, this, the uh, targeted support for uh, for publishers. So uh, it's still under um, let's see development, but uh, check out the our, our website and and stay uh, tuned. Um, so uh, basing on those experiences and all the other experiences we had with uh, with infrastructures, I just wanted to briefly address the main issues of uh, of those. Uh, uh, of this conference, uh, just moving to from this from the short term uh, immediate support to, to long term support, long term gains uh, when we're building the open access environment. And uh, most of the stuff I'm, I'm happy, most of the stuff I'm going to talk about was already kind of covered by uh, by different presenters because uh, basically what we what we want to achieve here is to uh, to think already when building this is an open access environment. To think ahead of how we can, we have to structure and what should we take into uh, consideration, and I'll be basically um, dwelling on my experience from those uh, uh, from from those two papers. I will send you the links in the in the second. These are the ones we 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 developed uh, building the uh, Operas uh, research infrastructure presented already uh, today by Suzanne uh, Dimusha. So let me go with like f f five main pillars uh, uh, for. Uh, for open access for the ending of my um, talk. So first of all, the interoperability, and there was like so much said today about it that I would just basically reiterate and the importance of that, that uh, if we use standards, we uh, definitely the content we produce, we post, we uh, make available, uh, could be discovered, could be aggregated, uh, and could be interoperable. And why is that important? Then, this, then the second pillar, the second I is infrastructure. Is that through this we can uh, we can uh, make our the resources visible on different stages. In the opening uh, remarks, we heard today that uh, uh, we wish, uh, um, or the, the the ministry wishes, also the, the Ukrainian content to be present in EOS. And actually, it's already there um, because of this fact of this kind of aggregated. So, for instance, if you see this kind of pyramid here, so um, the content. From, uh, for instance, the journals uh, already indexed in DOAJ on the lower level um, are then re-indexed by GoTriple, which is kind of a gateway to EOS. And I can show you how it works in practice. So this is the Go GoTriple platform, GoTriple for open uh, um, uh, uh, science for uh, research materials in SSH. I just typed in Ukraine just to get some uh, some results, but you can see that. Uh, um, we already uh, ingested many uh, journals, many materials in Ukrainian, and they are already visible uh, there um, uh, to, to be discovered by uh, researchers. So this, this is a multilingual platform. So this is like, again, reiterating the importance of, uh, of having the uh, interoperability and having the infrastructure which, uh, which is connected to, uh, to those higher level infrastructure. Thirdly, interdisciplinarity. So again, we're going with the third I, which is interdisciplinarity. Um, and here uh, it was already also mentioned today, the agreement on the reforming research assessment. The research assessment uh, is, is, uh, is changing. We, should, we need to be uh, really uh, aware that not only journals or monographs is something that counts, although of course they count, but also other types of, uh, um, of um, outputs like data, like all innovative outputs here, I just showed you the, the screenshot from Journal for Digital History, which is like a really interdisciplinary um, enterprise which links uh, uh, text and data and visual materials. So we need to be open to uh, think also about those kind of uh, outputs, which are like important for particular disciplines or in particular disciplines. So nevertheless, whenever we speak about the openness, we need to take the disciplinary um, disciplinary um, needs into account. Um, and thirdly, and this is insider leadership, I call it, but it's basically scholarly led. I just needed the fourth I, so that's why it's insider. But uh, uh, what we really need for infrastructures is to be led by scholars. So these are the roots of scholarly communications, as you hear, see here. Uh, the, the Greek philosopher is debating, but uh, basically the, 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 the idea here is that the, the scholars need to keep or retain control over the infrastructure, how infrastructure is, uh, is built, because in the end, the infrastructure has to respond to researchers' needs. So this is like really important that uh, uh, that scholars uh, lead the um, those efforts uh, as as it's done. For instance, like in, in such infrastructures, like uh, like um, uh, through such infrastructures like OPERAS. And finally, inclusiveness. So uh, uh, 
when we think about the open access, when we think about uh, the uh, the open access system, we need to think about about it as a kind of through a systemic approach, as a as a as a connection, interconnected uh, like network of different actors. So when we want to uh, when we want to, um, uh, to, 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 to build a strategy, we need to consult all these stakeholders. We need to, to bring them uh, uh, together in a, in a, uh, to, to, to achieve the better momentum, to achieve the better action. But uh, um, this is actually like so really important that, uh, and that's why, again, the ministry support is really important to, to sort of work on uh, different um, uh, levels here. Um, so I'll just uh, finish with this. So this is this a quick overview of those long-term goals and gains and this uh, stuff. I'll, I'll, I'll share uh, in a minute uh, the reports I mentioned for those of you who are interested. And uh, finally, the final word and for those of you who are who would be interested in um, in, 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 in cooperating with uh, with Suez uh, or those initiatives I, I, I mentioned uh, as we may need may have some need for uh, for support from Ukrainian colleagues. Please do get in touch with me. I'll be very, uh, very happy uh, uh, to, to join forces uh, in the future uh, for, um, endeavors. So uh, thank you very much for that. Thank you for this information and support of Ukrainian scholars. I hope this cooperation will be continued. So with this, we move on to Kimberly Parker, the program manager of Hinder Library and the Digital Network of WHO. She'll speak about open access in the research for life or science knows no borders. Thank you. The conference today is about open science and innovation and the quote in the title of my talk is from Louis Pasteur. Science knows no country because knowledge belongs to humanity and is the torch which illuminates the world. I intend to show you today some of the ways that Research for Life is helping science cross borders. I assume almost every one of you is familiar with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Implicit in them is the concept that access to research outputs is an essential catalyst for innovation and development, that without equitable access to the results of global research and development, researchers in low and middle income countries cannot experience a level playing field, nor contribute to the achievement of the objectives of the SDGs in their own countries. Research for Life aims to reduce the knowledge gap between researchers in different countries by removing barriers to access to research publications and reference resources from over 160 major scientific and professional publishers. It has been pursuing this goal for more than 20 years, and almost 200,000 publications are available for more than 11,000 institutions in lower income countries. In recent months, Research for Life has worked hard with colleagues at the Ministry of Science and Education of Ukraine and the State Scientific and Technical Library to enable wide access to this enormous library of scientific and academic knowledge. Even though Research for Life has been available in Ukraine for 20 years, it is only recently that this awareness has grown about the rich evidence base available for research and science and that is almost entirely due to the efforts of our Ukrainian contacts. Removing barriers to access scientific information is only the beginning, as we've heard from other speakers. Open science is a much broader landscape. Research for Life just launched its new strategic plan with a refreshed vision. Research for Life exists to cultivate an inclusive, diverse, and equitable scholarly communications environment, which enables researchers from lower income countries to address societal challenges. Innovation must be fostered, developed, adapted, and recorded so that in turn, it can inspire more innovation. 
with a large number of Ukrainian universities and research institutes now benefiting from the access to scientific publications through Research for Life, it is time to determine what we do not know and begin exploring that unknown country, the future. When we aim for the future, it's not just about building back better or learning lessons to apply in new ways. It is also about creating beauty around us. That is very evident when we look at the subject interest of institutions in Ukraine now using the Research for Life evidence base. Among these are medicine, psychology, agriculture, environment, chemistry, engineering construction and architecture, mathematics, economics and trade, electronics, intellectual property, history, law, theology, education, demography, social sciences, arts, physical education and sports, literature, and yes, music. The end goal, we want it all to become together for a just, peaceful and inclusive society. The thought of building on knowledge to innovate in fresh ways is not a new concept. Even back in the 12th century, Bernard de Chartres was reflecting on this, and his thoughts were later echoed by Isaac Newton. We are like dwarfs sitting on the shoulders of giants. Our glance can thus take in more things and reach farther than theirs. It's not because our sight is sharper nor our height greater than theirs. It, it is that we are carried and elevated by the high stature of the giants. Let us then open up the mountains of knowledge so that everyone can be giants, standing on the tops of those mountains. And a practical way to do that for all the Ukrainian colleagues participating in this conference is to contact your institution's library about the access to research for life. And if that library is not aware, the state scientific and technical library can help assist them to gain the access for all of this mountain of knowledge so everyone can climb to the top of it and be a giant. I'll pause there in case there are any questions. All right, thank you, Kimberly. So we appreciate the Research for Life for this opportunity to gain free access to Research for Life. So our scientists appreciate that. And back in March, Ukrainian scientists have been able to use scientific literature and that's so topical, especially in today's situation. And certainly it will help master innovative technologies and it will contribute to the rebuilding of this country. So thank you for your support and cooperation. So with this, I'd like to invite the next presenter, Ara Lognin, University Computation Center of Zagreb University. He will speak of National Electronic Research Structure of Croatia. Hello, everyone. I hope you can hear me all right. Okay, great. Thank you, Sabina. And uh, I'm hoping that, uh, first of all, uh, thank you for inviting me uh, to this conference. Uh, we sympathize for Ukraine, obviously. Uh, myself having been uh, 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 a child of war, in a matter of speaking, 30 years or so. So uh, we're here for you, and it's a great honor to be at this conference, even virtually, but I'm hoping to meet you all live someday. Uh, okay, so why this talk? Why are we speaking about Croatia? Uh, because, uh, first of all, we are building a national Chris, and I'm, as I understood, uh, Ukraine is also uh, aimed towards uh, uh, having a national Chris built. So uh, we are actually, I, I would. I was uh, hoping to show some of our good experiences with uh, National Chris and uh, all of the research infrastructure that we've put so much effort in, and uh, combining all of it together in, in a matter of speaking. So the idea is to share knowledge and, of course, to to, to be available for for any questions that you guys might have. So uh, right at the start, uh, we are Srce. 
that is the abbreviation of University Computing Center. And in Croatian, that means the heart. And I believe in Ukraine, you say Serce, which is pretty much the same. So there, uh, that, that, that explains our logo, which is which has the heart in it. So uh, we are actually the, the uh, research and uh, uh, higher education oriented uh, company. We try to build national infrastructure regarding data centers, network, uh, all the computer and storage resources, but also information services, information systems as well, and provide all the kinds of digital services to our users. We are strongly oriented towards uh, uh, research and academia. And uh, uh, of course, uh, no system can live by its own. So systems have to have a, a interoperability with, uh, also in the, the, the national level, but also in the international infrastructures and initiatives. So we're trying to be really a, syn a synonym for digital transformation of science and higher education in Croatia. Of course, uh, we are much smaller than Ukraine and we cannot compare. I think uh, we have like 11 times less people in Croatia than in Ukraine. Uh, but uh, there are uh, 20, uh, 227 research and higher education institutions in Croatia. We only have like 20,000 20, scientists here. But uh, for all of them, we're trying to build all the levels of our research infrastructure, as I said before. So basically, when we go <clears throat> from the bottom up, <clears throat> there is a uh, computer and storage infrastructure that we've built, national grid infrastructure, which is part of the European grid infrastructure as well, uh, high throughput computing and high performance computing uh, services as well. Uh, we have a cluster that is, uh, we started working on it uh, for high performance computing, we started working on it like 20 years ago or something like that. Uh, we also have a public cloud, which is public only for our higher education institutions and research institutions. And uh, we're building a, a huge uh, national scientific and educational cloud as we speak right now. Uh, it, is, it is part of our uh, ZOO project. We call it ZOO because it's scientific and uh, educational cloud aggravation in Croatia. Uh, it's a huge project and uh, it's uh, funded mostly by European Union. Uh, we are using something like 25 or 26 million euros from uh, European funds uh, to build a, a national cloud. And basically it sums up to uh, building uh, five data centers uh, throughout Croatia. Uh, and those data centers are strictly for higher education and research uh, use. So uh, on, on top of that, we're building uh, uh, services, obviously, uh, from housing of uh, other people's uh, equipment to uh, scientific software, high performance computing, cloud computing as well, storage data centers, etc. So, but the hardware isn't everything that researchers need. So uh, there are layers and layers of infrastructure on top of that. Uh, basically from trust and identity, uh, we heard uh, uh, some uh, hour ago talk about uh, Edurom uh, in the Uran presentation. So Croatia is one of the founders of Edurom, I'm proud to say, and uh, we alone has, uh, have over a thousand locations uh, you can use Edurom as well. Uh, our authentication and authorization infrastructure is also part of uh, uh, Edu, EduGain. So a lot of identities, uh, children uh, already in uh, elementary school are getting their uh, virtual identity in uh, our uh, AI uh, infrastructure and that follows them throughout their uh, scholarship and uh, and uh, and research life if they have one as well uh, other than that uh, there are various data infrastructure and services uh, we have a national portal of open access journals so all open access journals that are actually uh, uh, in Croatia uh, are part of uh, our national portal and it's a huge uh, 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 source of information for our students. 
And then uh, there are uh, there is a national uh, re uh, repository uh, infrastructure. We have uh, 150 digital repositories for various research and higher, edu in higher education institutions. And uh, there is like 20, 100,000 digital objects already stored in that uh in, in that uh, infrastructure most of them are open source or open access i should say and there is also a, a, a storage sharing service where every actually a researcher a lecturer gets uh 200 gigabytes by default uh of space to share uh, their own research data and everything they need for collaboration. On top of that, there's another layer of information systems. I will not go into that because we're limited in time here. Uh, some of them are aimed for only for higher education, some for uh, for research. But you know that higher education and research are highly interconnected. So, and on top of that as well, there is our e-learning center, and we're proud to have open access and open education materials there as well. So uh, we're, we're putting an emphasis on openness, uh, even in our uh, e-learning environment. And all of that actually we use to build the pyramid of knowledge. So uh, the idea is to collect, to collect uh, as much data as you can, organize it into information, and then provide data analysis on top of it. So all of that we provide as sets for our, uh, our, our stakeholders. And those are ministries, universities, institutions, uh, various national agencies and, and everything. We try to actually enable them to uh, get some uh, politics done and, and to, to make informed decisions. And how does that fit into a CRIS? So we're finally getting to, to our national CRIS. We're building it as well. Uh, it's a single installation Chris for all the the the, the Croatia, and uh, it's also a EU funded project. Uh, I think this is funded by some two million euros uh, for several years now. Uh, I will go uh, deeper into the the uh, what Chris actually will contain, but the idea is to interconnect it both nationally and internationally, which. Uh, Orchid, Open Air, Web of Sanscops, and every other uh, institution, especially we focus on uh, openness. So uh, we're trying to gather as much as uh, PIDs, DOIs, uh, and every other identifier that we can gather to be able to share and, uh, and uh, curate the data as much as possible because we want this system to provide reliable information that is our primary goal uh, then we want to promote open science with it as well and uh to support decision making that i uh, previously mentioned so uh in the system itself we will have a, a national registers uh, which is actually part of the ministry of science and education in croatia uh, register of scientists, uh, science institutions, and, and so on. Uh, it will contain all, all data about the uh, research projects and their financing, uh, about journals and publications of creation authors, uh, their citations, and probably uh, patents and products if they have one that are related to the projects and publications. Uh, uh, also, uh, various events that are uh, research oriented and uh, equipment, research equipment and services. So uh, this ladder uh, is something that I will mention uh, further on as well. Uh, when talking about uh, supporting open science, I mentioned already some of our services, but also we are National Research uh, Data Alliance node. And uh, our latest initiatives is of course uh, aimed through our EOSC, so we're actually trying to uh, uh, establish our national open science cloud as part of EOSC initiative. So we have uh, started our creation open science cloud initiative as well. Uh, one of the main goals is creating a national open science plan and uh, establishing 
ESC, as a uh, NOSC, I should say, National Open Science Club. So uh, we have gathered all the universities in uh, Croatia, uh, uh, public funders and uh, uh, biggest science uh, institutions as well uh, into these initiatives. And we are actually uh, currently building a national open science plan, plan as well. We are supported by the government, of course, with that. And uh, uh, EOSC, as, as it was said earlier today, should be a system of systems so uh one of those systems is going to be our national open science cloud as well and uh if when we talk about supporting researchers from computing services which are actually low level and hardware based through uh data services which are kind of software based and database as well uh how does that play along with uh chris so uh if we if we look at it uh, we will have uh, all of the equipment that is available to scientists registered into our CRIS and all the services which are actually on top of that equipment and on all other uh, uh, services that are not may maybe uh, equipment based should be also uh, put into the into the CRIS and the CRIS will serve as a service catalog of uh, NASC. So that's our idea because a lot of uh, pretty much 90% of information, all of information that we plan to have in Chris will be open, will be publicly available. Uh, of course, we're respecting GDPR. That's why uh, I'm not talking about 100%, I'm talking about 90%. But uh, pretty much all of it basically will be publicly available. So those services will be actually at hand to our uh, researchers, and we're hoping that uh, our Chris will be a, a one-stop shop for our researcher. Our researcher will there uh, have a, their own profiles and everything, which are be which are going to be and already are actually uh, connected to Org ID to 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 Open Air and everything, and will be able to browse available services that are actually relevant and they can use it for their own research. So that's the idea. And uh, those services are going to be marketed as uh, NOSC services uh, propagated to ESC catalog as well. So they will be findable, accessible, and everything that I mentioned here is actually free for use to our researchers. So we're providing infrastructure and that is actually free to use to our researchers. Uh, how are we doing this? Well, obviously by, by using a lot of uh, EU funding as well. And I'm glad to, to, to understand that uh, Ukraine has already access to, to high rise in Europe. And I'm positive that once this war is over, you will be able, able to, to uh, access much more uh, EU funding uh, and other international funding as well to build both infrastructure and, and your increase as well uh, all of this of course is not uh, cannot be possible without people technology talents uh, talents and tolerance so these layer uh, two t's are actually people as well uh and instead of a thank you i just want to say i'm hoping to see you next year in person in kiev Thank you. Hopefully, it all will blow over and we will be able to do this offline in Kiev. Thank you. We actually have a question for you. Okay. Do you monitor? Uh, I can see, usage? but I, I need a, a translation. <laughs> it's going there right now. So is there any way you can monitor the repeated usage of the data sets in certain countries or universities in your system? Uh, is there any way that we can monitor uh, what? Repeated usage. Ah, repeated usage. Uh, currently not, but we're working on it. Yeah. Uh, right now we're working on uh, registering data sets in our uh, national repositories 
So once we have that registered, then we will know who use it and uh, who republish every anything of it. Yeah, that's the idea, at least. <laughs> And one more question. What metadata do you use for research projects that are done by scientists of your country? Is there any module integration, Chris, for that to track those projects? And uh, how are you intending to use the metadata are you collecting these data inside the country or will you use PITs and persistent indicators, identifiers for that purpose? Uh, that's a good question. So uh, we are actually based on a serif model. I'm not sure if you're familiar with serif. Serif is a <clears throat> data model that is actually uh, envisioned by uh, people from Eurocris. So uh, we took a serif model and adapted it a little. So uh, that's uh, that's your answer about metadata. Pretty much everything that's in serif and something more, obviously, for our national uh, needs uh, is uh, is used for for a metadata. Uh, we are collecting it the uh, the data about projects ourselves uh, because uh, not all projects that are research related are in uh, European uh, uh, infrastructures. So uh, we're collecting them. Uh, but for everything that we have in system, we have envisioned uh, usage of various identifiers. So uh, for us to be able to compare and share the data uh, between various infrastructures as well. So PIDs, yes, and every other actually, we're uh, gathering data about projects from CORDIS and uh, some other systems as well, both national and international as well. Okay, thank you so much. And let's move on. We're going to have it for Margaret Plant. She runs the laboratory in the Leibniz Center. She'll speak about open resources with Ukraine, that project. Hi, can you see my screen? Yes. Oh, perfect. Very Everything good. Okay. Yes. Yes, hello. Um, um, yeah, I'm introducing a project which is called Open Educational Resources with Ukraine. This is a project um, by the Leibniz University of Hanover with a couple of Ukrainian partners, uh, and it's on Open Educational Resource for Higher Education. And our overall goal is to maintain, further develop and digitize Ukrainian current teaching offering in times of crisis. And uh, the objectives are uh, first, we analyzed uh, the needs uh, for digital teaching in Ukraine and we formed Ukrainian and German working groups uh, to work on this. Uh, these working groups uh, are producing teaching and learning videos under open educational resource conditions. And then these videos will be integrated into current teaching and they will be anchored in the curricula of uh, all the partners. And uh, in all the working groups, uh, we involve uh, Ukrainian scientists and university lecturers, uh, especially uh, refugees. And also we build up digital literacy for further digitization so that these skills are available and can be used for uh, well further joint programs and for the reconstruction uh, of uh, yeah, digital teaching. Um, Here's a logo of the project o OER with Ukraine. And um, it's uh, our partners are, as I said, Leibniz University, then my institution, the Technische Informationsbibliothek in uh, Germany as well. Then I'm sure I'm not going to pronounce this correct. I'm sorry. <laughs> the Taras Shevko National University of Kiev and the Ukrainian State University of Science and Technology in Dnipro and the Kharkiv National University of Radio Electronics. <laughs> Um, 
yeah, this is the the duration is from uh, uh, June June to the end of the year. So it's a little project, and uh, we hope we can continue with this. So the title of the project is Open Educational Resources with Ukraine. What are open educational resources? According to the UNESCO definition, open educational resources are teaching, learning, and research materials in any medium, digital or otherwise, that reside in the public domain or have been released under an open license that permits no cost access, use and adaptation, and redistribution by others with no or limited restrictions. So when it comes to the legal basis, uh, we are here on the right side. When it comes to open licenses, we are just some rights re are reserved. We are not here on the other side with copyright where all rights are reserved. So with the Creative Commons license, the also copyright owners grant third party certain uh, rights to use, redistribute and adapt their work. And this is especially interesting for, for uh, open educational resources for higher education because this, um, allows a free access to education and knowledge. So you don't have to pay for it. It's not behind a paywall or you don't really have to sign in or anything. And it can be uh, used by others. It can, the, the materials can be remixed and uh, they can all, only maybe inspire you. But as I said, you can also with the open licenses, you can also really use the material and remix it with other materials which you maybe already have. And the good thing about open educational resources is that not everyone has to start from scratch with the materials, especially uh, for example, in the Ukraine, uh, where we were told that the, uh, uh, the curriculum of informatics is completely centralized. So why, uh, starting with, let's say, uh, basics for uh, programming in all the different um, universities. Why not use the same material? Maybe adapt it to your uh, students a bit, but that's it. But uh, that's the really advantage of open educational resources. And also, it really fosters cross international networking among educators, what we do, in, especially in our uh, project. So um, in our project, we uh, formed working groups, uh, subject specific professional working groups um, with uh, always one to two uh, refugee scientists and uh, yeah, uh, uh, lecturers and or PhD students, etc. from uh, Ukraine and also from uh, Germany. Our, the, uh, our main subjects are biology, material science, uh, biomedical engineering and information technology. And here, for example, in biology, the Institute for Botanic of the Leibniz University will uh, um, cooperate with the Institute of Biology and Medicine uh, from Taras Shevko University of Kiev. So it's always an institute from the Aloha uh, together with an institute from um, the Ukraine. So in these working groups uh, will um, produce or are already producing a series of teaching and learning videos under Creative Commons licenses. They will, the audio will be in English and Ukraine and they will have subtitles in English and Ukraine. And uh, so that these videos can then be integrated into current teaching uh, from all uh, different uh, partners. And the topics are, for example, in material science, uh, we will have a series of 10 video lectures uh, on a modern steel production, or also 10 videos on material testing. And uh, in uh, IT technology, uh, we will have a series of video lectures on image analysis, etc. So uh, at the end, we will have about, I think, uh, 40 or 50 uh, video uh, lectures. Um, and we have an additional working group, which is here in blue, which you can see here in blue, which is my institution, the Technische Informationsbibliothek, together with the Educational and Scientific Institute of Journalism in Kiev. And we are not a subject specific working group, but uh, we support uh, the partners when it comes to uh, video production and uh, with the uh, infrastructure. And uh, Kiev is also subtitling all the um, uh, videos. So this is just one example from uh, photogrammetry, a uh, little sneak preview, uh, but this is just the storyboard. Uh, they will be ready in a couple of weeks. Um, and when it comes to the infrastructure, we use a um, infrastructure for 
um, for videos, for scientific videos, uh, which is um, the uh, TABAV portal, which is hosted by my institution. It's an open access portal for sharing scientific and educational videos. We have been online since 2014 and for better um, retrieval and research. We also use um, technologies such as automatic video analysis, speech, text, Im image recognition to find things better in the videos and not just the things which are in the metadata. We also use a semantic indexing. We have more than 40,000 uh, quality tech videos in German and English. And now also videos uh, in the Ukrainian language will be added. We focus on all different scientific subjects uh, from architecture, uh, chemistry, computer science, physics, mathematics, engineering, and a lot more. And as I said, uh, the videos are predominantly under Creative Commons uh, licenses. Uh, so uh, for all the videos which uh, will be produced of, uh, in the working groups, we use this um, completely open um, infrastructure uh, where the videos will be hosted in a video repository. They will be described with standardized metadata data. They uh, will be uh, permanently citable with a DOI. So each of the videos receives uh, a DOI. We also use a technology which is called media fragment identifier, where you add a time code to the DOI so that you can cite a video by the second. Um, we link to accompanying materials also with DOIs. Uh, we provide embed code so that the videos can also be embedded in other environments. They will be long-term archived in uh, yeah, Rosetta and special uh, infrastructure uh, services. Um, all the videos uh, have a license agreement so that people really know what they are allowed to do with the video. Um, and the portal is completely free of advertising. Uh, not as in YouTube where you are uh, disturbed by all the, by all the um, advertisement and it's completely uh, uh, compliant with a data protection law and completely free uh, to use. So if you want to browse or search, you don't even have to log in. If you want to upload videos, you have to uh, have a login, but it's completely free. Uh, um, you don't have to pay anything for it. Um, all the metadata from the uh, videos which we produce in this um, um, project will also go in an open educational research search index, which is called ERSI. Uh, it's productive since 2021. It's also hosted by us uh, and run by us. And here we uh, collected more than 50 or uh, the met, uh, metadata from more than 55,000 educational resources from a lot of universities and from a lot of countries. So it's not only Germany, but also we have videos from the US, from Canada, from the Netherlands, from Denmark, etc. The interface is available also in Ukrainian language, and you can um, do a cross-lingual search. Uh, uh, for Ukrainian language, this al already works. This is a open uh, development, and you can, uh, you can take a look at it on, on GitLab or download it and do whatever you want to do with it. Um, and this is um, very good to have a broader uh, distribution of the metadata of these educational resources. And then uh, finally, we, uh, what we also do in this project is we'd like to empower all the project partners and students to digitize uh, teaching units, develop open educational resources, compile course materials, and address, uh, address any uncertainties related to legal, technical, and instructional issues. For this, we do um, we we will do three workshops. We have already done two with, I think, more than, I don't know, I think 200 uh, participants. Uh, and this uh, work these workshops focus on open educational resource basics, legal issues, technical issues, video production. And uh, we also uh, produced a self-learning module, uh, which is uh, translated or will be translated into Ukrainian language. And these workshops are um, basically on on, on the questions on what, what do you have to consider when you embed graphics or uh, parts of other videos or audio or graphics and screenshots to your video. So uh, especially when it comes to legal questions, what's really important? What do you have to do? And uh, yeah, that's the project. And then I have a call for action for you um, because we would like to um, 
uh, cooperate with all of you. So if you have interesting materials, videos for our uh, AV portal, just let me know. Here's my email address. Um, if you would like to, to uh, publish your videos on our portal, just uh, reach out to me. Or if you have uh, just sources for our Open Educational Resource Search um, Index, the ERSI, please also uh, let us know. And I think here's a lot of potential to share um, also Ukrainian content uh, with uh, the rest of the world. So thanks for listening. And um, yeah. And thanks for having me here. Thanks for the uh, invitation. Thank you, Margaret, for this initiative. I think it's really useful. And it's going to help our scientists spread this knowledge, share this knowledge with their colleagues and stakeholders. Thank you for taking part in this conference. Отже, хочу запросити наступного нашого спікера. So with this, let's move on to the next presenter, Irina Drach, the Director of Higher Education of the National Academy of Pedagogic Science of Ukraine. She will speak about Open Science in Universities, European Experience and Outlooks for Ukraine. Доброго дня, шановні колеги, чи видно презентацію? Hello, everybody. Видно, тільки розширте, будь ласка, на екран весь, якщо можна. Зараз, хвилиночку. Зараз, зараз, хвилиночку. Я вчу. Показ слайдів. Зараз, хвилинку. Що ж таке? Ура, все було. Так. П'ять. Натисніть F5. Шановні колеги, я перепрошую, але очевидно прийдеться так все ж таки. Добре. I'm sorry, I cannot make it any bigger. So, dear colleagues, I appreciate the opportunity to become a part of this important event that is hosted by Ukraine for the first time. And I would like to say that I appreciate international colleagues that have joined this event and uh, your support is so important to us right now. I represent the Institute of Higher Education of the Academy of Pedagogic Science of Ukraine. I'm in charge of this institute and I take part in the research on increasing university capacities of Ukraine in the war and post-war time in the context of implementing open science concept. While choosing the title of research, we analyze documents of the European research space and European higher education space. And there we can see the topicality of developing open science across European universities. Let me say that the vision of the future universities in 2030 suggests that the universities should allow researchers support the values of open science and that's how they can practice it everywhere. Recently in this country at the national level there has been a policy in persons of the open science you can see ordinance of the Ministry of Education to set up the roadmap to integrate the research system of Ukraine into the European research space. And you get a national plan on open science, which has recently been 
put together. And it has been mentioned earlier today. The analysis of the documents of the European research space has allowed us to come up with the vision of open science as a new paradigm in research. It's a new way of spreading the information of the research products. It allows to use resources and exchange them. It allows to have a better transparency of research products. You switch from research to innovations, thus increasing the efficiency of science. So you reduce costs for creating, using, and reusing data. And you also allow citizens to take part in the research. We have been exposed to the experience of doing Optima project in Ukraine, and we can see that there is a shared understanding of specific things related to the open science. One more document that matters to us is the one that speaks about the future of universities, is the European Commission document. It addresses the open science concept scientifically. It looks like a wheel. This wheel reflects the key features of the open science, like open access to publications, open research data, open academic communication. It also carries the indicators of open science. In this research, we have been able to look at the experience of European universities. There's a Shanghai ranking, so we can see the University of Cambridge, University of Oxford, Imperial College of London. They are the top three. And we have seen the results of an opinion sampling done by the European Association of Universities, covering 272 universities in 36 European countries. All in all, we can say that open science matters in terms of strategic priorities of European universities. In 59% of universities, it is like that. If you think of implementing open science among domestic universities, I would say that in this country, they are poorly aware of the importance of open science. They don't understand what it's all about. So you can see fragmented institutional policies in this regard. In order to draft the policies at the national level in the field of open science, we need to consider these findings. They suggest that there are certain factors behind open science. So in European universities, there is a national policy on open science requirements and funding research, and there is EU policy and recommendations on open science. We need to keep this in mind while thinking of how to get to the open science. There are certain factors that get in the way of the open science in European universities. So lack of incentives, there are issues with legal provisions and growing costs. Now, we also need to understand this. Potentially, we're going to face these issues as well while pursuing this concept in this country. There is one more factor that is behind the open science concept. It is the development of research infrastructure.
there are general virtual research infrastructures. And they allow for the entire open science space. We have been able to produce a model, an ecosystem for Ukrainian universities, which is based on European vision of the open science. And also it considers the peculiarities of infrastructure among domestic universities. We try to consistently look at how you can develop the research infrastructure according to the components of the open science. The interim result of this study is the outlooks of open science in this country. It is important to draft national procedures and quality assurance of open science based on the respective principles. We need to determine indicators related to the current status of education infrastructure. There's a need for a digital platform, Ukrainian open science to enable quality of research based on principles of open science. There's a need for national UCR science database and we need to improve funding for universities based on their performance, quality of research. We need to use criteria and indicators of quality based on the open science principles. The above recommendations were proposed by us in the course of proceedings of the National Council on Rebuilding Ukraine. And they all have been indicated in this plan. After this conference, it is clear that in addition to that, there's gonna be something else. We need to reform and update the assessment of research. In doing so, we have to consider the open science principles. The findings of our research can be seen in the website of my institute. The second stage findings are coming soon. So all Ukrainian and international partners are welcome to collaborate with us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Irina, for this overview. I'd like to now turn over to the sponsors of this conference. Franz Lederström, the global manager on licensing representing Betham Science. In this conference, scientists and researchers have been able to get access to the tool of the American Experts Digital. We shared, we shared this with the conference participants over the email. And also you can see this in the chat of this conference. Thanks to Garrett Dyack. And I'd like now to turn over to Franz Lettenstrom. He will speak about publications in the world's most influential magazines.
Yes. In, in the Antarctic once upon a time. Uh, anyway, next slide, please. I will go through the, the history a little bit. Uh, for, no, go back, go back. No, yeah, next one. So I will... Uh, talk a little bit about the history of, of open science. Uh, as you know, to, to publish is to get priority, to be the first one uh, that is acknowledged to have published something in theory or in experiment. Um, and this is uh, something that uh, will assert priority and also uh, in the very beginning was a correspondence between scientists. Um, and I'm talking about before the print was, was uh, invented. This infrastructure was invented about uh, 2000 years ago. Uh, it's called paper. Paper was invented in China about 2000 years ago and it became very important for the infrastructure because it's much cheaper than than papyrus. Next uh, infrastructure that is important for the spreading of science was the printing technology, which came in China about 1000 years ago. And the second most important is the moving the printing into the Gutenberg technology. And this was invented one generation before Gutenberg in Korea. Uh, and um, you can actually see this if you go to the National Museum in Seoul, where they have Gutenberg printed books, um, printed with Gutenberg technology from about 1405. Uh, and of course, this was the beginning of a big explosion, because at the same time, America was uh, discovered and the Spanish colonies were producing about 85% of all silver in the world. And most of this silver ended up in China. So China became a source of technological innovation for Europe. Europe got a lot of development through the Silk Road and this uh, exploded later with the colonialism, with all the history of uh, empires that you already know about. And this uh, will, of course, uh, as you know, uh, eventually lead to the first two scientific journals. They both came in 1665. It was Philosophical Transactions, published by Royal Society. And it was Journal de Savants, published the same year in Paris. Actually, Journal de Savants came a few months before uh, Philosophical Transactions, and both still exist today. Um, they have developed in such a way that Philosophical Transactions is now divided into seven different journals. And Journal de Savants has moved itself from science into humanities. Next slide, please. So here you see the first two issues of uh, Philosophical Transactions and Journal de Savant. Uh, and there you can see which month they came and Journal de Savant was first. Next slide, please. Uh, and this acceleration of science continued uh, and accelerated. It became uh, exponential. So from 1700s and upwards, you saw a doubling, doubling of scientific journals every 15 to 20 years. And now there are about 200,000 different scientific publications. 
and uh, out of them uh, there are uh, about 30,000 that are peer reviewed. Um, it's important to, to remember that in the 1800s, the scientific journals were very, very long. Uh, there were, they had, the scientists in those days had time to write long articles. Um, this doesn't exist anymore. Now there is publish or perish, as you know, and this is since the 1920s. So the science is now split up in small parts and published as, so, as, as fast as possible to get money, to get the position and so on. Uh, these uh, 30,000 uh, peer review journals are read about millions and millions of scientists all over the world, as you know. And uh, in the 1960s, uh, this paper world slowly started to transition into digital. So you know that internet was invented in, the 19, in 1969 in the US. 1989 came the World Wide Web, which was invented in, at CERN in Geneva. And uh, this started also the movement into open science because it was invented at CERN. At CERN, all science is open, as you know, both publications and the data. And that is where the World Wide Web was invented. Um, in 1992, the first preprint server was invented by Paul Ginsberg in Los Animas uh, laboratory. And he uh, didn't, of course, know what would happen later, but he is now called the Messiah of Open Access. Steven Ginsberg, uh, an Englishman, he wanted to expand because as you know, archive was something, was a preprint server only for physics, high energy physics. Uh, Paul Ginsberg in, uh, in psychology uh, wanted to expand this to other subjects. Now all subjects have preprint servers, uh, but he, since he was the first one to expand, he is called John the Baptist of open science. And then as you know, in 2011, uh, Alexandra Elbakian uh, started her SciHub and she is called the Virgin Mary of open science. Next slide, please. As you know, um, and this is a citation from Darwin, it is not the strongest that survive. It's not necessarily the most intelligent. It's even not necessary the most adapted that survive, but those that are not misadapted, those are those who survive. And this is very true in open science. Uh, it's very important to not be misadapted. Next slide, please. So there are many external pressures in open science coming from the European Union, coming from UNESCO, uh, coming from economy, because the theory is that you know, open science leads to open innovation. It leads to a much more advanced economy. And as you know, Horizon uh, 2020 and its followers are pushing for open science at European Union, and in many other countries outside the European Union. Uh, and this is uh, a continuation that is, for example, shown in Plan S. And a lot of science, both articles and data, is very soon available in open. Next slide, please. Uh, as you know, uh, open science stands for a lot of things. There is open uh, publications, of course, there is open data, there are open resources in education, there is, uh, there is citizen science, there is uh, a lot of different openness that 
eventually needs to open innovation. I will first talk about open access. Next slide, please. It's divided into green open access and golden open access. The green one are traditional uh, publications that are put in, uh, in uh, uh, places, in, in depositories, where they allow people to read it uh, even before it, it is uh, published. Some publishers force these publications to have an embargo, others don't. Uh, but it's very important to remember, if you publish in a preprint server, embargo is always zero. That is why it's so good to publish your data, to publish your science in, in predator, in, in, uh, in publications which are completely open, uh, which are repositories. Uh, in in uh, in universities, in uh, national repositories, and so on. Uh, the other side of open access is golden, and that is when the whole system is put upside down. You pay for publishing instead of um, having the publication handled by by publishers who get money from subscriptions. And then there is a way in between, which is called hybrid open access, which was already uh, written about by Walter Prosser in 1998. And this is actually the most common open access at this moment. Um, publications, both in green and in golden, mixed. Next, please. So this uh, open access is translated here in Ukraine to that all journals of Bentham Science, all ebooks of Bentham Science, and all our databases are now available to all universities, to all research institutes, and to all uh, hospitals here in Ukraine. And now I am also offering that you open this access also to the different uh, innovation hubs, startups and so on. So all you have to do is write to me and we will open this access. Uh, in the future, uh, whenever this becomes permanent, I also will allow all Ukrainian scientists to open in all publications in open access, all journals, we have about 170 journals, will have free open access publication from all scientists in Ukraine. Next slide, please. So we have a lot of journals, as I said, we have 170 different journals. Many have high impact factors. Next slide, please. And again, next slide. And again, next slide. Um, of course, in our editorial board, we have Nobel Prize winners being there as advisors or as editors. Here you have some examples. We are very strong in chemistry. We are very strong in medicine. Uh, next slide, please. Some more examples of open journal, of Bantam journals. These are open journals, gold, golden journals, which are about 40 of our journals and 130 of them uh, hybrid. Next slide, please. And of course, we have ebooks that are also available in Ukraine 1,200 ebooks. Some of them in medicine and, and in uh, chemistry, as I mentioned, but also 
any other subjects like physics, humanities, social science, and so on. Next slide, please. Here are some bestsellers you can look at. Uh, next slide, please. And finally, I will mention our databases. They are all in medicine. They are all about diseases, oncology, diabetes, and access are of course open to any hospital, any faculty of medicine, any startup. Next slide, please. The same for anti-inflammatory diseases like Crohn's disease, for example, um, of course, central nervous system diseases, uh, brain diseases, uh, next slide, please. Uh, heart diseases, and of course, all coronavirus diseases, not only COVID, but also other coronavirus diseases, because there are several related diseases to coronavirus. And that, next slide please, is the end, not the end of uh, the, the, the access of science. Of course, I hope everybody will write to me at this email, france at bentamscience.net, where you can add your institute if you're not already having access, and where you can also get help from many others uh, in these, uh, in these uh, big collaboration that we hope for. But there is one slide missing that we must go back to, um, that we hope that we jumped over. It's slide number four, I think. Next one. Next. No, before. Before. Oh no. So go go forward three slides. Three slides in the Can I can I move them? Ah, here it is. We jumped over this slide. Uh, it's very important. Look at this URL. This is where you can see how you, all scientists in Ukraine, can go to a free preprint server. This is in collaboration with Research Square. This is my co presenter who couldn't be here today. He is listening, so he's probably very eager that I don't miss this slide. In this URL, you see the free preprint server from Research Square. Um, the reason why it's important is because, as I said before, if you publish open in a preprint server before you publish, you win a lot of time because it's allowed to peer review an article published in a preprint server. The second URL on this slide is a place where you can get free quality control and language control on your article. It takes about six minutes to get it done. It's uh, completely automated by artificial intelligence. Uh, this is also a very nice resource. And the third resource, which is really the center of open science is open data like that I talked about before. Open data is when you link the data that you used to write your article to the article. There should be always a link between your article and your data in both ways. And there is a fantastic resource which is free called zenodo.com, uh, which is uh, paid for by CERN, the particle physics uh, center in Geneva and European Union. Any scientist can put in their data there 
There is no limit in how much data. You get a DOI link automatically. And this resource you register with your ORCID. So your ORCID number is used to enter there, to register there. And then you just need to start putting in your data that you used for writing your article. This is especially for such universities which do not have their own system for saving data. And I think here in Ukraine, probably most universities do not have this system. So Zenodo is very, very important in Ukraine. Please use it, it's free. And that is my talk. Any questions, please send them to my email, which was at the last slide, franz at bentamscience.net. And I hope I will get lots of emails there. And that's all for me. Thank you. And bye. Thank you so much for this talk and for allowing Ukrainian scientists to use your resources. Thank you for supporting them. Hopefully it's going to keep up like this. I think we're going to keep in touch with you further on. Thank you for coming down to Kiev. So with this, we're going to take a quick break and then we're going to continue. This open science marathon will go on. The next panel will start at 2 p.m. It's open access to research infrastructure. So let's meet back at 2 p.m. Hello and welcome back. It's a panel on open science infrastructure and the first presenter is Professor Soren Auer representing Leibniz Center. He is slightly late, so he will speak later. So in the meanwhile, I'd like to move on further Let's have it from Oksana Bruy, representing the National Technical University of Ukraine, Kiev Polytechnical Library, which is a part of the National University of Ukraine. She will speak about the open science policy, the experience of her university. Hello. I run the Science and Technology Laboratory in the National Technical University, which is Kiev Polytechnical University. I don't know how to make it full size. but I think I can keep going on like this. So let me tell you about our experience in the open science in my university. It's not a secret that openness is a global trend now in the world. In my university, we decided to establish an open science policy as well. 
we could see this open science movement and let me tell you how we did this in the university. In 2013, there was an open access mandate. It was about an open access platform. It featured three things, open access magazines, open access conference proceedings and the repositories, institutional repositories. Here you can see the numbers representing what's going on in each of these lines of business. All of this is in the open access, so you can go and check this out. The policy of the European Commission on Open Science has been quite a reason for us to think about doing something like this in the university. There are some requirements in the Horizon Europe and grant-based programs of the European Commission. All of that has allowed us to quickly start doing the same. There have been UNESCO recommendations which came through last November We relied on them a lot while drafting our own policy in this field. In Ukraine, certain things have been done towards open science. There is a roadmap of Ukraine integration with the European research space. Last year, they established a working group on this. They drafted the National Action Plan on Open Science. I serve on this group. This plan has been approved by the government, so now we have to act accordingly. So eventually, in November, I spoke at the Scientific Council of the University, and they told me, all right, that seems to be the way to go. So go ahead and organize a working group. You have to draft a provision on the open science and the implementation plan. The library was supposed to offer advice and consultations on open science and access. In early 2022, an ordinance was made which allowed us to start it all off. The working group worked all the way through summer we could see that we needed to have an entire policy on open science, not just a provision. And we drafted it. There have been public hearings. They ended on the 19th of October. So in early November, the Scientific Council of the University will reconvene and uh, that's where we're gonna present the results of public hearings. And I hope the Council will approve this open science policy. Let's now look at particular components of open science. There are four major things to us there. One of them is the open access to data and education resources. And whenever possible, we could possibly use the open source. So these are our key highlights in this policy. I'm not gonna walk you through all of that because you can find this online. You can go check it out. Let me tell you what's the purpose of having this open science policy in the university. 
again, I hope the Scientific Council will approve it officially soon. We want for the open science to become a standard in research and education in the university. That's the idea behind it and we're on it. In this document, we can see some terminology and it's important to have it there. We go by the terminology which is found in the Ukrainian legislation. So speaking of the principles and values of the open science, well, we didn't reinvent the wheel here. We took it from the UNESCO document. We kind of tailored it to our university, but basically it's the same thing. The purpose is understandable and clear. I'm not gonna read this to you. I think it's the same pretty much everywhere. Any university will do it pretty much the same way. The goals of the open science are seen here. These are particular objectives. I'm not gonna read all of this out because it's gonna take time. So let me take a beeline to the key points that were focused on. Access to research products of the university. As I told you, open access has been practiced in the university for quite a while. But from time to time, it has to be reviewed and modified. We need to look at some other tools that should be used to allow access to research results. So we are intending to keep doing this. Open access happens after the publication under the license of Creative, creative Compass. There might be information with limited access or information that should be protected under the intellectual property law. So the embargo will be there for two years and the group believes it's gonna be enough in order to draw up all of the intellectual property rights. Speaking of access to research data in the university, well, it all should be done based on fair principles and the data management plan. Access should be gained through the institutional repository of data in the university. We wouldn't have this right now. So we need to deploy it on a certain platform It may be a European platform, or maybe we're gonna do something on our own, I don't know. And restriction of access, well, you need to look into the legislation. There might be a need for special agreements on this. Then open education resources. We have to have DOI. In Creative Commons, it goes without saying, access should begin through the editorial platform of the university publishing platform. So we try to open Monograph Press in the library. We we'll think of it as one of the options for deploying the publishing platform of the university, but that's not a final decision yet. That's just one of the options.
So we used the repository. Additionally, it can be placed anywhere else in our repository or in some external platforms. Let's look at these scientific products again by educators. This comes under the kinds of things that I have alluded to earlier. So it is important that learners could open up a system and see that they're there. So we have decided to organize a section on learners. Intellectual property and ethic. In this section, you can find more detail on this. And you will see what is relevant to intellectual property and ethic. There should be academic integrity and ethical use of personal data in conducting research. The university will aid the researchers in licensing and gaining intellectual property rights, scientific products, and all of that. So there is a special unit on intellectual property in the university, and we believe it is important for researchers. The policy also determines the open science policy of the university, and you can see the key components of that. So it's the open science infrastructure that includes software, hardware, The software should be based on the open code whenever possible. And the policy determines the scope of that possibility. So it can be used on an ad hoc basis. This infrastructure can be maintained by the university itself or in collaboration with other institutions. We've got a policy on this too. Some universities do it themselves. And they know it's not easy. So you gotta have some IT staff taking care of software and you need to have funds for that. So far, nobody was against this option. So we're gonna try and do this in our university. So all of the grants will partly cover the cost of maintenance of the open science infrastructure in-house. There is a section on raising awareness and uh, competency in open science. And that's also quite an important thing. Our experience suggests that there is still lack of awareness about open access and communication. There is lack of skills in open science among researchers in universities. So we've got an entire section on that and we're gonna think of the action plan in persons of this. There is a need to incentivize researchers to join this policy. And that's why the policy carries particular incentives. So open science products will be considered while making contracts, promoting people to positions, and also it will be considered while assessing your achievements in the university, performance of particular units or individual staff members. So that's basically what our policy is about. So in November, I hope all of this will be approved by the Scientific Council 
then we're going to improve the key elements of that. We're going to try and make sure that open science covers all existing procedures in the university. There are certain regulations related to learning and education, science and technical things. But we need to re we need to review that and uh, wherever necessary. We need to see where open science can be implemented. So this is what we are yet to do. And also we can think of introducing new elements of open science, something that is still missing with us. Hopefully, we're going to be able to pull it off. I believe we can do it. Our universities are just as good as their likes abroad. So we just got to keep on it. There has been a question, which criteria of assessment do you use in order to see what scientific influence comes from a particular professor or teacher? I don't actually understand the question, I should say. I don't understand what are these. Oh, you mean science metric indices, Gersh index? Well, yes, we account for that certainly. And we rate teachers, departments. Yeah, we consider that stuff. I'm not teaching on the regular basis, so. I cannot give you any better answer. I'm sorry. Thank you, Oksana, for this wide overview of your future plans. And just one more thing. As far as I know, KPI is the first Ukrainian university to have organized the open science policy. Yeah, I think they've done it quite a while ago. I'm speaking about the open science policy. Yes, exactly. All right, thank you once again. Hopefully you're gonna get it all done. We should expect support from international partners to keep you moving along these lines. With this, I'd like to turn over to Soren Auer the Director of Information Center of Science and Technology in Leibniz Center. He will speak about scientific communication based on open research knowledge graph. You're welcome. Yeah, thank you very much for the invitation. And I'm very sorry that I'm too late. I got uh, got confused with the time zones. Um, that's um, um, my fault. Uh, sorry for for that. Um, I hope you can can hear me and uh, see me now. And I will start sharing my presentation in a in a minute. Так. Все чудово. So, one second. Шановні учасники, якщо у вас є запитання, будь ласка, користуйтеся в панелі, там де написано відповіді та питання. So Mm 
sharing my screen. Mm -hmm. No. Okay, so I hope you can, can see my slides now. Yes, we could Great. see, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so yeah, let me let, let me start my presentation. And I still have 30 minutes or did something change a bit in the Yes, correctly. 30 minutes. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, so um I would like to talk a bit about the knowledge graph for, for science and in order to introduce um what a knowledge graph is maybe not every one of you has has heard about it i would like uh, to quickly introduce this link data principles which can be also used for implementing the fair principles uh, the fair principles i guess many of you are aware to make data findable. sorry sorry i didn't understand but maybe it was not for me. Accelerate right now. So the FAIR principles um, um, are about making data findable, accessible, interoperable, and, and reusable. And um, Tim Berners-Lee, the inventor of the web, which you can see here on this slide, he also um, coined these link data principles. So the idea is there to give um, your eyes uh, to, to use your eyes to um, identify things yeah many of you know DOIs but uh, we can uh, use this concept of your eyes more broader so that you can look them up on the web also um, that you use uh, the resource description framework RDF um, and and links to other things as we have links on web pages we can also link digital objects with each other and uh, data items and these are the link data principles and here's for example in a nutshell how it works so we can say that a certain organization organizes a conference so this is um, the rdf uh, data model consisting of these subject predicate object statements and that that the conference starts at a certain time and takes place um, in a certain place for example here um, this conference um, in Hammamit. So organizing knowledge and information in such triples allows us also to build something like knowledge graphs. And these knowledge graphs, they are on the one hand human readable. That's what we see here. I think every one of you can understand um, that what, what it means basically that an organization organizes a conference, the conference starts at a certain date, takes place in a certain location, but we can also write this down in a machine readable way Way, exactly writing down these triples consisting of subject predicate and object and that's what you see here on the button and then it becomes also machine readable and we can have humans and machines collaborating and there are examples like here is an example of a knowledge graph uh, describing a company like a logistics company DHL with a name the industry different labels and different languages the headquarter and the location. Um, and this has uh, been done quite um, uh, extensively on the linked open data web. Um, so we have, for example, uh, more than 10 years ago, I uh, realized DBpedia and on the right hand side, you see an excerpt of this knowledge graph, which we extracted from Wikipedia. Here you have information about Bob Dylan and Steve Jobs and uh, their birth dates and birthplaces and uh, the um, connection relationship between entities and on the left hand side you see the linked open data cloud and here not every of these bubbles is actually a triple but every of these bubbles is a data set and there are um, hundreds of these large scale data sets with billions of triples out there in many different domains so we have life science for example is the red um, space here a data space in the life sciences or the green one is ling linguistics data sets um, we have cross domain um, data sets publication scientific um, knowledge graphs as well, but primarily focusing on bibliographic metadata. And knowledge graphs in a way comprise um, different types of data, um, like instance data, but also structures like schema data, metadata, uh, taxonomies, but also links and mappings maybe to other databases. So it's a more uh, holistic uh, data representation formalism.
And there are many companies building knowledge graphs. So this is a slide here, which I stole from Frank van Hamerlin, a colleague from Amsterdam. And the slide is already three years old. Um, and there are the logos of companies who are building knowledge graphs to connect and integrate and link their data assets. And I think we now uh, should focus how can we leverage knowledge graphs more in research and for open science. And maybe I skip a few slides here because they are maybe not so interesting and um, come to, to the open research knowledge graph. Um, and um, now the question is, how can we apply this concept of um, knowledge graphs for scholarly communication for open science? Yeah, And uh, if we look a bit at different domains, uh, we can see that they completely changed in the digital world. Uh, yeah, So for example, on the left here, you see a mail order catalog, which was extremely popular um, in Germany. I'm personally grew up in East Germany be behind the Iron Wall. So, um, um, similarly as um, as uh, Ukraine, and we didn't have, um, uh, and, and many other countries in the Eastern Bloc, so we didn't have access to all these cool products, which you could see in these mail order catalogs. So these mail order catalogs, they were very, how to say, popular in East Germany, but no one could afford to buy it, but it was still extremely interesting to look at all these products. Nowadays, um, these mail order catalogs then don't exist anymore. Yeah, So now Nowadays, you order stuff on Amazon, eBay, um, or other e-commerce platforms. Similarly, uh, maps, street maps, um, that's what you see in the middle. Yeah, 20 years ago, if you wanted to go from A to B, you had to buy a map. And really, uh, with buying a map, I mean a printed map. Yeah, And after half a year, it was outdated. You had to buy a new map. Um, and it was really cumbersome to navigate from A to B. No one would do this anymore. We use navigation systems and digital maps for that. And other examples include phone books, encyclopedias, um, and so on and so forth. So these um, analog services were replaced by digital services, um, but these were really digital born services, completely new business models. Um, there is more zooming into the data, more dynamics. Um, there is more focus on interlinking data and services, uh, searching, integration, crowdsourcing, data curation play an important role, um, and um, many other things. So now what about scholarly communication? Um, how, how does this compare with, with open science or research? If you look how, how things in research work, nothing has changed basically in the last um, uh, four centuries. Yeah, The only thing which changed is that we now distribute PDF documents um, via the, the web or the internet. Uh, but these are just pseudo digitized um, documents. Yeah, These are not truly digital um, um, knowledge assets or data assets, uh, but they are just um, pseudo digitized uh, versions of the analog artifacts. And if you compare this, this would be as if someone would send you a mail order, a scanned mail order catalog or a scanned street map, and you should um, buy uh, something uh, from from such a like scanned um, PDF or or navigate from A to B with the scan of a street map. So. This results in a, in a number of big problems. We don't really use uh, the, the opportunities of digital uh, digitization for science. Uh, we have a reproducibility crisis. The majority of the experiments in science are hard or not reproducible. We have a proliferation of publications. Uh, the publication output doubled within the last decade and continues to rise. So we are really drowning in floods of publications. And there's also a deficiency of peer review. The quality of peer reviewing is deteriorating. And we have also phenomenons like predatory publishing. Um, and I think we are just trying currently to cure the symptoms um, of these problems. And not really the root cause. And the root cause is that we have a lack of transparency. A lot of information is hidden in the text. We have a lack of integratability. We can hardly integrate different bits and pieces together. Um, also machine assistance, identifiability, collaboration uh, are all issues. And um, you can observe that if you search something on Google Scholar. So this screenshot actually is already also three years old. 
um, and um, you will find uh, hundred thousands of, of papers and uh, then you are drowning in the flood of publications if you look for specific answers. And I think in open science and we should address these issues and not just by, by pseudo digitizing maybe this analog versions, but really fixing that and, and then trying to provide a, a genuine solution for these problems. And we try to build a knowledge graph, um, which links the concepts which we have inside the publications, like research problems, definitions, research approaches, methods, or different artifacts, not only publications, but also data, software, audio, and then the concepts um, in these different uh, domains, which are different by domain and mathematics, we have definitions, theorems, proofs, and physics experiments, data models, and chemistry, substances, structures, reactions, and so on and so forth. And giving these kind of concepts and, and digital identity, and then linking them with each other and building such a knowledge graph of research contributions in different fields of sciences. And um, yeah, so maybe I, sh I go instead, I, I show you live how this how this works and um, I will maybe switch to my browser. So I, if you give me a second, I should be able to find the browser window. So I hope you can see my web browser now. Yes. Mm -hmm. Great. I can see. Mm -hmm. And then we can go to orkg.org, like open research knowledge graph, and I will increase the zoom level a bit so you see it even better. Um, so, and this is this a knowledge graph and the interface to the knowledge graph which we are building here. And um, you can see on top different fields of science uh, where you can go into, for example, you can go into life sciences. And once you went into life sciences, you can see the content, um, the subfields there, and then also the content, um, which is um, um, yeah, available for this um, for this field of science. We are still in the relatively in the beginning, so we don't have millions of of um, content items in here, but um, relatively uh, few still. But I want to show you here maybe an example, um, which is now not affecting us that much anymore, but was really pressing two years ago. And that's, um, for example, the COVID-19 reproductive number estimate. So how many people get infected um, with COVID-19 when you have one infected person? And determining this number was really a big challenge in the beginning. And there were lots of papers. So we actually found 31 papers in the very beginning of the pandemic. Each of these papers has like dozens of um, maybe 10, 15, 20 pages. So if you have 30 publications and each one 10, 15, 20 pages, you have to read 500 pages of, uh, of literature if you want to answer the question, what's the reproductive number estimate for COVID-19? And um, we added this information to the knowledge graph. And um, since the question, this research question, what is the reproductive number estimate is very specific. We need a specific description of this research contributions. And you see them here in the columns. Um, for example, the first study was done in, in Lombardy in Italy, and we have the location. We have the time interval when the study was performed. We have the basic reproductive number estimate specification. We have the confidence interval, and then maybe also methods and the approaches below. Um, and this is the important information for describing research contribution addressing this particular research question. And um, once they are added here to this um, to the knowledge graph, we can then actually create also visualization. So first we can can look at it here in the table and we have quickly basically an overview of what um, the authors uh, describe as basic reproductive number. But since it's in a machine readable way, we can actually also create these kind of visualizations. And here's a visualization which is generated, which shows us 
um, a combo chart indicating the confidence interval. And we can see that the values are typically between three, 3.5 um, around, and there are some outliers um, uh, above and below, uh, but around 3.5. And that's exactly the answer to this research question. What's the COVID-19 reproductive number estimate? Yeah, and now you can see this at the fingertip, so you don't have to read 500 pages of paper, but with a few clicks, you can answer um, this particular research question. And maybe I also show you another example, um, or yeah, how uh, like uh, let's let's maybe go back um, and. Um, there is an example in the area of engineering, which I can show you uh, to show you that it's really possible to use this approach in different, um, really different fields of research. So here, for example, we have a study on energy supply, which is really a hot topic right now um, all over uh, the world and especially in Europe. Um, um, due to the dramatic um, war, uh, which was started by Russia against Ukraine, right? And um, we now, and we want to get um, carbon neutral also till 2050. And there are different studies addressing this problem of um, um, modeling how the energy transition to low carbon energy systems can be achieved. Um, and there are how many studies? Uh, 25 of these studies here. Um, um, published by different research institutes or research groups. And we added them also to the knowledge graph. And of course, here we have completely different properties. Yeah, For example, we have the energy sources, which are addressed by the study. And we see here bioenergy, geothermics, hydropower, and so on and so forth. Yeah, And then we see different scenarios. And these scenarios, they calculate, uh, for example, a CO2 reduction of 100% until 2050. Another one here only assumes a 95% reduction to 2050. Um, and so on and so forth. So we can describe basically the gist from these kind of studies um, also in this knowledge graph and um, in a similar way can get then uh, visualizations which visualize, for example, the installed capacity of energy storage, which is required according to the different, um, different studies here. And we get a quick overview of um, how it compares. So some studies um, see that a relatively low amount of storage is required. Others um, think there is a higher amount required, but the average is probably something around 400 gigawatts. So if you are a politician, you can then make better and more well-informed decisions uh, based on such an overview of, of the research. And you are not also a bit less biased because you're not maybe uh, basing your decision on the advice of just one or two or three experts, but on a really comprehensive overview of these different studies. Let's maybe look at one particular study. So we can also click on the study here. Um, and we then see here the contribution um, description, which is uh, currently still loading. We have the bibliographic metadata on top. So this was published in 2020 in the field of energy systems by authors, which are here um, Agora Energiewende and Stiftung Klimaneutralität. And then we have basically this description of the energy sources here and the scenarios. And uh, as you can see, these are links. So we actually can click on these links and then we get um, get more information or also the scenario here is described 100% CO2 reduction till 2050. And if we click on it, it basically loads um, then the description of this particular linked resource, which is the scenario description. But let's go go back and um, let's assume or one question could be how how is the data added to the system and of course we work with um, artificial intelligence but the bad news is it doesn't work fully automatically, but we also need manual curation so once you are logged in, you can actually click here on the edit button. And then you have the opportunity to edit uh, these different values or to also add new values um, or even to add completely new properties. So you can add a property and I can start typing. And while I'm typing, it searches basically in the background uh, for other um, 
uh, for existing uh, properties which are already defined. Uh, so I wanted to has location, for example, um, and then we have different properties. Some are defined by Wikidata. So we not only search in the local knowledge graph, but also in basically a network of knowledge graphs like uh, Wikidata, for example. And that really shows also the open science aspect here that we can link different knowledge graphs. I can select one. And then I can add a value, and I don't know. Uh, and the same works also with the um, with the object of the triples. For example, I can link here to Hanover, but we also have um, we have um, like links from GeoNames, which is another knowledge graph about spatial entities. And here just seems Hanno Mikolaevka. That's probably a location in uh, maybe in um, in Ukraine even. Yeah. So and then I can add um, this link basically to the um, to the knowledge graph, and I can easily add completely new um, triples there and and completely new representations. So I'm not bound to a fixed ontology, but I have the opportunity to create completely new properties and and links there, and um, and then you can actually click on the link and then it um, shows you um, this particular property. So uh, we can even click here then on the GeoNames link, and we come directly um, to the map there. So this is in Dnepropetrovsk Oblast in Ukraine. So the, of course, um, that uh, here in that uh, case doesn't make sense. That's why I'm, I'm deleting this again um, uh, here. And you can see also on the right hand side um, that um, the provenance and the timeline is shown. So we can see who um, added this kind of description and who participated, who are the contributors, and uh, what is the timeline there, who has edited what at what time. So um, we can also um, view this as a graph. So we can uh, look at the graph as well. If we go to the graph view, um, and then um, it basically shows us the graph really in a, in a graph view that loads um, a, a second. Um, and there are different layouts which are possible. And the graph view then compri um, comprises the metadata, which you see on the left-hand side, and on the right-hand side, and the contribution. And if you click on this um, 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 uh, we can expand basically the contribution or can expand uh, the graph and we can now see um, the additional uh, resources and the links. And as you can see, it's always the subject uh, predicate object links, um, which are used as a base um, entity. Yeah, so here you have then on the right hand side, um, the uh, different energy sources which are tackled by the contribution, the research problem, and so on and so forth. So I'm closing this now because it's also a bit um, resource consuming and uh, doesn't work that well via Zoom call. Um, I wanted to also show you that these comparisons which we uh, which are created and they can be also published uh, by itself so um, if we have such a comparison if someone created such a comparison uh, for his research problem his research field um, he can also publish this so if you go here to this um, actions button on the right hand side you will actually see the possibility to export it in different formats as um, CSV, um, RDF, um, Jupyter Notebook. You can then also directly work with the data. You can share it as a link, but you also have the possibility to publish this. And then it generates uh, basically also a DOI um, and um, it becomes a citable um, open science artifact, which can be cited by, by other people. 
and we organize these in also in observatories. So on the one hand, we have this research field. So here you see, for example, this is part of engineering. We have the spread grants on top of the page, engineering, mechanical engineering, energy systems. Um, but we also have a particular, we call this observatory on energy system analysis. And when I click there, I see um, an overview page basically, which shows us different research problems. Here it's just one, we have organizations where which are involved in maintaining this observatory. And we have members like people who are there. And then we can see the content, uh, basically these kind of comparisons, papers, visualizations, which are part of this observatory. Sorry, uh, I'm, uh, but it seems we are slightly uh, behind to schedule. Yeah, so I think I'm, I'm almost done. So, um, that's um, basically all I wanted to briefly present you here. Currently, we have uh, 12,000, more than 12,000 um, descriptions in a thousand comparisons. Uh, that's, of course, still the very beginning. So we need to add much more. But in general, I think the Open Research Knowledge Graph can be a nice uh, also open science infrastructure for representing research findings. And I would like to, to invite you to participate and maybe to collaborate with us. We also run a curation grant scheme. Uh, so um, if you go to um, the help uh, center here, for example, about the curation grants. So we sponsor um, people who are helping us to curate uh, the open research knowledge graph. And of course, we also would, um, are working in joint projects um, and apply for project funding. So um, thank you very much for, for your attention. And maybe there's time also for one or two questions. Thank you. This is a tremendous effort, a tremendous project, and hopefully there will be something like this done in Ukraine in terms of using the knowledge graphs. So hopefully there will be more to this. Thank you so much for joining this conference today. So moving on to the next presenter. That's one of the sponsors of the conference, Iran Bassal, manager on business development in for science. She'll speak about funding open science based on crowdfunding techniques, new outlooks and challenges in the times of uncertainty. Hello, everyone, and uh, thank you for this occasion. And thank you for having us. I'd like to thank in particular um, Sabina Gonas and Natalia Kaluzna to organize all of this um, awesome event, an interesting event because, um, you know, uh, we personally uh, for science uh, think that open science uh, is all about removing barriers. So that's uh, what we are trying to do and where we are trying to support uh, each time. I'll try, okay. Today, I'd like to um, speak about funding open science uh, uh, with new crowdfunding methodologies, uh, uh, with new tools uh, and new perspectives uh, and challenges uh, in an uncertain era. Uh, me, I'm Irene Buzo, and I'm business development manager at Four Science. So um, a little bit of an agenda about us um, for science, uh, which are our values, uh, our mission, our vision, our main aim in the context of the open science uh, and openness in general, the premises and the context uh, we will speak about, uh, some example of successful crowdfunding projects uh, and uh, um, a little deepening in the facts that it's all about the community. And uh, finally, some do and don'ts, uh, some hints um, for crowdfunding adoption. As I was saying, we, um, for science, uh, as Susanna, our CEO, said this morning, uh, we love to enable implementation of the transnationally important policies 
of open research and digital preservation. Um, we are certified partner of this space and major contributor to this space. And we call that the space seven development. Um, since we think that participation uh, is key for real improvement, uh, um, all of our solutions uh, support compliance uh, with key international standards. Uh, we are part of open air, we cooperate with open air, um, we are ORCID provider, and we contribute to the SERIF community and IIIF community. All of our solutions uh, natively support the key defining transnational policies, so open research and open digital cultural heritage and uh, the dissemination of openness, which often requires the proper tools. So uh, we believe in open source software, open standards, interoperability, first of all, and most important, uh, fairness, preservation, collaboration, and innovation. Uh, in, indeed, we, we, we built uh, the, the first free open source extension of DSpace for the research data and information management ever created in co cooperating with the University of Hong Kong. DSpace Chris is the fruit of many, many years uh, of open source development with uh, more than 100,000 commits. Uh, you know, differently from other Chris or Rims, uh, uh, this space, Chris, has the institutional repository at its core. So the, the final aim of this space, Chris, is providing high visibility uh, for all the scholarly communication assets and for the entire research ecosystem, and all in a single solution. Indeed, we at For Science, uh, we are the creator, and we maintain also another extension, which is this space, Glenn. Uh, the goal of GLEM, uh, which is an acronym for, for galleries, libraries, archives, and museums, is to provide a fully interoperable environment for integrating the traditional hermeneutic and interpretative work. Of all the historical sciences, um, how? With data visualization and analysis. So uh, we, we know that the basis, the common basis, is that there may be a fundamental change in the way digital cultural heritage is experienced and analyzed. So not without its context. So digital cultural resources have to be analyzed together with all the contextual information needed to answer research questions, important research questions. Our final aim, our, our main aim, and we can summarize it um, as generating unity, that's why we believe in uh, a tool which is community driven uh, and free from vendor locking policies uh, to and for the future. Um, what we will explore today um, is crowdfunding. Uh, um, you know, the policy of, of crowdfunding, uh, in the, especially in the world of cultural heritage, uh, can, see, um, can be seen as raising the awareness of the entire community of citizens. So this is removing barriers towards caring for their common heritage. Crowdfunding can be used for the creation, the expansion or implementation of innovative digital management and preservation policies. Our experience at For Science is mainly directed towards the letter, but it is necessary to have a clear overview of the profiles and the characteristics in general which have seen European crowdfunding experiences uh, prove to be very successful in order to then assess the appropriateness and the feasibility of the same. Uh, something about the context. Um, uh, we can assume, suppose that a library or a museum wish to adopt a tool for the digital management and or preservation of their tangible and not tangible heritage but it has been defunded by the government for external factors. So in this case, the possibilities for the library or the museum are one, to postpone their finances, or to search pledge on the European funding, 
or even to activate a public crowdfunding. Um, we will not explore the equity uh, crowdfunding. Uh, crowdfunding comes uh, with many shades. Uh, we will explore public crowdfunding only with or without reward. So the, the, the premises of exploring crowdfunding alternative is that maybe there is some concern about the legitimacy of using this form of finances. Um, the, the recent war has sadly brought to light some limitation of funding for libraries and for museums uh, and for the protection and the preservation of the cultural heritage. One main goal can be to digitize all the material so it can be preserved and protected. Uh, the implementation of refined solutions uh, uh, for the protection of heritage are variable, but sometimes they are insufficient or extremely restricted. So crowdfunding can be um, seen as a complementary method of financing, which uh, deserve to be explored. We will explore two uh, successful cases, use cases of public crowdfunding. Uh, um, so as, as a, an example of relevant success story, one is uh, a French success story, Toumessonet, um, which was um, pledged for the Louvre, uh, which organized a crowdfunding campaign in order to fund the purchase of a Renaissance painting. And the other will be the Mezzanati. So uh, the pledge of the Finnish Museum of Games, uh, which organized a crowdfunding campaign to enable the museum to become a real tangible experience. An overview of the French case, to engage citizens in the process of purchase, the save the art model, um, raising the awareness of citizens of an important masterpiece. This project started in 2010 and it was a not rewarded model. So you, as a citizen, can simply donate. Uh, it was mainly direct uh, to citizenry online and not with a, a great street ads campaign. And uh, there was a preview event for larger donors uh, and they choose to exhibit a list with the names of all donors during the inauguration of the painting. Some KPIs and we have to keep in mind, uh, by, by the end of June 2017, over 100,000 people had already, already visited the museum. Uh, they raised more than 1 million over three months for more than uh, 6,000 donors. And this was a way to stay connected to donors uh, and persuade them to become regular donors too for the long term of maintaining the museum. Um, all of this got attention of the media and it was after replicated for other art masterpieces. An overview of the Finland case, uh, which was born to support the opening of the museum and was launched in 2015. Uh, they gave tickets, badges, uh, uh, so it's a rewarded, a partially rewarded model and they laid it with the Kickstarter platform. It was directed to online audience to all European citizens. The Finnish case also had large presence on social medias and they raised more than 80,000 over six euros over six months. Uh, by the end of June uh, 2017, over 100,000 people already visited the museum. So it is true that it's all about the community. A crowdfunding model is only partially about raising money. It's much more about mobilizing a community all around the project. And if you do it right, people, the citizenry, will feel a sense of ownership and involvement and will support you going forward as a museum and library. So it's all about brand engagement and the community too. Maybe crowdfunding should be viewed as a supplementary rather than alternative method of finances in order to avoid high uncertainty of the funding success of the initiative. And finally, is to bring ultimately prestige 
is all about prestige. The awareness is prestige itself to the library museum's cultural heritage. So it's a form of promotion. Some tips, uh, some do's and don'ts, pros and cons uh, of crowdfunding model. The community must already ex exist. Uh, for example, the members of the library who have given the GDPR consent or Zoom of games, uh, the gamers community. Um, you cannot create a, an, an hoc community for the project, maybe. Then there must be a specific project uh, with a precise beginning and a precise end and a precise timeline to be financed. So no continuous or generic funding. The management of the library or the museum must support this type of recourse to complementary forms of finances rather than, for example, European funding. Uh, we experienced a case in which management was not completely on board on a subject uh, um, or maybe can be skeptical. The result of the crowdfunding campaign must be tangible and on, of interest to the whole community. And uh, the library, the museum, uh, should highlight the extraordinary nature of the use of these methodologies. So specific times conditions, uh, as the recent war, or specificity of the collections that require it. One does not simply start a crowdfunding campaign. Um, some tips, ad additional tips. Funding shall be hybrid. So it's a complementary uh, form of finances for the project in question. It is not exclusive, cannot be seen as an exclusive uh, uh, kind of financing form. Who can help you? You can rely on a well-known platform and uh, an expert, uh, for the example of digitization and management of digitized material, who has already done it and knows what are the steps to do. Don't be over ambitious. The monetary uh, ultimate target of fundings uh, must be achievable. Timeline must be precise and determined. Social and media presence is crucial. We, we know that it is an expensive job also organizing a crowdfunding campaign in terms of time, both for the management of the community and uh, both uh, for the management. So you have to keep constantly engage uh, the citizenry, the audience, uh, you have to produce audio video materials and ultimately last but not least do not create your own side often legal and financial management of a crowdfunding campaign can be burdensome you have also to choose the right platform uh, platform uh, website to organize the crowdfunding campaign why go in open source in a crowdfunding model uh, you know, open source is strictly tied and related to open science. We believe that open source and open science are the way of the future. Indeed, we have realized that the crowdfunding mechanism requires precise guarantees to be given to the funding citizens for awareness and engagement. We believe that the whole world of private funders would be more involved if they knew that cultural heritage is well protected. On the, on the state of the art digital platform and free from vendor locking policies. The searchability and dissemination of heritage will be unparalleled and will contribute to the engagement and success of the initiative. Everyone can participate in open science and that's the beauty of open science because also cultural heritage, not only national, but European, for example, belongs to everyone and also belongs to everyone as a social duty for protection. So I'm almost done. And I think it's a time if you, if you have in mind a determined use case to adopt an open source cultural heritage management platform, uh, but you are not sure of the regional financial support to do so, you can obviously contact us. Uh, we already propose to several customers uh, to recur, to rely on public crowdfunding model uh, through the best crowdfunding platforms, uh, offering them support from A to Z. And obviously, we'd love to help you uh, with the execution of a crowdfunding project, thanks to our experience.
I'd like to thank you another time for this opportunity to share something important. And I think I'm done. And I hope to see you in person too, as my colleague Onion already said today. Thank you so much, Irene. I have been happy to see you once again at this conference. Thank you all. <laughs> And I hope it's going to keep up like this, communication-wise. So with this, let's have one more presenter, Tiziana Ferrari, the director of the EG Foundation, support and infrastructure of open research, best practices and options. Hello and welcome. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Um, thanks for this invitation as well. It's a pleasure to be here and to support the open science uh, in Ukraine. I will share a few slides. So I'll uh, now uh, go into presentation mode. And uh, with this a contribution, I hope um, I can inspire, inspire you even further about the importance of open science by giving very concrete uh, examples on uh, how open science can help uh, advancement of knowledge, but also society at large. I will bring here my experience uh, of uh, scientific computing and in particular of EGI as a distributed large infrastructure for data intensive scientific computing, which is actively participated by Ukraine through the Ukrainian Grid Initiative. And um, first of all, I'd like to bring to your attention one aspect of open science, which is uh, open infrastructures. I'd like to give an example of what an open infrastructure means and uh, how international scientific collaborations can be enabled thanks to that. And um, this also reinforces, in my view, the importance of Ukraine to be connected and part, integral part of uh, research infrastructures uh, to be strongly connected and supported by other European countries. EGI in particular in our domain is a very large uh, federation of research data centers. And we started thanks to the inception of new experiments at CERN in order to bring a computing next to research data. More and more modern science relies on data and on the ability for scientists to share this data across borders and across scientific collaborations. And one of the effective ways to do this is to allow scientists to process the data where it is hosted and provided. EGI has developed by gluing, by connecting national infrastructures, which are funded by national funding agencies, and by making them available as an open platform, even beyond uh, Europe. We have very strong uh, partnerships with the United States, with Canada, but also Latin America, South Africa, and other African regions, and Asia Pacific with the purpose of making the best technical infrastructures for data access processing available to any scientist in the world. And the Ukrainian National Grid Initiative has been part of this with a very large number of institutes from Ukraine bringing their own local uh, technical infrastructures and connecting such infrastructures to the EGI Federation. This is thanks uh, to our national funding members, and this is also a plea for the Ukrainian research uh, uh, funding agencies to ensure that Ukraine, despite all the war times and the very difficult situations, can have a national infrastructure which is part of a broader European endeavors. It's very important that Ukraine stays connected. And uh, I want also to give thanks uh, uh, to Sergei Svistunov that is here attending the conference for having been able to pull over the past years a large number of institutes in Ukraine to be part of EGI. 
Ukraine has been uh, contributing 11 uh, high-throughput computing clusters and also two cloud uh, uh, data centers into the EGI Federation and has been always in the forefront of innovation in EGI. And I hope uh, the EGI community will be able to return uh, what Ukraine gave back to EGI by opening more and more its infrastructure to Ukrainian uh, scientists. Thanks to the participation of Ukraine, but also thanks to other countries that have been federating the data centers in EGI, Ukrainian uh, scientists have been able to publish more than 500 open access uh, publications. We have uh, eight different scientific domains that use advanced computing in Ukraine and the EGI Federation. And Ukraine is a very strong contributor through its scientific communities in the domains of uh, physics, astronomy, and astrophysics. In EGI, we have been uh, uh, using these open infrastructures to support an increasing number of scientists. We have uh, today 82,000 users across the entire planet. We support uh, with more than 7 billion CPU hours of processing every year, many different scientific communities of which 14 are on the S3 roadmap in Europe. And Ukraine has been an active member of the EGI Federated Cloud, which is one of the most popular computing platforms, especially for environmental science. In times of war, as Sergei explained to us, the technical infrastructure for computing in Ukraine has been uh, either uh, destroyed or has been uh, unavailable to scientists in Ukraine in order to do their own uh, science. So despite of all these difficulties, uh, the EGI community is discussing a specific support measure for Ukraine in order to allow the scientists that lost their access to the local IT infrastructures to use the computing time and storage facilities which are available in other countries in the EGI Federation. This is, I think, another uh, angle of open science that is important and, and particularly actual in uh, these times for Ukraine. It means that open science doesn't just advance knowledge, but also helps science to flourish during the big times of challenge. And this is perhaps an aspect of open science that shouldn't be uh, neglected when we promote it uh, globally. I want to bring another example of how open science helps tackling large planetary challenges uh, for our society. And I'm moving from infrastructure to another element of open science, which is research software. Of course, um, the entire open access movement has started from publications, but more and more modern science is also enabled by data and software as a digital object that has to be shared together with publications and data. And I like to bring to your attention a success story, which is the one led by the University of Utrecht in the Netherlands. Uh, a very large scientific group is developing simulation tools for um, molecular docking simulations that apply to COVID-19 treatment. During the first emergency years of COVID, this community made their simulation tools available to the entire planetary user community. And today, they serve more than 32,000 scientists across 136 countries. How do they work and how do they make this possible? It's just one scientific group in one university. They develop their scientific software and they make it available open for everyone to do simulations because they can use the DJI Federated infrastructure to tap into computing time and storage, which comes from the majority of all countries in Europe and the United States. Back in 2020, at the start of the pandemic, we came into an agreement with Brazil and the United States to increase the capacity together with Europe to this community. And since then, the community doubled just in two years and a half, and also the computing time available, which was made available for free. So as a complete free offer from a national funding to enable international collaborations. And this is another example of open science through open software, which is helping tackling societal challenges which matter 
to each of us and everyone in the globe. How is this possible? In our specific domain of scientific computing, we do open science by gluing together different data centers that belong to different institutes and countries. And by having uh, software middleware, which enables a federated access to computing facilities, to uh, support authentication and authorization and federated data. And on top of this uh, very large platform, we then integrate thematic services for data analytics, which are the services which support the specific scientific challenges and are tailored to specific user communities. And it's through the opening of this software at this top level of the software stack that we can enable open science through open software. I like to move to the last part of my presentation, which is the challenge and the power of open data. And I want to give a, a testimony of how important open data has already been for European excellence in science and also open up uh, the challenge of open data for the coming 10 years. I want to bring the experience of the physics community that is probably one of the most advanced in sharing data across continent and scientific collaborations and bring your um, attention, bring to your attention the experience of the um, radio astronomy and astrophysics community. Back in 2017, the LIGO and Virgo collaborations in the United States and Europe have jointly achieved uh, the Nobel Prize in Physics, thanks to the sharing of data to detect uh, observation of gravitational waves 100 years after the publication of the Einstein theory of relativity. 100 years, exactly 100 years from the publication of the theory for the first time, the evidence of gravitational waves was detected. And this was possible because the two competing scientific collaborations, LIGO and the Virgo, decided from the inception to share the data and to use the data generated by observatories in Europe and the United States to validate the scientific results and observations through different uh, uh, modeling uh, uh, mechanisms, and with that to gain accuracy on discoveries. And thanks to this joint effort and the ability of open their data, they have jointly achieved a very important uh, Nobel Prize. But uh, open data is, uh, of course, uh, a very challenging topic, especially for secondary use of data when scientific communities needed to access and make use of data generated by other scientists. And this is in Europe, the challenge of the European Open Science Cloud, which is a vision, but also a major endeavor of Europe to connect uh, physical facilities, data, scientific software to make it available for third party exploitation. And in this uh, uh, big journey, Ukraine is part of it with the EGI Federation to develop the European Open Science Compute Platform, which is based on our federated data infrastructure. And I hope the Ukrainian data centers will be soon back to be also part of this federation, which brings together facility data and scientific software for the scientists. So I want to conclude my quick journey through open science and scientific computing, uh, making a statement which is, of course, supported by everyone. Uh, science is open by construction, and we should make sure that every scientist in Europe has the best access to instruments, but also to infrastructures, data, and scientific software. Because the science has no borders, our mission of the EGI, but also the Ukrainian grid infrastructure, as soon as it will be back into operations, is to make this collaboration possible. And I hope really uh, with, the, with the deep of my heart that Ukraine, uh, we will be back and uh, back as a leading leader in open science in scientific computing very soon. And with this uh, last uh, statement, I thank you for your attention. Thank you so much for speaking about the research infrastructure in this country. And I think Sergey will continue speaking about this and he will tell us about the success we have had in this regard in Ukraine.
So we're going to have Sergey speaking right now. He's in charge of Science and Technical Information Unit of Bogolubov University in the National Academy of Science. He will speak about open access to research infrastructure in the National Academy of Science of Ukraine. Thank you for the opportunity to speak here. You can see the subject of my presentation. These are the key results of the National Academy of Science in creating the joint information space for scientific research as a prototype of the National Open Science, Open Science Cloud. I'd like to say that all of the results and everything you can see in this slide are Therefore, December of 2021, the war has caused significant destruction of this infrastructure and uh, experts are trying to do everything they can to keep some of this infrastructure working. And they also try and support scientific research. A few words about the Institute. Institute, Institute of Theoretic Physics is involved in building Ukraine infrastructure since 2006. It was the key implementing agency of the government program on using great technologies in 2009-2013. Under this program, they organized a national grid infrastructure, the Ukrainian National Grid. The Institute began working with the European Grid Infrastructure and EGI project in 2012. The National Grid Infrastructure has been integrated with the European Grid Infrastructure. It is in line with all of the EGI requirements. Since 2020, the Institute has been an associate member of EGI representing Ukraine there. Since 2020, the Institute represents Ukraine in the EOSC Association, and it's on the list of countries which have received the mandate. And recently, EOSC has made a lot of progress. Now we can see a coordinated, powerful infrastructure support and research. EOSC has helped the association coordinate this work. Certain documents have been developed to integrate this infrastructure. Financial support has been gained from Horizon Europe. There are research infrastructures, data repositories, and open publications. Many projects have been completed to build the basis of the EOSC. The competence centers have been created. They jointly develop services for research infrastructure. Ukraine keeps moving on towards building open science cloud, maybe not so consistently. Each country depends on its financial and logistical capacities, and they think of their own way of doing it. In Ukraine, there are regulations on open science cloud. There is an integration roadmap and the concept of the government program. There is a national program on information science and a national plan for open science. 
the National Academy of Science has got all it takes to shape up the basis of national open science cloud, which should be integrated with the EU. There is high-speed academic network for a data exchange, which is coupled to all of the institutions of the National Academy of Science, and it has access to the European network. A grid and cloud infrastructure is made up of clusters of Ukraine's academy, and it is integrated with the European EGI, which is the basis of ESCO. There is a list of resource centers integrated with the European infrastructure, EGI. Centers for collective use of equipment. There are 80 of those in the Ukrainian Academy. The Academy units take part in international research infrastructure. One example of this is this. You can see the screenshot of monitoring the cooperation of Google ACGI, that CMS experiment, which shows the readiness of the subcluster of the National Science Center to process data in QCMS 20. It is more than 99%, which is the best among 12 CMS centers. This is quite an achievement considering financial shortage. But to two or keep cluster is not working right now. There are electronic editions of the Academy and electronic library of those. The largest library is found in Vernatsky Library. The National Academy releases 343 printed and non-electronic periodicals. There is a portal of access to cloud infrastructure in the Academy, which is based on EOSC requirements. There are pilot projects to build data repositories it's the first step towards open data. All of the above is the basis for building open science cloud. Still, there is lack of coordination of work to promote open science in this country. This coordination is missing inside the Academy of Science and when it comes to working with the Ministry of Education. There are projects done in open science, but they are very fragmented and sometimes they're not in line with each other. We need to organize the agency to coordinate these efforts to promote open science in the country. It doesn't matter if it's going to be envisioned in the law or not, it may be an NGO, but there should be a working group of a kind taking care of this endeavor and this group should involve experts from various institutions one more problem is legislative support for the open access access to research infrastructure and scientific data you may say that this is work in progress and uh, everybody knows about this problem in the national plan for open science legislative support has been seen in all of these items but it's 2022 now and still this problem has not been resolved the national academy of science has partly addressed the open access problem to grid and cloud infrastructure but it's only done for the staff of the academy of science open access to these institutions should be granted to universities and their staff but for that they have to make a special agreement and they need to cover the operation costs. In the national program for informatization, there's a particular objective, but we cannot do anything about it. It's about developing data processing tools of the Ukrainian national grid. Education sector and science sector people should have access to this center. 
to preserve research data. The third problem area is weak support of the users in the National Academy. There is a dwindling number of active users. EOSC multi-annual roadmap says that universities and scientific institutions are important when it comes to promoting open science in Ukraine. Now, recently, the Academy has seen a dwindling number of users of grid and cloud infrastructure. It happens because of obsolete equipment, old servers, experts are leaving us, people choose to work distantly. In order to increase the number of users and popularize open science, you can undertake simple steps. You can spread word about these services. You can popularize the use of services and resources of EOSC by conducting conferences and webinars and training sessions. Users should be able to use active EOSC resources and those of EGI. The previous presentation allows us to see that there should be access to free service and everybody should be able to use that. We need to encourage the use of open science infrastructure in particular for research institutions involved in this. What should be done further? Critical infrastructure is getting hit. Funding is scarce. That's what you see in the scientific sector of the country right now. In this roadmap, we can see the main efforts that should be undertaken to build open science cloud. The idea is to achieve three particular goals, training, standards, and infrastructure. In the wartime, there is a need to focus efforts on addressing the first two, training the users and developing standards needed to promote open science. This does not require a great deal of finance. It takes willingness and coordinated efforts of all stakeholders. The Cabinet of Ministers has approved a national plan on open science. And that is a regulation and we should work accordingly. On the 20th of October, the Academy, run by academic Zagorodny, convened at a working meeting taking stock of the existing provisions in the National Plan on Open Science. They discussed organizing work, coordinating efforts in persons of the plan. I hope that pretty soon the decisions of this will be seen in particular ordinances of the Presidium of the National Academy of Science to get all of this done. Thank you. Thank you so much for this talk. It's quite a topical thing to Ukraine and um, we should not put it on the back burner. We need to have funding for this. As far as we can see, there have been colleagues speaking about the creation grid system, and they used all of these grid systems to keep the system working correctly, to amass and accumulate all of this data. So thank you. Let's move on to the next presenter, Elena Schmier. She's in charge of the Science and Technical Basis Unit, representing Science and Technical Assessment Center. National Repository of Academic Texts in the System of Open Science, Current Status and Future Outlooks. Hello. Hello, everybody. So we have so many great presenters taking part in this conference right now. And um, so we are a part of an interesting development here.
some of the things that seem to be well known and understandable are presented in a different way. So after this two days long marathon, I was thinking of going back to the records that are gonna be shared through the YouTube channel in order to listen back into the key presentations. I'd like to present to you a project on supporting open science. It is the national repository of academic texts. There's an ongoing World Open Access Week, and this conference is a part of that. It covers a lot of countries geographically, and it is devoted to the subject of climate justice. The idea is to raise awareness about the openness and how important is that to promote climatic action. It encourages everybody to cooperate there should be a cooperation between the climate movement and international openness community. Exchange of knowledge is one of the human rights. Overcoming climatic issues requires rapid exchange of knowledge to overcome geographic disciplinary borders and others. There is a link between open access and open science. Last November, At the 41st session of the General Conference of UNESCO, they adopted recommendations on open science. It is a framework concept which allows to make scientific knowledge open, accessible, and they can be reused. Scientific cooperation and exchange of information should be done to the benefit of science and society it is possible to create, assess, and disseminate scientific knowledge to cover those who are not covered by the conventional scientific community. Open science covers all disciplines and aspects of scientific practice, including applied natural science, humanitarian science, all of this. It is based on access to scientific knowledge, infrastructure, open, scientific communication and dialogue. One of the key elements of open science is the open infrastructure, resources based on knowledge, scientific archives, platforms, and repositories. Estimates suggest that in the world you get a few thousand up to tens of thousands of various online services of scientific information. In the world rankings, Ukraine is sitting pretty in the middle of the list among open institutional repositories. In 2016, Ukraine has decided to set up a national repository of academic texts. In 2017, the government approved a provision on that. In 2018, the regulations for this have been passed. The national repository is the national distributed database which keeps academic texts. The purpose is to make it as accessible as possible to society. It's about the scientific information of Ukraine and the world, which will aid in developing science, technology, education, and innovative activities, because it grants better access to academic texts. And it also improves academic integrity. So you get open access to information, the register of academic texts, and electronic versions of those and other relevant data found there. It happens through the official web portal, which is done in two languages in Ukrainian and English. Academic texts are author-created texts of academic or 
educational nature. There are thesis, qualification work done by learners, articles, published pieces, textbooks, training aids and the like. In the first stage, they set up the national repository. It receives academic texts from the state registration, as well as research institutions. Also get some thesis there. It's been in Ukraine since 1992. This week in the repository, you get 155,000 complete academic texts, including 123,000 reports and 132,000 theses. This database keeps getting more of this. So it receives archive records and uh, recently published materials. The repository is key to the open science in the country. This terminology has become well known nowadays. And you can see how this terminology evolved. So open data and open access have been envisioned in the Ukrainian legislation, which is related to the operation of the national depository repository. It contributes to further openness in particular in scientific field. Speaking of the climate agenda and open access, the SDGs are supposed to put an end to poverty and to preserve the planet for future generations. In 2015, it all has been launched. 17 goals have been integrated with the social life and the academic life of the planet. They sponsor scientific research across different rankings. Universities are ready in terms of their performance in implementing SDGs. They determine science and technology priorities in this regard. In the national repository, you can see the records that are in line with the SDGs and that describe the research results addressing sustainable green economy. In various areas of knowledge, they cover the entire spectrum. In the portal, there is a section which allows the users to see the national priorities and programs in this field. We need to keep the repository replenished with all of the texts and uh, there's a need to use analytical tools. There's a need to give users updates on the value of research products. There's a need for a comprehensive analysis of the scientific landscape of Ukraine. We need to seek information integration with domestic and foreign systems. In the action plan in persons of the Open Government Partnership for 2021-2022, there is a particular line of business which is to pursue the national open science policy. In October of this year, they passed a national action plan. Many participants have mentioned that. It addresses the key things that should be done. You can see the list of those right here. We can see that one of the items is about the national repository. We are an associated member of Open Air. This decision was made last March. Hopefully, this will open up new horizons for us, allowing us to master the best European practices in setting up scientific infrastructure. And I think we're going to get 
support in terms of experts and methodologies. You're welcome to support and spread word about the idea of open access and open science. And you're welcome to join this cooperation. I'll be happy to address your questions. I guess there is no time for questions right now, so you're welcome to write me in the chat or in the Q&A section. So I'll try and promptly respond to these questions. Otherwise, you can reach me through the email. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for telling us about the national repository and uh, yeah, questions should possibly be placed in the chat or in the Q&A. So with this, I will speak. About the national system URIS. So the National Research Information System is in the making. It is called URIS. It is run by our library. We've got programmers and staff working on this. I'd like to quote from Dr. Stefan Hornbostel, a German scientist. He says, we keep witnessing the growing number of scientific publications and decentralized collections for preserving data. Thanks to the internet, it is easier to have access to those. Various information, new formats, and standards of data keep on happening. So all of this information might become a big grave of data. So in order to avoid this, we need to introduce research information systems, create systems. in order to establish logical ties between the data, making them fit for reusage. So in 2020, work has begun to set up the National Research Information System, URIS. It's about setting up a single resource carrying the profiles of all Ukrainian scientists and their achievements. As we speak about information space for this in Ukraine, I can see it is getting increasingly fragmented. Information is found in various systems or in web pages. The Ministry of Education takes care of three databases. You also have the National Vernaski Library involved in this. National Development Foundation, Ukrainian Institute of Science and Technical Assessment, Ukrainian Institute of Intellectual Property, and State Science and Technology Library. So here you can see the metadata that can be imported into our system. But these systems sometimes do not have an open API. And that all the databases of these institutions have got a persistent identifier, which we can use in the system. There has been a staged development of the system. As we speak about setting up the national career systems, we have conducted a survey in order to determine the patterns in scientific research in this country. The survey covered more than 1,200 respondents, out of which 956 said their institution had the systems 
among the functions of years, they spoke of reports and publication tracking. So the key project idea of years is to preserve, manage, and exchange data on scientific activities in Ukraine. Information on ongoing research in respective institutions. And this is found in different electronic systems and you cannot easily export and import these data. It takes too long to do it in universities and institutions. And uh, sometimes not all of the data are presented correctly. So this gets in the way of making the right decisions to manage scientific activities. Our goals are far reaching. The national craze is quite an uphill task. We want to have a reliable central data platform for research, for making decisions to reduce the fragmentation of the Ukrainian science and research ecosystem. So we need to simplify the procedures at the end of the day. Scientists and others should be granted access to the intellectual data about Ukrainian science. In the platform, there's going to be data on institutions, scientists, projects, publication, infrastructure, procedures. We're going to automate procedures to accredit institutions and to keep prospective registers. We will set up useful tips for scientists and authors of scientific publications. These are the stages of the year's project. In 2020, we developed an architecture of the system. In 2021, we implemented the modules of the system. In 2020, in 2022, we integrated and verified the profiles of scientists and institutions and projects in the system. Now we need to add functional modules for scientists, publications, and projects. We have set up offices of organizers, scientists, participants, in this system. You get services and other functions. Go ID is one of them. Authorization, data import, and ORCID. In 2023, data export from external sources into the system, URIS, has been envisioned. In 2024, the system will be commissioned and project results will be seen there. You can see the integration that is supposed to be done in URIS. It will be done for a scientist profile, which has the presence in the ORCID database. In Ukraine, there's a national ORCID consortium working, so we can use the integration capacities of ORCID based on its identifiers. So there are updates on the institutions as well. They are integrated with a single database on education. That will also be integrated with the PIs of Research Organization Registry. Project information will be integrated with the Ministry of Education, National Development Foundation, and Cross Refund Registry. There will be cross referencing with respective other databases. 
there may be other systems which will allow us to do some other integration in years. In the URIS homepage, you can see the main results. You can see the modules of the system, indicating institutions, research facilities, modules and scientists, publications and projects as well. URIS features modules now on news, useful tips, possibilities for scientists, They can use updated data and choose internship programs or whatever. In this slide, we can see a page on institutions. It's a register which indicates subordination. So it carries profiles of respective institutions and facilities. You can see which one which ones are accredited. And there are other filters in the system. You can see the university page profile. You can see the data found in the institution page so you can see the units of the institution their research infrastructure scientific publications and other information that will be seen in the institution profile we intended to primarily set up an institution profile a research institution profile. Last April, we did an opinion sampling. And as a result of that, we have been able to receive information about the required scientific equipment from 88 institutions. And we imported the data from these registers and this year we need to complete this mission. Speaking of the next steps, we need to import the data on scientists and projects. We need to automate government services in the system. And we also need to conduct training sessions for research institutions and uh, universities. Thank you. Questions are welcome at this moment. Actually, I think you better put them in the chat. So let's carry on. And with this, I would like to move on to the next presenter, Sergey Zharinov, the acting director of Ukrainian Science Center for Development of Information Technologies. He will speak about international science and technical cooperation. Thank you. So we're setting up a portal for the science and technology cooperation. And in this project, we do some research to see how we can improve this endeavor. 
we have a TOR for this. If we think of creating digital products, it's not a static, it's a dynamic process. And you have to keep making improvements in order to meet the needs of users and clients. We have been able to identify four major areas, problems that should be addressed. So we can see low awareness of scientists about available projects and programs they could join. Number two, they have too few contacts with their foreign colleagues. Most of the international projects require cooperation with two, three, and more institutions across the world. Thirdly, there is a high entry barrier. So many of the Ukrainian scientists find it hard to fill out the application form correctly to meet all of the requirements of the program. And number four, the regulations are too complicated and cumbersome. So if you look at the list of required paperwork, it seems to be too much. So among these documents, you get some that are just formal records and they do not make much sense, but they make it too complicated for a scientist in joining a particular program. In our portal, we would like to address three problems like we can offer information support, we can offer advice and a venue for interaction. I'm going to tell you more about this. Speaking of information support, we can offer updates on international framework programs and projects in which Ukrainian scientists can take part. Horizon Europe is one of those. We can work with the national contact points, focal points, like in Horizon 2020, they used to do it this way. The information would be published in their portals and pages. But once the list of the national contact points has been established for Horizon Europe, this information will be seen in one place, aggregated and convenient for users. Number two, cooperation updates. Many data are available automatically in foreign resources and embassies. And some of these data can be used in the automatic format. So this information should be imported down to us and there should be simplified access to it. So in one portal, we could keep all of this and it's gonna be a one point entry. Sometimes it is hard to find some information across foreign resources, so it's going to be kept all in one place. We'll work with the national contact points and experts, and through this portal, that would grant access to those who are willing to get an advice or to join the process, primarily those who are doing it for the first time ever. So these are the things that are in the pipeline, and we can complete it towards the end of the year. Let me now speak about the improvements that have been there. The Office of NKP, National Contact Points, should use Nauka.gov.ua portal. That's the national electronic system that Sabina has told us about earlier. International agreement updates. We need to have a system in place to filter, track, and monitor agreements Ukraine signs with other countries so that scientists and the staff of respective agencies could have, one of all, could have all of the analytical tools in their hands. And 
in order to help this cooperation between Ukraine and other countries to evolve. And the core of this data, well, sometimes you have huge data sets there and they should be handled very conveniently and they should be presented it's in such a way that you could see what's going on, what's doing better, where can Ukrainians find contacts and which projects are the best for potential cooperation. And this is the structure of the portal. So you have the basic portal information, information about various programs for Ukrainians. There are particular lines of business indicated here. This information will be adapted to each particular program, but the overall structure remains the same. The portal will be demonstrated when we're going to do the pilot run of this later this year, or maybe in the beginning of next year, there's going to be a public demonstration of this. Right now, it looks like this, and you get all of the government information resources here, like DIA portal. And the new users of this portal will be able to find their way through this. It's a much more user-friendly system. Well, thank you. I can see we don't have much time left, so. Actually, I've said it all, and if there are any questions, you know where to put them. I will be more than happy to address all of your questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. So we're looking forward to this platform. I think it's gonna help this country in a way and uh, scientists will appreciate this. And they will be able to contribute to the Horizon project. So with this, this panel is near in its end. I'd like to thank all of the presenters who have been able to agree to take part in this panel. We hope there's gonna be further cooperation. We all have exchanged contacts and if you still have any questions, you're welcome to put them in the chat. With this, I'm turning over to the next moderator of the next model, the next panel. Natalia Kalushna, you're welcome. Hello, it's for 20 key of time. And we're only 20 minutes behind the schedule. I'm Natalia Kalushna, I'm with the Science and Technology Library of Ukraine. Over the next couple of hours, I'm going to moderate this panel. We'll speak about modern ways of assessing scientific research. Three weeks ago in Ukraine, they passed a national development plan for open science. So now we will see what is this plan about? What are the deadlines and targets? I'd like to have the experts speak about that. He is with the Directorate of Science and Education in the Ministry of Education, Grigory Mazalevich.
So this time we speak about open science and this particular action plan. It has been recently adopted by the government. So let's see what is this all about in terms of research institutions and the activities they pursue. In 2016, the European Commission presented an updated version of the European policy in science and innovations. Or we have seen a new mission like open science and open innovation. In this piece, open science suggests transparent knowledge that can be shared through the networks of cooperation. You have seen this earlier today. It shows you the taxonomy of open science. The Ministry of Education and Science is responsible for science and technology sector in this country. So it is supposed to draft policies on open science, among other things. On the 12th of October of 2021, Ukraine has signed an agreement to participate in Horizon Europe and Euratom. Some Ukrainian institutions have had experience taking part in Horizon 2020, and they appreciated the need to preserve scientific data and access to them, as well as the need to undertake particular steps in this regard. In the new agreement, there is an article which is called open science practice. It is supported in respective projects and programs based on Horizon Europe program, as well as provisions of Ukrainian law. The law on science and technology cooperation of Ukraine does not carry the notion of open science. Our working group proposed changes to the existing law, in particular in terms of young scientists and open science infrastructure. So we wanted to add new terminology to it. So open science, open access, these things should be found in the law, in the updated version of the law. So we did all of this in 2021. We also produced other proposals, but still it has not been implemented in the existing law, but hopefully over time they're gonna do it. Back to open science now. In 2021, in February, there was an ordinance of the Ukraine government on open science. And there is a particular mission, which is to implement a government policy on open science. The idea is to draft a national plan on open science, which involves scientists, CSOs, and then it would be presented to the cabinet of ministers. In persons of this, the ministry in 2021 in summer signed an ordinance to organize a drafting group. It covered 18 experts from ministries, libraries. There have been individual experts and most of them have contributed to this effort tremendously. 
there have been 11 official meetings and there have been some caucuses that we did on an ad hoc basis. In November, we produced a draft on the draft action plan on open science. And this draft in March of 22 was presented for public discussions, public hearings. So we checked with other units of the ministry and see what the colleagues think about that. Then we took this up with various committees of the Supreme Council, Ministry of Economy, Ministry of Finance. We took it up with the Secretariat of the Cabinet of Ministers. And on the 8th of October of this year, the National Open Science Plan has been adopted by the Cabinet of Ministers. What is it that has been discussed the most in the ministry? It's about the data steward as an occupation. In the EU, you can find and he's garbled, I can't follow it. In Ukraine, there is no such occupation. There's no such official job that that is steward. His connection is so poor, we cannot, I cannot hear him any longer. I guess we have completely lost connection with this presenter. But he has been able to tell us about the key objectives and tasks in the National Open Science Action Plan. So there is a lot of work yet to be done. So let's move on. The next one up is Professor Ludo Waldman. He's involved in quantitative studies and he runs the Science and Technology Center of Leiden University. He is an associate director of Research Institute. He coordinates the initiative on open citation or something like that. So he will tell us about open science and the practice of assessing research products. So Ludo, you're welcome. Thank you, uh, Natalia, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I would like to share my screen, actually, uh, if possible, so that I can show my slides. So we now have someone else uh, screen sharing, so I am not able to share my screen.
Okay, Ludo, let's carry on. Okay, great. Uh, thank you. Let me then indeed share my screen. Okay, um, good, uh, good afternoon, everyone. So I just would like to uh, uh, do a quick talk on uh, um, open science and research assessment reform. And also uh, a question that I would like to address, uh, is this a happy marriage? So um, many of you are probably familiar with um, some of the ongoing, uh, and I believe quite important developments around uh, research assessment and, and reform in research assessment in Europe, in particular in Europe, but also elsewhere. Um, so this is an example of, uh, of a, a recent development, the launch of the uh, Coalition on Advancing Research Assessment um, with an agreement that uh, is being signed by an increasingly large number of institutions, especially in Europe. And this agreement contains all kinds of uh, commitments, commitments to respond responsible research assessment practices. I think this is really a, a key development. I saw there are also signatories from Ukraine, which of course is great. Um, I would like to say something about how I think these developments relate uh, to developments in the area of open science and how the two can actually uh, strengthen each other if we organize things properly. So it's quite interesting from my point of view to also see what the UNESCO recommendation on open science says about this. Um, so the UNESCO recommendation is is a, a very interesting, I believe, document with lots of uh, very uh, relevant perspectives on, on open science. But in connection to research assessment, there are two quotes from the document that I would like to to share with you. So on the one hand, the, the, the UNESCO uh, Open Science Recommendation says that um, uh, uh, reviewing research assessment and career evaluation systems uh, is needed in order to align them with principles of open science. So here the idea is that um, uh, practicing open science is something that takes time and, and resources, effort, all of that. And um, researchers expect to be recognized for doing these things for practicing open science, uh, given the, 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 the time it takes. Um, and it's important that research assessment systems indeed do give recognition to these types of activities. So this is uh, a perspective that we see a lot in policy discussions about open science. So often uh, people point out the need to uh, um, give recognition to open science practices um, and the need for assessment systems to, to take it into account. At the bottom of this slide, you see a different perspective, which I think is equally important. So this is another quote from the uh, Open Science Recommendation. So it says that um, encouraging responsible research and researcher evaluation and assessment practices um, uh, requires um, um, or is needed to incentivize quality science and to recognize the diversity of research output, outputs, activities, and missions. So what we see a lot in um, um, statements about promoting responsible uh, assessment practices, we see uh, a strong emphasis on the need to recognize not just articles in scientific journals, preferably in high impact journals. That's the tr traditional way of thinking. Instead, what is being emphasized is the need to recognize a broad range, a diversity of research outputs, and not only outputs, but also all kinds of other activities, things that researchers do, things that matter, things that have value, and that uh, researchers should be recognized for. So this is also mentioned in the UNESCO Open Science Recommendation. Um, so we see actually that there are two ways in which research assessment is connected to open science. On the one hand, it is about the need to make sure that open science practices are being recognized. At the same time, it's also about the need in general in research assessment to take a broader perspective and to also take into account all kinds of other out outputs and activities uh, that researchers perform. Um, and this is where I think we see uh, 
potentially a happy marriage between the two, between uh, research assessment, reforming research assessment on the one hand and open science on the other hand. But I do want to uh, emphasize that a happy marriage requires a two-way street. Uh, so if it is just goes in one direction, then it doesn't work. And sometimes I'm a little bit afraid that we think too much about this from a one-directional point of view. So what I see a lot is this idea. I see a lot the idea that uh, research assessment needs to uh, incentivize and to reward open science practices. And we have discussions about indicators of open science that could indeed enable us to give recognition and reward to um, researchers that practice open science. And I'm, I'm kind of uh, in agreement with this. This is indeed important and, and, and needed. But I also think that this is just one part of the, of the full picture. So this is just one direction. And we also need to think about uh, the, other, the other direction from open science to research assessment. And this is at least as important, but sometimes it is not getting enough attention. So if we are serious about reforming research assessment, and if we, for instance, in line with this European uh, agreement, if we feel that research assessment should not just be about publications in, in high impact journals, but research assessment should take into account a much broader range of, of outputs and activities, then we need to also fundamentally rethink the types of information that should be made available uh, to evaluators. So the types of information that are taken into account in research assessment in order to give recognition to a diversity of activities and outputs. And this, I think, can only be done if we provide information about uh, research outputs and research activities in a way that is itself aligned with open science, uh, uh, with an open science philosophy. So the information that we provide to perform research assessment should itself be open, um, but the information should also be organized in such a way that um, a broad range of activities and outputs can be taken into account and the information should be um, um, uh, it should be possible to tailor the, the information, to customize the information in such a way that it aligns with the particular missions of research units or researchers that are being assessed. So one size fits all, fits all solutions don't really work, don't really make sense. Um, and this requires an open approach, an open approach in which the information itself is made openly available, is transparent, but also an open approach in the sense of enabling open participation in who is able to have a say in assessment processes, in making information available that informs research assessment. And that is what I call um, open indicators of science. So that's not the perspective that you see at the top of this slide, indicators of open science. It's kind of the complementary perspective of open indicators of science, um, open in the sense of transparent, but also in the sense of who is able to contribute and participate in uh, developing, designing these types of indicators. So we need that two-way street to indeed realize a happy marriage between research assessment and open science. And if you have just a one directional setting, then I'm not sure if we are going to be successful in realizing all the promises around reform of research assessment and around open science. So in the UNESCO recommendation on open science, you also see these types of, of ideas. Uh, it's a little bit hidden in the, in, the, in the recommendation, but they also make a plea, for instance, for open infrastructures. They mention open bibliometrics, open scientometrics, and that's very much aligned with the things I just mentioned. And many of these developments, which of course are also being discussed today in this, uh, in this conference, they are kind of from my point of view, they're part of, of this, this thing that we need to realize. We need to realize open research information research information that is uh, produced and collected according to open science principles, and that can be used to inform new responsible approaches to research assessment. So this, I think, is a key thing. And this is what we need to accomplish in order to have that happy marriage between, between the two, between open science and, and um, uh, responsible research assessment. There's one other thing I want to emphasize. Um, I learned... Uh, 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 quite a lot about your country in, in, in recent years, uh, about Ukraine, and, and uh, also all the expertise that's available in your country. So I just want to emphasize that um, um, the reading that I have done about uh, um, Ukraine and also by uh, researchers from your country, um, I found it really very uh, informative. Um, and uh, 
helpful for me to learn more about uh, kind of the current state of, 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 of the debate in your country. Just want to mention that I feel there's really a lot of expertise available in your country and I think it's important to make uh, use of that in addition to what uh, international experts are able to, uh, to offer. Um, so to conclude, um, it's essential that open science and reform and research assessment go together. Um, so um, that's really the key thing. If you are trying to do one without the other, then it's going to fail, most likely. But this happy marriage is a two-way street. It, it is not only about incentivizing open science, so redesigning assessment in such a way that researchers get rewarded to, for open science practices. Yes, that's important, but it's just one part of the of the full picture. At the same time, we need to make sure that research assessment is taking into account a broader perspective on all the activities and outputs that matter. And this requires open research information. So research information that itself is compiled in an open science way um, with the information being openly, transparently available, but also with open participation in uh, the process of compiling that information. So the need for open research information is really crucial. And as I mentioned, uh, don't forget the uh, the experts that you have available in your country uh, and, and, and all the expertise that they are able to, uh, to, uh, to offer. Uh, thank you for your attention. And I look very much forward to further integration of uh, Ukraine in the European research system. Thank you. Thank you, Ludov, for this informative talk and uh, good advice. I think we're going to listen to that and we'll work accordingly in this country, improving the practice of assessing research to make it closer to European standards. Let's see if there are any questions in the chat. How should the country start developing new practice, new way of assessing research? So should it be a national doctrine, a national provision, or should you start with a particular institution? Which is the better way? Um, yeah, that's, I think, a very complex question. I don't think there is a, a single answer to that. So countries all have their own history, uh, tradition, cultures. Um, so in my country, the Netherlands, for instance, um, we tend to do many of these things in a decentralized manner with indeed individual institutions finding their own way of, of, of doing these things with relatively uh, light touch uh, uh, centralized uh, steering. Um, but I realize that within Europe, we have a lot of uh, diversity in how countries are used to doing this. So for instance, in the Southern European countries, there's a lot much uh, significantly more centralization. And I think it's kind of, uh, unrealistic to expect countries to radically change the way they they organize these types of processes um, so my i think my suggestion would be to do something that kind of aligns with um, um, uh, the, the, the 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 current culture of, of of doing this i do however want to emphasize that in some sense the um, the ambitions that you for instance find in this european agreement this uh, and this coalition that's now being built in europe these ambitions, if you want to truly realize these ambitions, then um, uh, uh, approaches that are too centralized will not work because they kind of tend to lead to one size fits all solutions, which in itself is incompatible with the whole philosophy behind uh, a reform of research assessment. So in that sense, it's it's kind of essential to provide sufficient room for uh, local initiatives, for um, uh, local solutions that might be different from kind of uh, solutions applied and developed elsewhere. Thank you for your advice and thank you for the answer. Okay, let's move on. So, Professor Emanuel Kulczycki is speaking next. He is with the Poznan University, Adam Mickiewicz University in Poland. He serves on the Scientific Communication Group 
He's one of the founders of the Helsinki Initiative for Multilingualism in Scientific Communication. Sir Emmanuel, you're welcome. Good afternoon, uh, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me here. I'm really happy I can contribute to, uh, to the webinar. I will share the screen with my short presentation. And uh, I would like to talk about geopolitics of scholarly communication and multilingualism uh, in science in regard to research assessment and evaluation on science, uh, evaluation of uh, researchers and uh, institutions. And I would like to start from a very clear message that research must be communicated in multiple languages. And uh, access to research and greater interaction between science and society can only be possible if research is communicated in multiple languages and what is very important, including those actually used and speech in writing locally. And of course, we can ask, why do we need multilingual scholarly communication? Actually, on the European level, this question is very often raised. So uh, the first, the, the most clear answer is that we must remember that almost half of Europeans cannot speak any foreign language to hold enough a conversation. And only a little more than one third are able to do so in English. So this is extremely important that research is communicated uh, in various languages, not only exclusively in English. And uh, we must uh, promote such uh, infrastructure, such solutions of research assessment, which are in line with this idea of multiple languages in science. Of course, it doesn't mean that we have to translate everything into uh, local languages, but it means that we should recognize that good quality research can be published in various languages. And on this map uh, prepared um, on the basis of research conducted with my colleagues from European Network for Research Evaluation in Social Sciences and Humanities, I show the results of a couple of European countries which use national research information systems. And on the basis of the data publication, we calculated what share of researchers from social sciences publish their articles in at least two languages in just three year periods. And as you can see, uh, over 60% of researchers from social sciences in Poland, Czech Republic and Slovenia published uh, the article in two, sometimes three or four languages Whereas in Norway and Finland, the share is lower. It is important picture because this picture is focused on researchers, not on single publications. Because when we look into uh, publications, we will see that Polish and Czechish researchers publish less papers in English uh, than their colleagues from Belgium or Denmark but we do publish in various languages. And what is very important, we use various alphabets and the solutions of research evaluation should support it. So what can we do to improve this situation and promote recognizing multilingualism in science in various research evaluation initiatives? In 2019, with uh, various colleagues, we have a, a co we, we uh, founded Helsinki Initiative on Multilingualism in Scholarly Communication. Currently, this initiative is signed by almost 1,000 individuals and organizations like European University Association and DOI, Operas, and Universities Norway. This initiative serves to promote the idea that science is communicated in various languages, 
we can uh, publish results in all languages we use, but we need to have various infrastructures and solutions which support this idea. And the main idea uh, which grounds the Helsinki Initiative on Multilingualism in Scholarly Communication is that language should be a non-issue in assessment. And researchers should be recognized and rewarded according to the results and the impact of their research. Naturally, uh, having one universal common language like English is science is useful. Uh, because of this, we can communicate uh, to date, translate it, uh, translate my uh, talk uh, in Ukraine. But uh, at the same time, we need to have solutions which support communicating with local societies which express themselves in their own, own languages. And because of this, Helsinki Initiative promotes um, the approach that all actors involved in research assessment should make sure that in the process of expert-based evaluation, high quality research is valued regardless of the publishing language or publication channel. When we don't use experts, but metrics uh, make that publications and also book publications in all languages are adequately taken into account in this assessment uh, exercise. And what is extremely important, when we choose evaluators for our research, research assessment, we have to take into account the language skill, because having to assess publications in various languages we have to have evaluators which are able to read those papers. And what is also very important, uh, we cannot sustain the infrastructure of multilingual publishing if we don't control uh, the key uh, scholarly communication channels, because uh, big publishers are not interested in supporting local publishers, local journals. This is why we have to reclaim some key communication channels like journals of publishers. And those channels should be again um, governed by academic community and learned societies. It is not possible to have fully multilingual scholarly communications and rely only on big publishers to which we pay too much money for various uh, APCs or other charges re re regarding uh, publishing of our own papers. And I would like to stress a very important um, thing which is highlighted by the Helsinki Initiative. We have to protect national infrastructure for publishing in local languages, especially in regard to open access. Of course, open access is the idea which we should follow and implement as much as possible. But sometimes uh, transformation into open access is connected uh, with transformation to publishing only in English. We must make sure that nonprofit journals and book publishers have both sufficient resources to publish in local languages and the support needed to maintain high standards of quality control and research integrity. And I would like to highlight that on the basis on various studies in Europe, but also uh, on, in other countries and continents, we see that multilingualism not only in social sciences and humanities, but also in technical and medical fields is integral to accessibility to science and knowledge. And now is a key part of the European research assessment reform. And saying this, I refer to the conclusions on research assessment uh, and implementation of open uh, science published this June 
uh, by the Council of the European Union. And the Council acknowledges uh, the role of multilingualism in the context of science communication and welcomes initiatives which promote multilingualism, such as Helsinki Initiative. And uh, it is also visible in the document uh, published by UNESCO, UNESCO recommendation on open science, where multilingual scientific knowledge is important to make science actually and really open. And uh, according to UNESCO, member states should encourage, should encourage and promote multilingualism in the practice of science, in scientific publications, and in academic communications. And as I mentioned, it's not only um, a part of the reform in Europe, but also in Latin America, uh, a new research assessment towards a socially re relevant science in Latin America and the Caribbean published June this year, uh, in principle eight, write uh, very clearly that they endorse the Helsinki Initiative because multilingualism is important to communicate socially relevant research and contributes to sustaining cultural diversity. So this idea must be implemented on the local and also national level. And I would like to share with you as a conclusion some practical implications for research assessment. Those implications are explained in the chapter uh, on multilingualism uh, of social sciences in the handbook of research assessment in the social sciences. But those uh, guidelines or implications are important actually for all fields. So we should follow DORA declaration and assess research quality based on content and not the language of publication. And we should take into account that there are various language biases and they are um, in, uh, embedded in evaluation and we should be aware of this and we should fight with this. And publications in all languages need to be taken into account in various evaluation exercise. We should require language skills uh, from our uh, evaluations. And we also should, in various evaluations where it is possible, uh, take into account not only peer review publications, but also some professional and uh, publications uh, for general audience, because various such publications are written and published in local languages, and they do a lot of work of pro for promoting research. And we should not focus only on international citation uh, indexes like Web of Science or Scopus, but we should develop and support national citation indexes because only thanks to this, we are able to say something about our, about our national uh, science in terms of bibliometrics. Thank you very much for having this opportunity uh, to share this um, uh, insights how multilingualism is important for sustaining open science and also for reforming uh, research evaluation in Europe. Thank you. Thank you for this talk. Thank you for letting us know about the importance of multilingualism in assessing research. So DORA declaration is an important development and I guess it allows us to see the way to go further. So I didn't see questions in the chat. You're welcome to write to Manuel directly over the email. So no questions for now, but we've got your contacts and uh, I think we might be able to email the questions to you. Mr. Mazalevich is back. He dropped out because of poor internet earlier on and he couldn't complete his talk. So we're gonna give him a couple of minutes to finish it. 
Okay, let's have it. So I'll try to share the slides. Sorry guys for this technical glitch. So the national plan drafting team has been able to address disputable issues which came from other institutions, the public, the National Academy of Science, the Secretariat of Cabinet of Ministers. And finally, after all of this on the 8th of October, 2022, this paper has been adopted. All of these scientists, innovators, all of the institutions, Ukrainian and overseas colleagues, they are welcome to join the implementation of particular objectives of the plan. There are six kind of sections or blocks in it. One of them is about open access for research results and information. And then open access to research infrastructure then setting up conditions for efficient work with research infrastructure and information which is found in the open access. Popularizing science involving citizens in science and research activity. Increasing awareness, shaping up competency in open science. improving the existing system of assessing quality of research. So in the second part of this talk, I wanted to speak about the assessment of research. There are two government ordinances on that. One of them dates back to 2018, number 652. It's the assessment of universities in terms of how do they do research. And the second one dates back to 2017. It's the assessment of research institutions. So they carry a particular assessment criteria that you can see right now. And these criteria are similar in a way. And that's how the ministry would do the assessment. If we speak about assessing universities, only one cycle has been completed so far. 135 universities supply 325 packages of documents to get their research assessed. For the four universities that do research, have received basic funding and additional funding. So their research lands up, ends up in the category A and B. We drafted the distribution formula to distribute funds among types of research. We consider financial success of a particular research over the last five years. And proportionately to the success, we look at the category in which this research is found. It can be A or B. So the total of funding is distributed on that basis. In 2021, it was 100 million grivna distributed like that among research projects in universities. In 2022, this amount is smaller. If all of this is over, then the funding for universities will be back to where it was before if not more than that. Speaking of assessment of research institutions, it is done twice a year and it is there for research institutions and facilities 
since 2019, they have been able to complete about eight cycles of this assessment. 547 institutions have done it so far. There are four classification groups there. If you end up in the category four, it means that throughout the year, you're going to be reassessed to see if you have done better. Or this institution will have to reorganize the operations or shut down the institution. And you get a certificate at the end of the cycle. Speaking of the future outlooks, there is a particular draft vision of the ministry in terms of assessing universities and uh, scientific institutions as a single tool. So it's not going to be two separate ones. Within the National Open Science Plan, They speak about the need to improve the assessment criteria, and there's a need to draft recommendations for universities and research institutions to help them improve institutional assessment policies to assess the research they do and the capacities of their staff based on DORA San Francisco provisions. Half a year ago or so, There has been a proposal from the European research space. It's about signing an agreement with countries or particular institutions in order to join the agreement on reform and research assessment. In the website of the European Commission, you can find this piece. You can see this proposal for signing an agreement like that. Maybe over time, Ukraine will join it too. So with this, I'm as good as done. Thank you so much and I apologize for the technical difficulties. Okay, thank you, Grigori. Sometimes you cannot do anything about it. No problem. Anyway, it's good that we can do it online and there are so many participants in and out of Ukraine. This is an ambitious plan. So let's build the open science in this country together. And in the meanwhile, we're gonna move on. I'd like to move on to the next presenter, Olga Polotska. the executive director of the National Research Fund of Ukraine. She will tell us about the trends and challenges in assessing research. It's good that important stakeholders are joining this call, the ones that provide funds. Delivering my presentation and talking English. Uh, so, well, first of all, I would like to express huge thanks to all the organizers of this conference because this is no ordinary conference. This is just well um, a very big event, which is uh, well one hundred percent timely for Ukrainian research uh, in a, uh, community. Uh, and since this is the first. Uh, conference of this type. So my huge congratulations. And I do hope that uh, well, next time we meet, next time we have a chance uh, of uh, well, discussing the, the issues that are raised today. Uh, well, we will uh, be reporting about the progress now. So, well, let me uh, start my presentation with a rather well, provocative question. Of course, I don't expect everybody to answer but at least just, well, I would like to give you a kind of a fruit for thought. So, well, uh, so well, the, the question uh, seems uh, quite easy. Well, but this is only on the surface. So if you really think hard about that, so, well, you might uh, have uh, quite different answers. So let's imagine uh, two uh, Ukrainian researchers and who are applying for a grant of the National Research Foundation of Ukraine and then, while well, analyzing the information about these two people, we see that one of the researchers has an age index of eight and the other one uh, the same uh, index of four. 
So, well, the question is, can we uh, put our hands and our hearts and say just for sure that, uh, well, the uh, ideas of the first researchers, researcher are better than those uh, of Boris, that they have more added value for uh, research and society. Or if we paraphrase that in a very general way, so, well, if we would like to evaluate quality of, for example, uh, an application, would we always rely on quantitative indicators? So, well, this is fruit for thought for everybody. The next slide, please. Yeah, so, well, uh, today, uh, just for like uh, many of the speakers, I will be talking about the research assessment reform, which is currently a trend, and not only in Europe, this is a trend worldwide, and uh, about the challenges connected uh, uh, to this trend. The next slide, please. So, well, first of all, why this question is of vital importance for us as uh, the national granting operator in the field of research and development. Uh, it's because that's actually one of our main tasks is, uh, well, assessment and evaluation of research ideas. Uh, and so we, a couple of words to introduce uh, our foundation. We are um, a budgetary non-profit organization and so far we have been operating public funds only, uh, which means that, uh, well, we are accountable to the society, to the taxpayers, and understanding that is uh, also an important thing. So while we provide grants, uh, grant support for both fundamental and applied research in all fields of uh, research, and mainly we practice the, the uh, traditional bottom-up uh, approach. So we were uh, established by the cabinet of ministers of Ukraine, and we direct, uh, uh, directly report to the cabinet of ministers of Ukraine. The, the next slide, please. So, uh, well, now let's talk about the basic principles that underlie uh, all our activities. First and foremost, it's maximal openness and transparency. And so, well, this is how the foundation was formed. And uh, so this is one of the pillars uh, which underlines everything we're doing. So here we are in uh, line with the uh, current trends, uh, uh, well, uh, which we all observe and are involved in, uh, in modern research done nationally or internationally. So the second principle is independence and objectivity of uh, our reviewing projects. So well, we rely on peer reviewing of uh, projects submitted for calls of the National Research Foundation of Ukraine. Of course, so, um, a very important aspect here is respect for copyright and related rights, uh, as well as the principles of scientific uh, ethics. Again, we're proud to say that uh, at the very beginning, when the foundation was launched, all these principles were with us at that time. And so, well, we are relying on them. Uh, so, well, uh, another important uh, uh, principle is compliance with principles of fair call, of fair competition. Uh, so, well, uh, because, uh, well, this selection done at the foundation is uh, based extremely uh, on competition of ideas. Then, of course, preventing of conflicts of interests uh, when selecting uh, uh, the members of uh, our governing bodies. Uh, and, uh, of course, when we implement organization of competitive selection and further uh, uh, finance the, the winning projects. The next slide, please. So, well, uh, as far as the main objectives go, they are, well, it seems to me quite clear. So certainly that stimulation of national uh, fundamental and applied research. Of course, this is also development of research infrastructure in Ukraine. And which is very important, especially now, it's in international integration. Then, uh, well, one more uh, of the objectives is development of infrastructure uh, of scientific research. Uh, then, uh, well, we have always uh, uh, placed special accent on support of early career researchers and their projects. And the last but not the least, this is 
popularization of science, of Ukrainian science, and the outcomes of our uh, national researchers. The next slide, please. So, as uh, well, all of you have heard today, uh, uh, just well, and well, you have mentioned that uh, several times that uh, June in June this year, the European Council granted Ukraine the status of a candidate for accession to the European Union, which was a huge event for all of us. And uh, well, this day uh, officially ver verified uh, um, European Union support of Ukraine's strive for becoming a truly European state and for sharing European values. For us, uh, this would naturally mean making, uh, well, huge steps and facing considerable challenges with the aim of aligning with European practices of assessing, financing, and managing in Ukraine research and innovation spheres. The next slide, please. So, well, uh, another important event uh, uh, just well happened uh, late last year when the European Commission uh, reveals uh, its wish to form a coalition of research organizations in favor of re reforming research assessment. Uh, given the widespread recognition that employers and funders currently use inappropriate and narrow methods to assess the quality of research and researchers. And as a matter of fact, early this year, the European Commission has uh, called uh, organizations uh, uh, well to express their interest in being part of this reform. So well, the national, I'm proud to say that the National Research Foundation of Ukraine uh, joins this initiative. And actually we, uh, uh, we uh, were involved in negotiations and meeting of stakeholders uh, since the very beginning of 2022. The next slide, please. So, uh, well, why do we say that this uh, um, research uh, uh, assessment reform is necessary? Uh, so shared commitments for research assessment reform to be achieved in an agreed time frame will enable recognition of the diverse outputs, practices, and activities that maximize the quality of research and its resulting impacts, facilitate a move away from inappropriate uses of journal and publication-based metrics and reinforce trust in research. And well, after saying that, I would say that the two key words are quality and trust in, the, in this whole process. The next slide, please. So, well, in July, 2022, the final version of this agreement uh, came out. It was presented uh, at uh, a stakeholder assembly. Uh, bringing together over 350 organizations for over uh, 40 countries. Well, not only uh, European countries, by the way, uh, which is also very important, that makes the whole process global, not limited to uh, the European um, uh, continent. So, uh, well, uh, as a matter of fact, so the agreement uh, sets a shared direction for changes for the reform in assessment practices for, again, research, researchers, and research performing organization. The next slide, please. So, well, here, I'm not going just well to cite that. You can have a look at, uh, well, these are the words of uh, president of the European University Association, one of the uh, co-partnering organizations together with uh, Science Europe, who are actually taking the leads in, in implementing uh, uh, these just well the process uh, well drafting the agreements making amendments and then forming the coalition of uh, different organizations who uh, would like to sign the agreements and uh, uh, here it's just well um, it's very important to understand that declaring something is not enough uh, or declaring just um, some, some following some policies is not enough. So this is partnership and a lot of mutual work, a lot of mutual discussions that has already been done, but is still to be done in the future. Uh, the next slide, please. <coughs> Sorry.
Yeah. Uh, so, well, here are two main principles for assessment criteria and processes mentioned in the agreement in this initiative. First of all, its concentration on quality and impact, and secondly, diversity, inclusiveness, and collaboration. And so these are not just simple, simple well, you know, well, uh, words. Uh, so, well, these words uh, have uh, a very, uh, well, you know, specific uh, direction of actions. And these actions are always uh, done mutually in cooperation worldwide. The next slide, please. Um, yeah, so, well, a couple of slides. So, back one more. So, well, previous. Будь ласка, ще на один слайд поверніться. Yeah. So, well, actually the agreement uh, contains, uh, well, two groups of commitments, core commitments and supporting commitments. So, well, the core commitments uh, go about diversity and recognizing diversity of co contributions and uh, careers in research in accordance with the needs of nature of the research. A very important question uh, for the National Research Foundation of Ukraine, uh, well, when planning the projects, when budgeting the projects, when financing them and implementing. Then um, uh, base research assessment, so well, this is one, one more commitment uh, on qualitative evaluation uh, for which peer review is central, supported by responsible use of quantitative uh, indicators. So while the reform does not reject all quantitative uh, indicators. This is very important to use them, uh, well, very responsibly. So um, uh, one more important step, it's a huge step actually for Ukraine, it's abandoning inappropriate usage of research assessment uh, of uh, uh, different metrics, such as uh, journal citation, uh, just journal publication based metrics, yeah, so age indexes and so on and so forth. So, well, this is just well, uh, how we used to operate. And now we are moving away from that following the trade, the trend. So, well, uh, then, uh, so, well, one more commitment is avoidance of the use of rankings of research organizations. Uh, and this is also a huge step for uh, Ukraine, not only for Ukraine, a huge challenge for um, uh, European and non-European countries that have decided to sign the agreement. The next slide, slide please. So there are more um, supporting commitments, just well, please have a look briefly because I, I would like to economize on time. The supporting commitments, they are also very important. And uh, actually, uh, well, what is trem uh, tremendous help um, about this initiative is that the agreement is followed by a set of practical advice and recommendations on uh, where, where to start, where to proceed, so, well, how the uh, uh, existence of this coalition and the dialogue be between the members is um, uh, going to be running. The next slide, please. <clears throat> so, well, uh, as a matter of fact, I love the citation, uh, just the words said by the president of Science Europe, Mark Shields, and uh, I'm honored to know him personally. So, well, publish or perish and metrics have led us into a blind alley. Let us start recognizing the full breadth of value created by researchers. I think that just well, these two short sentences make the very essence of uh, the reform. And just well, like any reform, of course, there is uh, just well, you know, uh, well, not only challenges, there are barriers, uh, there are opponents to the reform. Uh, well, uh, you can guess that just well, the, those uh, big publishing companies um, are not quite satisfied with that trend. But uh, so, well, within the frames of this uh, reform, the dialogue and involvement of big publishers can also be um, uh, a kind of a solution and a very good tool to achieve the uh, expected results. 
And uh, the next uh, slide, please. So uh, you can definitely learn more, the ones who don't know much about this initiative. Uh, so well, there is a lot of information uh, uh, on the website of Science Europe, uh, actually. So we normally use this um, uh, to update the information. Uh, so well, the agreement uh, was uh, drafted by Science Europe, uh, the European University Association, and uh, uh, with huge help, Dr. Karin uh, Strubens, uh, who is one of the ideologists of uh, this reform and supported by the European Commission. And as a matter of fact, the process of uh, signing the uh, agreement and joining the coalition uh, now has, it has a wonderful name, COARA, uh, is quite easy from the technical point of view. And at the end of my presentation, I am so pleased and honored to inform all of you that just literally a couple of days ago, the National Research Foundation of Ukraine has signed the agreement and has joined the coalition. So, well, we have a lot of challenges ahead of us, but, well, I'm quite sure that with support of our international partners and support of uh, stakeholders and partners in Ukraine, we will cope with all the challenges. And on the last slides, you can see uh, just, well, our contact information. Of course, we, are, uh, we would be happy to answer uh, any questions? Thank you so much. Thank you for this presentation, Olga. We appreciate what your team are doing. You are a pretty recent institution. But I appreciate what you're doing and have already done. We're in and out of time, but I still would like to ask you a question. It's about PIs, permanent identifiers, and the openness of metadata. We spoke about the importance of this in the infrastructure, national and European. Are there any plans? Maybe you're doing something about that to integrate PIs in ORCID, if you think of applications that certain institutions will submit, are there any ideas to assign identifiers for grants? English, as far as I understand, I will be ask, uh, answering in English too, if, if there are no uh, objections to that. Yes, so that's an amazing question. That's wonderful. And we're, we're uh, actually, uh, we already started moving that way. Uh, but the war broke uh, all of our plans uh, so well because one of the um, very important tasks uh, which has which remains unrealized by the National Na National Research Foundation of Ukraine is creating of uh, a very good and comprehensive database of uh, well projects that have already been financed or are being financed by the National Research Foundation of Ukraine using just, well, all possible ways of just, well, integrating that into, uh, well, systems like OSIT, for example. Uh, so what the thing is that uh, we have been thrown back by, by the war and, uh, well, this is a matter of the future, definitely. But, uh, well, uh, at the same time, the results of all the research done uh, with the support of the National Research Foundation of Ukraine can be easily accessible on uh, our website. And fortunately, this is not a database yet, but uh, so, well, anybody who is interested can, mm -hmm. can find this information. So it's publicly available. So thank you for this question. And of course, well, uh, we're looking forward to implementing our plans as soon as we uh, just, well, have the resources necessary for that. All right, got it. Thank you for the answer. So let's carry on. The next presentation will be done by the Vice President of the European Council of Young Scientists and holders of doctor's degree. Sebastian Nadale will speak about the views of young scientists on open science and the assessment of research. So Sebastian, you're welcome. 
Thank you so much for the kind introduction. Let me quickly share my screen so you also can see my presentation. Okay, this should work now, I hope. And so, um, yeah, I'm very happy to be here and uh, to share a bit of, of our perspective as early career researchers, um, how uh, we view open science and research assessment. And um, before I go into more, more details of this, um, I will take a few minutes to uh, just introduce uh, Eurodoc, the European Council of Doctoral Candidates and Junior Researchers. So what we are is a uh, pan-European umbrella organization of currently 26 national associations. Um, all of these national associations are representing doctoral candidates and junior researchers, so essentially all early career researchers. And um, yeah, as the roof organization, um, we're representing them in the European policy and um, with all sorts of activities uh, in the uh, European sphere. Um, we also um, this year have uh, quite uh, the um, uh, nice jubilee uh, in uh, that we are um, celebrating our 20th anniversary already. And um, as I will show in the, in the next slide, just briefly, there's a lot of things that happened um, in the past years and also are reaching in the future where uh, we um, already were quite um, successful with many activities also regarding open science, um, as well as uh, many other topics uh, that are important for early career researchers. So these are just some of the, the current activities. Um, in the right hand side, you, you see um, a screenshot of our Open Science Ambassador Program that uh, was launched in 2019 uh, and was a very successful program. Currently, this is paused because of uh, so many uh, other institutions and organizations that have put up trainings, that have put up their own ambassador programs and so forth. Um, so we're currently revising this um, with the idea to bring something up that has an added value and is not just repeating things that are now also available at other levels. Uh, we're hosting events, for example, uh, just a few days ago, we had a very nice um, webinar discussion with uh, different um, stakeholders from university organizations to publishers um, that um, uh, was concerning open peer review and current developments thereof. Um, we're um, collaborating as an expert partner in the Open Research Europe project. Um, Eurodoc is also a partner in the Optima project, so is uh, contributing to development um, of uh, open science and of uh, practices in the uh, Ukrainian um, uh, research area. So we're active in, in all these kind of, uh, kind of ways. And uh, also, um, since we heard so much about open science and research assessment, uh, we're also contributing through one European uh, funded project, the Open Universal Science Project, which has just started, is collecting more and more um, of the best practices more than that have been in um, recent comprehensive studies shown. And in this project, we are also then um, testing um, in uh, pilots at different research uh, performing organization and different research funding organizations across Europe, these best practices to give uh, the, the best possible policy impact out of the, the consortium. So there's all sorts of activities where Eurodoc is very active in the, the European sphere. And uh, of course, also this um, includes policy input of ourselves, um, like uh, a response for the implementation of Plan S. Um, this uh, concerns also some, some overviews and uh, surveys that we, are, uh, we have done, like, for example, the publication on the bottom left that you see, um, where we um, work with, with our peers uh, to see how open science is, um, is done, what an impact uh, it has on early career researchers. And so this is, uh, this is available. And of course, we're also uh, involved with the drafting of the um, scoping report that led towards uh, this whole process um, towards the Quara um, coalition that we heard already a couple of times during uh, this, this event. So there's all sorts of activities where Eurodoc is involved and where Eurodoc um, helps to advance the, the European research area and to also help advance open science in general. Now, without um, needing to, to repeat all the good things that we already heard um, throughout the, the day about open science, about the benefits that it brings and about the, also the, the relations, um, let me start with the, the different uh, way um, of perspective. So uh, often if you um, are engaged with different scientists and also there's some, some critics that see some of the, the current de developments um, in a way maybe uh, critically. And um, some things that you may hear is, hear is that open science is uh, such a newfangled idea, some, something new that's uh, not so much needed, um, which 
actually is not, not quite uh, true. So let's look back um, as one example, just uh, some 80 years where um, already um, Robert Merton, um, for example, just as, as, as one, um, one example of a scientist who already defined exactly the, these same values saying that, um, calling it communalism, um, saying that um, scientists should have common ownership um, in order to promote collective collaboration and that exactly secrecy is the opposite of the norm of good science. So being open isn't really the, the very new idea, of course. Um, you could, of course, go, go on with the, such critics and then um, they, they might tell you, well, um, but open access, that's fine, okay, and we'll see how to, to manage this. But what about other, other ideas you have uh, with all these open science business? So what's about uh, open data, for example? Is this really needed? Well, as we see in, in this example, um, this is actually a, a discussion of a problem that's going on for more than three centuries. Um, in uh, this one example, Sir Isaac Newton was uh, becoming very adamant in, in his letters to uh, astronomer John Flamsteed because Flamsteed was providing him with calculations, but didn't uh, provide the data along with it. And so um, Isaac Newton told him literally, your observations um, um, are needed, just your calculations without the data beyond it are meaningless. So it's something that's actually there that's been lingering in science and in the, the, the discussions for quite a while. And um, also it's not quite just um, the ivory tower principle. Um, so it's not just, um, that this is something for, for pure fundamental scientists. Um, for a very uh, broad comparison, if you look into, for example, patent law, patents is something that uh, more and more scientists um, are being involved with in order to make that the science count, in order to, to also um, receive the, the um, corresponding impact and really um, um, yeah, get more worth out of the, the, the results that they are creating. And so it's something that's very much fostered by all the, the funding agencies. And if we take a closer look, so um, this kind of formal structured system is something that um, dates back to the 15th century. And it's actually something um, that from that very beginning um, required the disclosure of the details of inventions. It's been at that time a decree in the, in the Venetian state. Um, and it's something that um, actually the business people from Venice have spread throughout the world and something that has taken so, so much on because there is an inherent value in this kind of sharing. Of course, in this case, also for the, uh, for the companies to get at least for a limited time, some protection for these kind of invention, these kind of developments that they're undergoing. Um, but the openness is a key feature and that's something that also then uh, provides a value that's um, worthwhile for the countries to, to actually put all this into, into place. So in a way, patents can really be seen as a way, as a means to, to open up knowledge in exchange for this kind of um, protection. So in spite of debates that also have been going on in the 17th, 18th century and so forth, if this is not just hindering and uh, if uh, knowledge transfer would need to be more open, it's actually, actually something that helped with more knowledge transfer than um, the practices have been before. And that's also something that um, different organizations are very much um, agreeing with. So we see some very recent letters from uh, statements from, from this year. Uh, one is from the European Commission and uh, one is um, from um, all uh, European um, um, academies um, that both of them agree fundamentally there's no position between um, some valorization of the results protecting the intellectual property rights but making all the contents openly available and also um, adhering to all principles of, of open science and so in this um, th there's uh, many things that have been going on for centuries actually in the development but of course the, the terminology and the momentum that we see today that's something um, very recent so open science as a term um, has been coined only some 40 years ago, um, not, not quite 40 years ago. And since this coining of the term, there's been so much attention to this, so much um, development to get all the different features, all the, the different aspects, what's included there, what can be done to, well, improve science, to get to better science, to better science practices, and to more exchange and um, yeah, a better working system overall. And so we see as, as one example on the, uh, on the top, um, one uh, distinguishing, uh, distinguishment of uh, very um, small details, what kind of ways of, of open science are there? And this has since the, the Foster project uh, even been developed further. Um, and one very recent example is on the, on the very right-hand side that even one of the, the largest European research um, organizations 
has taken over a comprehensive strategy as a comprehensive policy to make this the very core of their, their activities. Now, for early career researchers, um, there's certainly some, some value in this, as can be seen by, by so many early career researchers actively driving the whole development of open science. Um, but there's uh, different sides to, um, um, to, to take into account there. So on the, on the one hand side, we know from um, quite a couple of publications and quite a couple of studies that open science also does uh, provide career benefits, um, particularly for um, early career researchers. Um, but generally more in the, the long run. So we see um, evidence of an increased number of citations, although there's uh, a little bit of discussion in the ongoing publications. So this is research on, on research that's still um, being performed and that's still being, uh, being discussed in the communities. Uh, but generally, um, it's been observed that there's a greater recognition of um, what uh, researchers have done. This uh, open science is creating additional project opportunities and is providing thus in the long term um, career benefits. The only problem is um, provide exemplary on, on the right hand side. So the right hand side is a, a recent report of the Swiss uh, National Science Foundation, but it's um, quite comparable to um, what's been going on in many uh, countries and many academic systems worldwide. We see that um, the, the average contract length for um, early career researchers is getting shorter and shorter, that there's more and more uh, precarity to uh, particularly early career researchers. And early career researchers in this, uh, in this case, um, if we adhere to, to this one study, for example, um, postdocs um, are referred to um, 10, 15 years even after completing the, the doctorate. So um, it's a very long time in their, their career path um, that they still have no planning security, that they don't know what um, tomorrow will, will bring for them. And these kind of um, uncertainties and imponderabilities um, these, of course, provide obstacles, and these, of course, require many of the, the early career researchers to really focus just on short-term rewards that, uh, that just frankly, uh, frankly said, continues their, their careers. And so with these shortening cycles of assessment and, and employment, these um, kind of short-term rewards, um, that's something that's actually um, being in the way of um, open science, of adapting open science practices, or even just um, getting into um, these kind of practices and, and obtaining these kind of competences, because it's time that could otherwise be spent to try and just keep your employment, right? So um, with these kind of, kind of systems, there's, of course, um, a lot of obstacles, particularly for early career researchers, and that's something that um, will need to be addressed, particularly through metrics and criteria that focus more on other factors that are um, conducive to all these other things that early career researchers, just as other researchers are also, are already doing. And so in order to um, increase the, this uh, low uptake beyond uh, what enthusiasts are, are already doing, we'll need to um, overcome these kind of systemic obstacles. And that's, of course, something, again, as mentioned before, that this uh, um, agreement on uh, advancing research assessment and the corresponding coalition are really um, setting out to do. And um, something where we have so much momentum already that um, there's high hopes uh, that at least parts of these obstacles and of these uh, detrimental, uh, detrimental um, effects within the, the systems can be overcome, can be improved and uh, that this will really foster much, much more the adaption of open science and the possibilities to, to utilize all these benefits that we have heard already. And so, yeah, with the conclusions, um, despite the long, long practice, there's so many benefits across sectors, benefits also for researchers' careers. And so without these obstacles, with an improved um, rewards and incentive systems, with uh, the advancement of research assessment, but just as well with the training of the state-of-the-art practices. Um, we can overcome this and simply um, in, in one um, short and um, very specific sentence, we can get to a point where open science is really recognized as just being good science, um, as uh, our late uh, colleague John Tennant always used to, uh, uh, used to tell. And with this, I thank you for your attention. Um, I, uh, as you can see, I share the um, the presentation with you in case there's there's anything you would like to follow up and also you're very welcome of course um, to reach out uh, for any questions now or later
Thank you, Sebastian, for this overview of what your organization does, your doc, and you have spoken about the young scientists and how they see the assessment of research and open access. I don't see questions right now, but I think we're gonna put them in the chat, if any. Well, let's move on. I'd like now to turn over to Deputy Director of the Institute of Economics and Projections in the National Academy of Science, Igor Yegorov. He will tell us about the main trends in assessing research institutions in Ukraine. Вибачте, будь ласка, але вас не чути. Увімкніть, будь ласка, мікрофон. І оберіть українську мову. На панелі там глобус, натисніть, будь ласка, українська. Не бачу глобус, що ж ви скажете зараз? Не бачу глобус, чесно кажучи, просто не бачу глобус. Вас не чути. Увімкніть. Пане Ігора, нас нам вас не чути. Увімкніть. Будь ласка, мікрофон ваш. Зараз чути, я думаю. І оберіть, будь ласка. Украинский канал. Я не бачу выбора канала. Бачу, что это где оно, где оно есть. Вы бачите, что... В панели Zoom э, там есть такой глобус. Вы бачите, что панель Zoom. Не бачу, добре. Праворуч від демонстрації екрану повинен бути або глобус, або у вас може бути обрано англійський канал. ЄН можливо бути написано. Біля, біля кнопочки демонстрації екрану знизу. Якщо, знизу якщо хочете, я можу англійською, я англійською це прокоментувати, це не проблема. Я просто не бачу, чесно кажучи, не бачу. Давайте англійською. Давайте англійською. А презентацію ви бачите чи ні? Ні, вона вже закрилася. Запустіть, будь ласка, ще раз. Дякую. Ще раз, ще раз спробуємо.
А зараз видно презентацію? Так, видно, дякуємо. Добре. Тоді я, тоді я дуже швиденько англійською вихочу. Давайте англійською. Да? I will try. I will try to skip some 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 slides because uh, they are more informative than uh, um, and not so so important for, for for this particular presentation. Especially bearing in mind that the funny policy actually uh, told about the importance of uh, evaluation of research organizations and the research projects uh, at the moment. Um, <clears throat> at the same time, we understand that there is a need on. In, uh, enhancing the changes in uh, evaluation of research organizations. First of all, it is connected with, uh, with the need of uh, growing uh, effectiveness and uh, efficiency of uh, of uh, R&D and uh, in different levels, at the level of our organization, the level of, uh, of the state, and the level of, of companies. Uh, Main uh, three main there are three main uh, approaches to evaluation of research organizations. Much of the first of them is very formal, you know, but it's uh, used in a very small uh, number of countries, such as, for instance, Norway. Then, expert, uh, first of all, they used for uh, the countries which are which have not enough data, for instance, for African countries. And most popular uh, is the uh, evaluation process related uh, to uh, to expert evaluation and uh, to uh, to statistical data. But this is, you know, mixed uh, mixed approach. Main trends, probably this is the main uh, main part of my presentation. We have uh, uh, horizontal diversification uh, according to national disciplines. In the world, you know, first of all, uh, Great Britain, for instance, uh, my good friend, the professor of the university, Professor Ben, ben Martin, told that initially they wanted to have, you know, a quite general um, uh, division between disciplines, for instance, uh, economics, business, or, you know, uh, chemical sciences, uh, you know, uh, chemistry, or, you know, physics and so on. Then later they, they, they switched to more detailed uh, um, division between dis the scientific disciplines. For instance, they have a, a separate evaluation for research organization uh, uh, which are um, working on science policy and the innovation policy. They have very few such organizations in Great Britain, but they have you know, a separate group of such organizations, separate evalu evaluation of that. Uh, second point is uh, vertical um, changes in, in, in vertical view on uh, the organizations. The League of European Research Universities actually published this year a very special paper on, on this and uh, evaluation not only of research organization as a whole, but uh, also of uh, different departments of this organization, the separate, uh, separate uh, evaluation and also evaluation of uh, research, um, individual researchers. Uh, uh, fourth trend is um, introduction of monitoring procedures uh, in, different, uh, in different countries and, uh, you know, uh, defining the time between, uh, between uh, evaluation, uh, evaluation themselves. And then uh, the fourth, uh, last trend, uh, change in permanent changes in, in, in the methods of evaluation after each, you know, cycle of evaluation cycle. Uh, this is a general trend, and actually, you mentioned, you know, uh, Ukrainian experience. Yes, you're right. Uh, we worked uh, on uh, evaluation of research organization of the National Academy of Sciences, and now we finished, uh, you know, the first cycle of uh, such uh, uh, such evaluation of research organizations. Unfortunately, I'm not. Uh, we are not satisfied with the National Academy of Sciences with the final results. We have quite a lot of. Uh, High marks, uh, you know, of our research organizations and uh, a lot of organizations which uh, which were put into the so-called so-called class A, you know, the highest group of uh, research organizations. And so we work on it later uh, on uh, on further improvements in our uh, approaches. But uh, now I I wanted you know also say about. Uh, 
how to say it, balance between uh, criteria and uh, indicators which are used for uh, for uh, evaluation in developed countries, but also we are trying to follow, you know, the, those changes too. First of all, first tendency, uh, we have a tendency first for more general uh, criteria formulations. For instance, in the National Foundation and in the USA, they have two criteria for, uh, for evaluation, intellectual merit and second impact. So you can see that this and this uh, formulation, you can use, you know, different approaches. You can, you, you have some freedom to, 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 to find, you know, your specific, specific uh, methods, specific approaches, specific criteria for, uh, for, for values. Uh, then second, uh, second time, um, you know, growth of number of uh, indicators and uh, their diversity, their, it depends on the specificity of uh, scientific disciplines. Actually, our Polish colleague uh, mentioned, you know, that um, social sciences have their specificity and uh, in formal indicators, you know, it's it's not um, reflected, you know, in, in, all, in all cases. At the same time, um, you know, the next uh, trend is, uh, uh, you know, decline of, um, how to say, obligatory materials, you know, for uh, for the organization. So now, now, uh, now experts uh, rely more on open uh, open sources, uh, and uh, <clears throat> they use more open sources, which are mm. which are on sites so of the organization, first of all, or in open publications. And uh, the last trend, probably this is the more um, important problem for us. Uh, the need to involve foreign experts or um, first of all external experts you know for for, for evaluation because in ukraine with especially within the academy of sciences we have you know this huge problem um, with the involvement of foreign experts you know and education for foreign experts usually in the world you know this is uh, this problem is related to some kind of um, how to say financial ex expenditures we have no such specific funds for such expenditures and uh, the involvement of that such experts are voluntary you know uh, sometimes you know it's not uh, relevant for for the purposes of evaluation you know this is this is the biggest problem probably we have to, to work with the ministry and with our european partners on uh, changes of this situation and uh, uh, use of more foreign uh, foreign experts because you understand despite we, we are trying to to avoid you know conflict of interest uh, between our experts people know uh, in our country people know each other and uh, uh, they are under pressure of their colleagues or you know even uh, of course in form, first of all informal pressure of or relations between between colleagues between institutes and uh, this also has negative impact on evaluation of research institutes Mm -hmm. I have to say, to say that we used uh, probably I will skip several five slides. We used uh, for our uh, for our evaluation. We used uh, we used the Latvian Association approach. We used the way we adopted you know uh, their um, their approach. Uh, why? Because this is this organization was um, very similar to the Academy of Sciences. You know this. A uh, number of research institutes uh, which have different specialization, which are working with different disciplines. Uh, I think that the um, key idea, uh, key idea is uh, uh, of evaluation, uh, uh, reforming of uh, uh, is to reform you know existing organizations or liquidate you know some organizations which are which cannot work uh, at the modern level. Um, you see, for instance, this organization, if you can see in the Latvian Association, they usually, they usually close, you know, several organizations after every cycle, you know, five or five year cycle, cycle of, um, of evaluation, you know, up to, how to say, five percent, five, seven percent of organization are closed, uh, usually as a result of this cycle, and uh, other organizations could be crazy, you know. 
I can give you an example. For instance, they closed the organization which was responsible for uh, popularization of uh, scientific results on uh, old technical base. For instance, they prepared you know different uh, documentary uh, movie, uh, films, you know, the, the, the documentary for uh, about science. Uh, this was the usual you know, day for uh, dissemination of knowledge in society, but. Now they, they decided to create a completely new institute which will use the modern technologies, including the internet you know, and uh, other tools for uh, dissemination of knowledge. Uh, so you understand that uh, here you can see you know, key, key questions, key, key aspects which are used for, uh, uh, for evaluation of organizations. In the Latin Association, we use you know, very similar. Uh, similar framework for, for evaluation, you know. And also important moment, you know, uh, for evaluation, we use, you know, several stages, uh, expert groups, uh, expert groups, uh, then, uh, uh, then uh, section, uh, evaluation at the level of the section of the academy, and uh, also evaluation at the level of the academy as a whole. Uh, we invite, you know, specialists from different uh, Different organizations, including the Ministry of uh, Education and Science, and uh, you know, uh, representatives uh, of uh, uh, of the ministries are very effective, as well as the representatives of some other different ministries, especially in the case of applied sciences. Um, uh, what I have to say, probably, I, I will. You understand that we use, you know, uh, these organizations uh, uh, during the uh, during our. Uh, Evaluation we use, of course, some statistical indicators, not only peer, not only peer review, not only expert uh, uh, conclusions. But um, what I have to say, we still have, you know, problems. Uh, we still have problems with uh, with our statistics. Uh, for instance, uh, we very often we use publications uh, per per researchers, but uh, researcher, but. Uh, uh, you know that Ukrainian statistic, uh, statistics doesn't use, you know, correct uh, some correct indicators, and uh, that's why we need uh, changes, uh, changes in statistics too uh, for for uh, objective for uh, proper proper evaluation of our institutes. For instance, full time material is still a huge problem for for Ukraine. We still cannot uh, cannot meet the international standards standards of OECD, but I think that. After introduction of uh, Pascati manual in Ukrainian language, you know, probably we, we can switch, you know, to, to some international organizations. And of course, we need these changes in uh, methods of um, evaluation, uh, you know, uh, because situation is changing and we have to, to, to involve more uh, information from open sources uh, for, um, from not only from traditional you know, sources that we need before. And uh, for, for, for international comparability, it would be very important also to create stimuli uh, or you know, incentives for um, reorgan internal reorganization and uh, internationalization of our, of our activities. I think that's, uh, that's probably very briefly all, all things that I wanted to say. Thank you for your attention and sorry for technical problems. I had no electricity no for, for, for almost the whole day and uh, I, I, I couldn't check, you know, the, I couldn't try, you know, before uh, the system. Thank you for all. Thank you. Bye. Pane Igore, duże dziękuję za waszą ciekawą ta. Thank you, Igor, for this informative presentation today. There is room for improvement. I appreciate your advice. Any questions? I think that in this case, it would be very important, you know, if open, open science actually will help you know to check you know um, some results of the research institutes because uh, very often you know um, 
institutes want to to present their results you know not in a, not in the right way they want to overestimate uh, their results and uh, if you have you know um, you know open science open if, if you use open science principle you can you can check them you know this is that's for me this is very very important All right, thank you. Thank you for joining us and we're moving on forward. This day is near in its end and uh, I'd like to turn over to the guest speaker, Alison Fromm, the executive director of one of the print repositories archive and she will speak about openness is our key goal. She speaks from the US. So you're welcome. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Um, one quick correction. Um, I'm the community engagement manager of Archive. Um, Raman Zabi is the faculty director and um, Stein Sigurdsson is the scientific director. So thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Uh, let me share my screen. Can you see the slides? Doc. Okay, great. Um, so as I said, I'm Allison Frommy. I'm the Community Engagement Manager of Archive. And I'm, I'm really happy to be here to tell you more about Archive. Um, and our central mission, OPEN. So first of all, let's start with the basics. What is Archive? Archive is an open curated research sharing platform. And um, we include research in physics, math, computer science, and more. And um, anyone around the world can use archive.org for free. We are a project of Cornell University and specifically Cornell Tech, which is based in New York City. Um, our staff, though, is distributed around um, in different locations. So just to give you a little bit of uh, history, um, decades ago, perhaps even centuries ago, <laughs> preprints were draft papers that authors shared with, um, with their colleagues manually on, on paper. And, um, and, you know, researchers shared their work to get early feedback before publication. Um, and this was done by mail on paper. In the, in the 80s, um, Joanne Cohn, an, an astrophysicist, realized that she could um, share preprints as tech files via email. And so she began a list of researchers around the, around the world, and that grew to about um, about two or 300 researchers. And then of course the internet happened <laughs> and Paul Ginsberg suggested, why not automate this process? And so that was the beginning of archive as we know it today, um, this internet-based distribution of preprints. And this really became the norm in many subjects like physics and math and computer science. And then over time has grown to other um, other subjects such as biology with bioarchive. And now archive doesn't just host preprints, um, we also post uh, conference proceedings and um, sometimes also peer reviewed and published versions of articles. So um, what is archive's mission today? <laughs> we wanna serve researchers in three very specific ways. We wanna enable researchers to read new work to stay current, um, to share research quickly, and, and to um, support open access. So archive today, um, I just wanna share some numbers about the scale in archive's history. There have been more than um, 2.5 billion downloads of articles. We have about 5.2 million monthly active users, um, more than 2 million total articles posted to archive, 
and so on. Submissions originate around from around the world. I want to highlight the people <laughs> part of this list. Uh, we are supported by institutional members around the world, that's universities, research labs, um, who contribute financially and also share expertise with us. We have about 200 volunteer moderators who do basic quality assurance checks. We have about 26 advisors who serve on advisory boards, and we have about 12 staff members. So it's um, it's both a large team and a small team, <laughs> and uh, and we we are really grateful for our global community. In the past few years, we've seen unprecedented growth in usage, and particularly when you look at this graph of submissions, it's just been um, increasing and increasing at, at greater and greater rates. Uh, although we saw a huge spike in um, in 2020, I think when people were um, staying home for the pandemic researchers probably had some time to to actually write up results that they've been sitting on for a while so we we saw a big spike in 2020 and now we're seeing a little bit of a leveling off of submissions but still very very high this um this diagram right here is a very basic schematic of how archive works um, from the reader and author perspective so if we start over here you know, an author, a researcher is ready to submit their research, they go online, they go to archive.org, they, they go through the submission process, and then the submission goes to moderators, um, those are the volunteer moderators around the world, and the submission is also checked by an automatic um, quality assurance system, and then if it's deemed to be um, research uh, that fits with archive scope. Um, a full text PDF is produced on archive.org. Then emails listing new papers are um, received by subscribers. Researchers discover new ideas. The community builds on that research and the cycle continues. Again, this is a pretty simplified version, but this is, these are the basics of, of how researchers use archive. So it, the the growth in usage, um, it really reflects how much researchers want open access. They appreciate the speed, the control. They get to decide when a, when a piece of research is ready to be shared. They don't have to wait for the peer review process. Um, and so archives role in academic publishing, you know, has to do with these three factors. The first being registration, providing a, a timestamp for submission of the scientific results. So this is, you know, the researcher gets to say, um, the, uh, you know, stake their claim in that area at that particular moment in time and perhaps prevent scooping by another research group. There's also the dissemination aspect, which is, you know, distributing the scientific results publicly to the audience that, you know, wants that information. And then there's this um, third aspect of use and reuse. Uh, researchers, when they post their work to archive, they get to choose the license that they want to use. And we encourage uh, researchers to choose uh, the license that's appropriate for them. And um, we offer several different Creative Commons licenses along with an archive license. And this promotes and facilitates the reuse of scholarly information. So again, um, these are the three uh, fact, you know, services that we, we provide. The one missing here is um, that's worth mentioning is peer review. Archive does not do peer review. However, um, it can serve as the basis for another layer of peer review on top. And so I'm going to talk about some of the some of the ways that that archive um, articles can be used and reused. Uh, all right, so one way that archive promotes reuse is through DOIs. Archive was started again, you know, back in 1991 before DOIs existed, but had the, um, had the foresight to use a persistent identifier. So there's, um, there, each article is, uh, labeled with an archive ID, that's the URL, and that, that is a stable URL. 
uh, we recognize that now that DOIs exist, uh, the rest of the world uses DOIs, we, um, our researchers and research community finds DOIs useful. So now, in addition to the archive ID, we also um, mint papers with, uh, with a DOI, and that's through data site. Um, now, uh, there are lots of ways that uh, community organizations around the world have have interacted with archive and built tools on top of archive. Now there are many such projects and I can only talk about a few. So I apologize that I can only um, talk about a few of these projects, but this is through um, a framework at archive known as archive labs. It's like a framework for collaboration. So linking to code is one of these collaborations. Papers with code is a, an organization that's separate from archive, um, but by integrating with archive allows authors to link their, their research directly to the code that they're um, using in their papers. And this code is then accessible by a link on the archive abstract page. And there are other archive labs projects uh, like connected papers and uh, site, which is a citation um, service. Uh, these, are, these are projects that are linked from the archives the archive abstract page, but are developed and run outside of archive by community um, members. Another way that archive content is um, uh, used in scholarly communications is uh, with overlay journals. So as I said, archive does not do peer review. However, overlay journals are built on top of archive um, to do that service, again, separate from archive. So for example, the Open Journal of Astrophysics uh, selects its content from papers that are already on archive.org, evaluates and reviews them, and then posts their curated lists um, online and links back to the, to the archive content. There are also a whole host of new peer review services um, that are popping up and there are just too many to name, but uh, but we're excited to see what's happening in that area too. Again, the they're leveraging the fact that archive content is open and building these services on top. Uh, another one I want to mention is uh, the R5 organization, which is working to provide content beyond the standard PDF. Um, you know, when people think of a research paper, they think of a PDF or a printed paper. And, um, and R5 is using archive content um, and, and uh, displaying it online as, um, as responsive HTML. And so you can take any archive URL, you know, paper URL and replace the X with a five and see that content displayed. It's a work in progress, so it's not perfect for every paper, but it's um, again, an example of how um, content is being displayed in this way. So the last thing I wanna mention here is that archive can also be seen as a data set. The metadata, the full text um, has already been used in machine learning and natural language processing research. And that content can, um, and so the, the data set itself can be found um, in multiple ways, but in one way it's, it's well, the archive content is posted on Kaggle. Um, and so that's available again for machine learning, other types of, of research about research. Um, and so I highlight all of these Again, they're just examples. It's, this is just the tip of the iceberg um, to, to show how archives basic service as a research sharing platform can be leveraged by the community to create tools that are useful for the community. Um, I, I can't give a talk about archive without <laughs> mentioning the very difficult issue of funding. Archive is free for readers and authors, but it is not free to operate. Um, and like so many open access resources, we're all struggling with, um, with how to make sure we have stable funding to, to operate now and well into the future. So we are just so grateful for our steadfast supporters, 
The Simons Foundation um, has provided substantial funding for um, more than a decade and really contributed to our financial stability. We also have a membership program for um, universities around and research labs around the world. And these are this is just a snapshot. Uh, you can go on archive and see the full list. We're so grateful for any any university that that contributes in any amount um, to recognize uh, the the usefulness of of open access to their researchers. So um, thank you so much again for having me. Uh, these are some links. You can always contact me at membership at archive.org. And uh, I look forward to continuing the conversation. Alison, thank you so much for this fantastic presentation. It's been so interesting. I can see and appreciate what you're doing and have done. So there is a lot we can learn from you. I can see a question popping up. Запитують, чи можна до вас звертатися так за консультацією в рамках розробка національного Так, звичайно. Угу. Yeah, sure, go ahead. The question is, do you consciously not use the term preprint? I think this is a really interesting question. Um it's it's challenging for us because archive is more than just preprints. So, in a way, yes, we we don't always use the word preprint. Um because it doesn't encompass all of the all of the content. And also, you know, on archive, we allow researchers to update their work and put and um, public uh, post new versions of the paper as changes are made. And so there's a question of, you know, it's not just preprint and post print, there might be many versions. So that's a great question. I like that question. Uh, Oh, thank you for the answer. One more question. Oh, no, there is no more. Okay. Anyway, thank you for joining us and telling us about what you do. It's been a grandstanding performance. На цьому, я думаю, ми будемо підводити підсумки першого дня. Це від всієї команди, від організації. Дуже дякуємо нашим чудовим доповідачам сьогодні на нашому марафоні, тому що це справді була не конференція, а дуже насичений день. Дякуємо теж кожному слухачу, хто долучився. Сподіваємося, ви почерпнули нової цікавої інформації, знайшли якісь натхнення працювати далі і відбудовувати, покращувати, вдосконалювати нашу українську наукову екосистему, якщо так можна сказати. Якщо у вас є в кого зараз якісь запитання, можна, будь ласка, або писати в чат, або відкликнути мікрофон, знімати, відслухати. Я вважаю, що ми вже відбудовуємо. Завтра ми зустрічаємося з 11. Так, буде сесія КОСТ, а потім ми будемо говорити про відкритий доступ до наукових публікацій. Дуже всім дякую, бережіть себе. Дякую, хлопці, бережіть себе.